this is one area that everyone and each one of us have to take. Because the word that came, he said that God blessed Abraham because he knew that Abraham will command his children after him. That Abraham would teach his children to know the way of the Lord. Adam and Eve, apparently something has gone wrong in the teachings of how to train these children in the house. And one has built hatred against the other, despising God. And therefore, end up killing his brother. And the Lord is holding him accountable for that. So, what we can conclude from this is that life could be difficult as the result of our relationship with our siblings. Life could be difficult as the result of our relationship with our siblings. You have to search within yourself. If there is anything that you have done wrongly against a brother, your relations quickly come before the Lord and ask for forgiveness. If there is any form of hatred built in you because of the training given to you at home. Maybe your parents love a brother or a sister more than you. It is interesting how the two, one will come to a point to kill the other. Something definitely happened for God to despise the personality of Cain and have respect for Abel. That is our first example. The second example is going to be seen in the family of Isaac and Rebekah. Their children, they were twins. Esau and Jacob. But the story about this family is that Rebecca had a revelation about the children when they were in the womb. Genesis chapter 25 and the verses 21 to 24. Rebecca was barren and Isaac entreated the Lord for Rebecca. Because she was barren. And the Lord entreated of him. And Rebecca his wife conceived. And the children struggled together within Rebecca's womb. And Rebecca asked the Lord. If it so be, why am I this? And she went Go before the Lord and inquire this of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in thy womb. Two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder shall serve the younger. And when were her days, to be delivered were fulfilled. Behold. There were twins. In her womb. There were twins. In her womb. You see. Rebecca did not say anything. Of this revelation. To the husband Isaac. Kept the information. For herself. And this is going to trigger. Something. In terms of their relationship towards their children. Towards their children. So, the same way that the children Cain and Abel were born with their gifts. One, the keeper of the sheep 
the other, the tiller of the ground. We have in this case twins. God had already revealed to Rebecca as a result of her request because the children were already fighting in the womb. And God said, Two nations are in your womb. The elder is stronger than the younger one. But he is going to serve the younger one. The elder will serve the younger one. And she, she took notice of that. And these children were born. One Esau love hunting. The other Jacob love dwelling in the tent fellowshipping with his God. And this will bring as a result that the parents will bestow their loves according to the gifts of these children. Mm. So as they were growing, as they grew in Genesis 25, the verses 31 to 34, we are learning that Jacob said to his brother Esau, sell me this day thy birthright. Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, behold, I am at the point to die because I'm hungry. And what profit shall it this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swore unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Though Jacob despised his birthright. He despised his birthright. Now you can see. God had made a pronouncement concerning these children, two children's life. The older is going to serve the younger. How this, thinks, this is going to be. No one has any idea. But the Lord said that there are two nations in the womb. One despise what is of God. He said, what is birthright to me? But one has understanding of what the birthright is all about. There is something that came out of the education of these children in that house. One have that fellowship with God. Another despise the fellowship with Almighty God. Therefore, their understanding were different. What is birthright to me? You will not understand birthright because you have never had any fellowship with God to receive the divine revelation that is related to the birthright. I am hungry. What is birthright to me? People have sold their destinies simply because they do not have understanding. Many, many souls have sold their destinies because they do not have understanding. He said, I am young. This is my time. This is not your time. Your time is the, the one that the Lord has is written in the book of life for every moment what you are supposed to do. So the moment that you come to be conscious about what life is all about, you cannot afford to despise life. To say that you are young and this is your time. You have to search to know your God. Because there is a time for everything. By the time that you're supposed to learn about your birthright, you are in the woods over there hunting for meat. All he can think of is his stomach. Therefore, he lost something that is essential for life. And we know many, many people of God have come to the same point. And they are reaping bitterly. So, the most interesting part of it is that Isaac, the father, came to a point 
to see himself as someone who is old and closely getting to his grave. So he decided to bless his children. But according to the tradition, birthright, birthright blessings are important. So the firstborn is supposed to receive a special blessings. Genesis chapter 27 and the verses 6 to 10. When Isaac spoke such a thing to his son Esau, Rebekah heard and Rebekah came to Jacob, her son, and told Jacob, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto thy brother Esau, saying, Bring me venison, and make me savory meat that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now therefore my son obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats. And I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. The Lord told Rebekah, two nations are in your womb. One is going to serve the other. The older, the elder will serve the younger. She heard that the blessings were going to Esau, who's supposed to serve Jacob, the junior one. And she quickly called Jacob. Jacob, quickly, go get me two goats, tender ones. Let me cook as your father loves. You will take it to him because he had already commanded your brother Esau to go and hunt and bring him meat that he may eat and bless him in his pleasure. Listen to me, my son. Go ahead and do that. So, Rebecca sided with Jacob and deceived the husband Isaac and the son, Esau. And Isaac blessed Jacob. The blessings that were supposed to go to Esau definitely came upon Jacob. So now in Genesis 27, the verses 38 to 40, After that, Esau had found out that his blessings had gone to his brother, Jacob, Esau came to his father. He said, Father, hast thou but one blessing, my father? Do you have only one blessing? Bless me, bless me too. Oh, my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. And by thy sword, by thy sword shall thy live and shall serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. Hallelujah. Hey. It is amazing. Esau came. Discovered that his blessings. Has been released. To Jacob. To whom. He already sold his birthright. Therefore. The birthright blessings. Automatically came. Upon Jacob. Now that he is realizing what the birthright is all about. Run quickly to the father. Father, please bless me too. He said, it is over. 
Do you have only one blessing? I'm sorry, my son. It is over. Father, bless me too. Okay. Well, the fatness of the earth shall be your portion. But you will live by the sword. You will serve your younger brother. Isn't that amazing? This is exactly the revelation that Rebecca received when the children were already in the womb. And it came out of Isaac's mouth to Esau as one of his blessings. You will be a slave to your brother. And it came as a blessing. <laughs> this could not possibly be a blessing. He will have dominion over you until you work hard to overcome his yoke over your life. Then at that moment, you will be free. So, when these things had happened, in Genesis 27, verse 41 to 44, we read, because of what happened, Esau hated Jacob, his brother, because of the blessing well with his father blessed him. He hated his brother. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. <laughs> he said, you know what? <laughs> I am waiting for my father to die. And as soon as my father dies, then I will kill my brother Jacob. Because he had stolen my blessings. But he had already forgotten that he sold his birthright to him for food. For food. For food. You know, we have to remember, these children, they were already divided. Because one, Isaac the father loved Esau. And he loved eating the hunting meat from Esau. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Because Rebekah had a divine revelation from the Lord. She knew the outcome of these children. The future of these children. What the Lord has said. It, it was already ringing within her. I have to train these children in such a way. That the, 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 the older one will, will, will serve the younger. God made it possible for her to hear what the father said. Esau, go get me good meat. Cook, let me eat and bless you. The parents did not even know that the things has already turned around because Jacob is now having the birthright of Esau. The dominion was already established. And the blessings followed and Esau wept and had now harboring within his heart hatred against his brother Jacob and said as soon as my daddy, my father, father dies, I would definitely kill you. So these words of Esau her elder son were told to Rebekah. And Rebekah sent and called Jacob her younger son and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau as touching thee do comfort himself per person to kill thee. Now therefore my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran, and tarry with him a few days until thy brother's fury turn away. In other words, move away from here because your brother has intention to kill you as a result of the blessings that has come upon you. You can see how brothers and sisters can build hatred. Within the same, one is 
careful about life. Another one is not. When one is studying, another one is playing. The parents are telling you that come and sit down and study. But you love going to play football. And your younger brother is sitting down there and studying and studying and studying. The outcome is that you do not come out with anything as far as your life is concerned. Because you despise every single teachings of your parents. And the time comes that the demarcation is clear. And now you develop hatred against your brother. Against your sister. Simply because of what the Lord has done in the person's life. Well, this is one more example. We are going to listen to another one. This same Jacob grew up and became a father and also had sons. Have to look at, you know, how the Adamic nature is being repeated to, <laughs> you know, in, 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 in his people's life, Jacob grew and have 12 sons. This man Jacob, that God has changed his name from Jacob to Israel. But Jacob in Genesis 37 verse 3 to 5. Jacob that is called Israel. He loved his son Joseph more than all his children. Because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph had a dream. And he told his dream to his brothers. And they even hated him more. You see where the hatred came from? The hatred came from the fact that the father loved Joseph more than all the brothers. Simply because he said, this is my little one. I had Joseph in my old age. Something that seems so small. And you'll be thinking that the brothers, you know, the siblings will be happy because this is our little brother. Oh no, oh no. No, because father went to the extent of making him a special coat coat of many colors and we did not receive anything so as a result of that it built hatred within themselves and this is something that you know children they are so sensitive how brothers and sisters come to develop hatred against each other. Small things like this. Small things like that. You saw your mother giving a bigger meat to your brother. You saw your father calling your sister to come and take the rest of the food. And she ate alone. And it has been going on and on and on and on. And as a result of that, he said that father do not love me. Father loved my sister so much. And mother is also ranging on the side of the other children. And I am despised. So it has built hatred within you. Or they hated you because you are loved by your parents. We are not talking about the circle, you know, outside the circle of immediate parents. Blood, brothers, and blood, sisters. So, in Genesis 37, verse 11, he said that because of Jacob's love to his son, Joseph, 
His brethren, they envied him. They envied him. They envied him. And verse 17 to 20 of Genesis 37, he said, As Jacob sending his son Joseph with his brothers to watch over the flock, they started building that hatred saying that we have to find a way to also kill our brother Joseph. So they went to a place a Dothan, and they did not want to, to have Joseph know where they have, they have been so that Joseph would just get lost in the field. But the grace of God was just right there and allowed a man to come and show Joseph the way of his brethren, saying that they have gone to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and find them, he found them in Dothan. And when they saw Joseph afar off, even before he came near unto his brothers, they conspired against him to slay him. They conspired against him to kill him. And they said one to another, Behold, the dreamer is coming. The one that dreamed, it is what he dreamt and he told them and they even hated him more. Behold, the dreamer is coming. Come now thence, verse 20. Come now therefore and let us slay him and cast him into the pit. And we will say, some evil beast had devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. We shall see what will become of his dreams. Let's kill him and let's see what will become of his dreams. Hallelujah. And these are brothers. Brothers acting against their own brother. And it's so hatred was built in such a way that in Genesis 23, uh, Genesis 37, verse 23 to 24, he said, It came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, the coat of many colors that the father gave. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it, so he didn't die right away. But in Genesis 37 verse 26 to 28, Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it for we? He said, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Because the Lord will require his blood of us as he did in the case of Cain killing his brother Abel. Where is thy brother? His blood is crying unto me from the ground. So then, Judah purpose saying, please brethren, come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren, they were content. Then there came to pass by the Midianites, these were the merchant men and they drew and lifted Joseph from the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver and they brought Joseph to Egypt. Hallelujah. They sold their brother for 20 pieces of silver and Joseph went into slavery. So to justify themselves before the father in Genesis 37, verse 31 to 33, they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid, a kid of goat and dipped the goat, the coat in the blood. They dipped the coat in the blood and they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father 
and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast had devoured him. Joseph is without doubt. And rent pieces. Joseph is without doubt. Without doubt, rent in pieces. He has been killed by an animal. You see, these are three different examples. We said we're going to go through a few scriptures to see what relationship brothers and sisters can actually be. How we come to build hatred as a result of many things that could happen at the home. But what we have to take out of this, you know, scriptures as a counsel of the Lord is that let your heart be set after God. Let your heart be set after God. May you fear almighty God. Whatever that had happened when you were being brought up, you have to change the heart and see God as the ultimate. You who were despised, God is still in control. You who has been set to be nobody, the Lord is still in control. Every form of hatred against you, it will not work because God knows you and everything that the Lord has said that he's going to do, he is going to do them. No matter what they have planned against you, whatever that they have done, it is all coming to naught because your God is God. To him alone be the glory. In Jesus name. Amen. I have always been saying, I said, since you make time to come to church, come for prayers and all that, you have chosen to follow God. So, you have to make sure that every single thing that you are doing day by day, it's in line with what the Lord required of you. You have to make sure that everything that you are doing is in line with what God required of you. As stewards of the living God, we understand that stewardship is not anything else, but it deals only with every single thing that God has given us. Stewardship deals only with every single thing that God has given to the believers. Including material things, spiritual things, such as, you know, the gifts that we receive from the Lord, spiritual gifts that we get from the Lord, or knowledge and abilities. It is all part of the things that we have received as stewards of the Lord. So stewardship is concerned with how one uses these things that God has given him. Stewardship concerns how one is using these gifts this knowledge and these abilities that God has given him on behalf of the Lord and also for the Lord's work. It's very important. So everything that we receive from God, it is meant to give back to God or give back for the Lord's work. Very, very important. And today we are going to talk about givings. And giving is one of the facets of stewardship. Giving is one of the facets of stewardship. And it deals specifically with the aspect of money. Giving is one of the facets of stewardship. And it deals with monetary or finances. And this has been the problem to many because they are not always understanding 
the purpose of giving. And more I look into things, into scriptures, I come to realize that this facet of our stewardship, the enemy has targeted and using it as a great tool against the children of God. When the Lord commands us to give and it becomes a blockage in a believer's mind and heart, so we are blocked and are not willing to release what God gives us. It is a satanic weapon against your blessings. And you, we will be talking more and more and more and more about it because one thing that is sure is that nobody receives anything except the Lord gives as a saint of the living God. If you are expecting from Satan, you are not God's steward. So what we receive from the Lord, it is meant to take care of us and to take care of the church for the work of the Lord. So he is the one that gives seed to the sower and he gives bread to the eater. You have to be moved from the position of eating to be a shower. So when you have received your seed, you will not eat your seed. If you eat your seed, that's it. You have nothing to sow. Because you have eaten your seed. The seed, it is meant to sow. And the bread is meant to be eaten. But we have people that are eating their bread and coming and praying and praying and praying. Even when the Lord still saw the seed in their lives, they turn their seeds to be bread and they eat it. There is no amount of prayer. There is no amount of prayer that will move the believer to a higher level of finances because it is subject to kingdom principle. It is subject to kingdom principle. And that principle, we will be talking more and more and more and more about it and giving more and more explanation because we don't want to serve this God in our rikiki ways. In other words, serving God in poverty. Jesus Christ was rich. He was made poor so that you and I will walk in dominion. In financial dominion. And this is not a joke. This is not to say something. It is the reality. The same way that you believe in certain things of this kingdom, you also have to come to the point to believe in financial dominion. You have to come to the point to believe in financial dominion, it is subject to principles. If you don't step in there, you will not see the impact of it. But as you step in what the Lord asks you to do, you will see the change in your finances. People in scriptures has been moving from one level to another by just obeying these ordinances from the Lord. As stewards of God, we receive from God and we are to sow back to God so that the Lord will multiply what we sow and it reaches us for a higher height. Very important. And the enemy is doing so much harm against us. When we receive, we don't want to sow. There will never be any multiplication until the seed is sown. If there is no multiplication, there is no increase. So from the very beginning, we have been at the same point and struggling 
from paycheck to paycheck and paycheck to paycheck and there is no increase. But if we do what the Lord required of us, you have to see this as kingdom principle. Principle. And it's a covenant. It's a principle that is linked to the covenant of God. The Lord God will never say anything that he will not do. If he said it, it's because it's already done and it is in enforcement. But it is in the form of a gift. Everything that comes from God to man is always a gift. And the Lord God will never force you to take it. But his hands is already stretched forth. That is the goodness of God. A man supposed to stretch forth your hand and take it from God. But if you sit down and you are not taking it and you keep play, praying, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord. Meanwhile, what you are praying for, it is subject to a principle. Tap into that principle and see the releases over your life. Financial dominion, it is real. Because it is God's will for everyone and each one of us to walk in that dominion. So today, we are going to talk about different types of givings in the Bible. You have to know when you are given, what type of giving that you are subject to. What, when you release your finances, what it is that you are releasing it for. So the title is Principal Types of Givings in the Bible. All satanic assaults against our finances, it is meant for us not to receive our breakthroughs and our blessings. The fact that the enemy attacks your finances, it is to keep you in a position that you are always having just what you need for you and for your children. And you are not ready to release anything towards the kingdom that is going to multiply what you release for a higher height. That is what the enemy has been doing in our lives. So we are serving God always, you know, just at the edge of breakthrough. Because we are not breaking through the covenant of the living God. You have to step in there. Break the barrier that separates you and that covenant because Jesus Christ had already torn apart and we have direct access to the spiritual affairs that we need to pull down. When we pray, we are praying to God and we ask God for certain things. The Lord released these things in the form of a seed. And we are meant to take this seed and sow as God is taking care of the things that are our needs. Let me put it this way. But if a man comes to a point to see all his seed to be his need, you will never move forward. Never ever. There is no multiplication. What you get, that's all you have. And the next time you keep praying, the Lord will release it. What you get, that's all you have because there is no investment. You are not investing for increase. You are not investing to get more added. You keep and you are eating and you start over and you are getting and you keep and you are eating and you start over and it continues from generation to generation and our children's children, we are not able to leave anything for them. So a good man liveth inheritance for his children. His children. So God has intention to bless us so that we become a blessing for ourselves, for our families, but also living inheritance for our children's children. That is a fact. There is a statement that the Lord Jesus made and it is translated here by Apostle Paul in the book of Acts chapter 20 and the verse is 35 the word says, I have showed you all things. Apostle Paul telling the church, I have showed you all things. How that so laboring, ye ought to support the weak 
and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus. How he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And more we look into this, more you realize that it is very, very true. Very true. And we will get into different scriptures on other messages to confirm that indeed it is more blessing to give than to receive. In the world, the principle in the world is that when you keep, then you get more. When you keep, you get, and you are keeping, you are getting more. The paradox is that in the kingdom of God, more you give out, more you receive. It's amazing. More you give out, more you receiving, and more you are being increased. Kingdom principle. You want to understand how these things work? That is where God is God. That is where God remains and always be God. He does in such a way that you become a canal, not a channel, a canal. And your outlets are just reaching to so many people. And the Lord knows your heart that when he gives to you, you will not keep just for yourself. You will be able to release not only for his work, but also blessing other saints. So as a result of that, God said, mm -hmm, that is my son, that is my daughter, and the heavens are open over your life. And channel kingdom riches through you. And what out of what you are receiving, you will not even be using 1%. Because the volume is so great. The volume becomes so great that God opens the heavens. We say, oh Lord, open the heavens and pour us. If the heavens are open and you don't have canals to flow the releases of heaven, you will die. You cannot contain this. this you will die out of it. So once you, you are making the canals available, God will channel kingdom resources through you. Because he knows that more he's blessing you, more you become blessing to others. And people stand and pray and thanking God on your behalf. You see where the blessings are coming from. When you bless someone, the person stand out there and say, Oh God, thank you very much. My Lord and my Savior, please bless this man. That he continued to be a blessing unto me. And the Lord heard that prayer. And God continued blessing you. Now you have one person, two people, three people. And many that are just praying for you. And the Lord keep increasing you. It's a principle that you are not to wait until you get much before you start. As the Lord release a little seed unto you. You have to come to the point to sow it and when you start ah uh, you are starting with little but as the little has been increased the next time you are getting more than a little and you keep sowing and you keep getting getting out of multiplication the next thing you know they cannot recognize you anymore we are we remain, we are not doing what the Lord required of us. And we are remaining at the same level. And people of the world are not, they are not envying us in any way. Why? Because they are doing better than we are doing. As if our God hand is so short that he cannot release. But that's not God. His hand God is a giver and there is nothing that almighty God cannot give. He has been in the business of giving from the very beginning until he gives, he gives, he gives, he gives to the point that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus. What else God cannot give? This is our God. 
we are going to see four principal types of givings in the Bible. The number one is tight. Number one is tight. And the motivation of tight is obedience. What motives people to tight is what is obedience. The book of Malachi, Malachi chapter 3, the verse is 8 to 12. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Where, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes unto the storehouse, that they may be meat in my house. And prove me now well with, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither Shall your vine cast her fruit before time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, says the Lord God of hosts. That is what tithe does. Tithe open heaven. Windows of heaven. And pour you out blessings. Not only that. Tithes rebuke the devourer on your behalf. And protect your assets and your investment. Tight. How much? 10%. 10%. You get $10. It's $1. And they start, they are divine connection. They are connected to the covenant. And they are connected to the blessings. The first time that the word tight appeared in the Bible, Genesis chapter 14 and the verse is 18 to 20. Concerning Abraham that have gone to war and came back and with the spoil was met with a priest. Melchizedek. So, he said, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him, he blessed Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abraham, of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which had delivered thy enemies into thy hands, and he gave him tithes of all. The Lord sent to Abraham his priest. Remember, in the dispensation of grace, we are not under the priesthood after the order of Aaron, but we are under the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. And Abraham paid tithes of the spoil to Melchizedek. All that we are saying here is that we are highlighting the different types of givings in the Bible so you will know when you give what you are giving it for, in which area of these types, and what your return is all about. Tight, open windows of heaven. Number two type of giving in the Bible is called the first fruit. The first fruit. And the motivation behind the first fruit giving 
is generosity. Generosity. The book of Exodus 23 and the verses 19. He said, The first of the first fruits of thy land, thou shalt bring unto the house of the Lord thy God. The first of the first fruits of thy land, thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Proverbs 3 and the verses 9 to 10. He said, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thy increase. So shall thy bowels be filled with plenty. So shall thy bowels be filled with plenty. And thy press shall burst out with new wine. First fruits. Ezekiel 44 and the verse is 30. He said, and the first of all thy first fruits of all things. And every oblation of all, of every sort of your oblations, shall be the priest. Ye shall also give unto the priest the first of your dough, that he may cause the blessings to rest upon thy house. Bring it to the priest, that he may cause the blessings to rest upon thy house. And the first fruit is showing that you are not a lover of money. You are giving it to the church or to the ministers. It shows your gratitude to God for the extra blessings. And it is done once a year. As we are all working and the Lord is blessing us. We heard a testimony that by God's grace, somebody has been moved from one position to a higher position which goes that the finance is not going to be the same she is going to receive an increase something on top of her regular salary the first day that she will receive it what is on top is for the lord and it is done once a year but if God is making your life an increase and they keep promoting you, keep promoting you, keep promoting you, promote your God and promote your life. He said the priest will cause blessings to rest upon thy house. Once a year. First fruit. Number three type of givings in the Bible. It is called alms given. Alms given. The motivation behind alms given is compassion. Compassion. This giving is not given to God, but it is given to mankind. Alms given is not given to God. But it is given to mankind. There is a story in Acts 10, the verses 1 to 4. The word says, he said, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. A centurion of the bound called the Italian bound. A devout man and one that feared God with all his house. Which gave much alms to the people. And prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the night hour of the day. An angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. When he looked on him, he was afraid. And he said, what is it Lord? And he said unto him, Cornelius, thy prayers and thy alms given are come up for a memorial before God. And Acts 10, 31 says, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thy, arm, th thy arms given, 
I had remembrance in the sight of God. So when we are given to people, they come before the Lord as remembrance in the sight of God. This is a given not to God. It's a given to people. This Cornelius, he was a Roman centurion. An unbeliever but was praying to God. A Gentile. The act of arms given gave him a position before the Lord. And he came before God as a remembrance. And an angel of the Lord was sent from heaven to come and talk to this man. His whole household was saved through this act. Obviously, you gave it to people. But listen to what Proverbs 19, 17 says. He said, he that had pity upon the poor. He that had pity upon the poor lended unto the Lord. And that which he had given, will he pay him again? So when you have compassion upon people, upon the poor, and you will give to them, it comes before the Lord as remembrance. And the Lord says that you have lended what you gave to that poor to God. And God will pay you back. God will pay you back. So you can see the levels of the blessings. Tight, open heaven. Windows of heaven to pour you out the blessings. First fruit, as you are given, the priest pray and cause blessings to rest upon your house. Alms given, as you are blessing the poor, you are lending this money to God and God will pay you back. Returns one to one. But this is the area that most people are given. Most people are given out of compassion. And the returns are one to one. As you give one dollar to that person, God will give you one dollar. And the last type of giving is called seed sowing. Seed sowing. In the book of Mark, Chapter 4 and the verse is 39. The motivation behind seed sowing is faith and reward. Faith and reward. Mark 4, 3 says, Hakim, behold, there went out a sower to sow. There went out a sower to sow. A story that we know very well. This sower sowed and different ground receive the seed. But only one ground. The seed that fell on the good ground. Verse 9, verse 8. And did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth. Some 30 fold, some 60 fold and some 100 fold. This is very important. So, as you are sowing, you have to identify a good ground to sow your seed. And we said that motivation behind it is faith and reward. So, if you have faith to receive what the Lord has given you, and in faith you sow, the reward is also being returned by faith. Some are receiving 30 fold, some are receiving 60 fold, and some are receiving 100 fold according to their givings. According to their givings. How much you put in, that is how much your reward is going to speak. 
That is why you see the differences in the levels of people in the church. Some are blessed 30 fold. Others are blessed 60 fold. And others are blessed 100 fold. Kingdom principle. Second Corinthians chapter 9 and the verses 6 to 8. I'm going to read this scripture and read it in two different versions of the Bible. King James first. The word says, he said, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. These are powerful scriptures filled with heavenly mysteries. It is for your understanding of these scriptures that will break forth your financial dominion. It is all about faith and reward. The same scripture that he said, God loves cheerful giver. You sow sparingly. You reap rikiki. You sow bountifully. You reap bountiful blessings. He loves cheerful giver. Give, 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 give. That's not God. God wants to see the giver that is given out of heart. Faith. It is out of love that we give to the work of God. When we love God, we give because God loves so much the world that he gave his only begotten son. So when we say, Lord, I love you, how great you are, how wonderful I let it also speak by your givings. I love the, the message version of the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 8 that we read. This is what he says. It says, remember, a stingy planter, a stingy planter. So it's someone, he's so stingy that he doesn't even want to put his seed on the ground. That is devastating. You know what you are putting on the ground, it is going to bring forth. And bring you increase. But you are even being stingy. You have a grain of corn in your hand. Put it on the ground. So that it will bring forth hundreds of thousands. And you are being stingy. Crying over a grain of corn. But you are ready to receive bountifully. Oh God I thank you. I bless your name. Listen, but you are not ready. You are stingy on your seed. A stingy planter get a stingy crop. A stingy planter, he gets a stingy crop. And he will move around and say that, oh, this year, uh, the land was not really, the rain was not, it's not, it has nothing to do with the land. It has nothing to do with rain. It has everything to do with the type of seed that you put on the ground. God is not mocked. He's not mocked. The same way, a lavish planter gets a lavish crop. You release, you sow, you're going to see increase. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over. Apostle Paul said that he said to the church of the Corinth, please, what I'm saying, think over it. Take your time. And think through these things. And make your own mind. 
what you will give. So what you receive, think about it, and then make your mind on how much you are going to give to the Lord and for the work of the living God. He said that this act, it will protect you against sub stories and arm twisting. You know what it means? Sub stories like, oh, my situation, oh, my, my sister, and this thing that has happened to me, and I, my back was paining me, and I have to go to the hospital, and the letter that I saved, they have taken it, and they keep sending me bills, and you continue storing and storing and storing and storing. Stories. Stories. You will always have sub stories to tell, because you are not doing what the Lord required of you. He said it will protect you from arm twisting. So Satan has released agents that are moving around twisting people's arms. Twisting their hands. Aha, uh -huh, you got your paycheck. Don't worry, give it to me. And then he twists your hands and take it. He said, I don't want to give it. Who are you to say you are not giving it? You are not stepping in God's covenant. I have every right to take it. And they twist your arm and they take it. You know what it means. Pastor, I'm not seeing any satanic agent coming to twist my arm. Now let me tell you. Suddenly. Suddenly from nowhere. Where you parked. There was a sign that says that today is a day that they are coming to clean the street. Your eyes was closed on that sign. And automatically Chicago City is coming and giving you tickets. Sudden ticket. You come in the morning. Surprise. Your arm is already twisted. And many of these things that the devil is releasing against the children of God. Because we are being disobedient unto the things of God. So, he said God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. God loves it. He loves the cheerful giver. But when the giver delights in the giving, God loves it. And if God loves it, what is it going to happen to you? Heavens are going to be open. And you become heavenly channel. And the Lord just keep releasing unto you. He said, God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways. So that you are ready for anything and everything more and just ready to do what needs to be done. <laughs> These are powerful stuff. So, this is a Christian that is moving in a covenanted way and the whole heaven is backing him up. Every time that there is a need, heaven is already open. So, before the need arises, heaven had already packaged because of your covenant deeds. That scripture is so powerful. The end. He said God can pour on the blessings in aston an astonishing way. Astonishing way. Amazing way. Ways that you cannot even comprehend it. So that you are ready for anything and everything. For anything that comes on, you, on your way. For everything that comes on your way. More than just ready to do what needs to be done. You are more than just ready to do what needs to be done. You are more than just ready to do what needs to be done. You are more than just ready to do what needs to be done. Hallelujah. This is the word of God. There is nothing else to be added except we being obedient and step in this covenant of God. God said, try me on this things and you will see if my name is not I am that I am. May the Lord God bless you. Amen. Everyone is very welcome and uh, 
we thank God for your lives. Uh, today being a very special day, to God alone be the glory. We are having a word uh, of circumstance that I titled, Hearing from God our Father. Hearing from God our Father. Before we get into details, we have to understand how the Trinity works. Because we talk about the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we pray, we pray to Almighty God the Father. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, by the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. So, when it is, it is stated that way, when it is stated that way, you come to find out that each one of them has its role. But not just what I am saying, but what the Bible says about the Trinity. First Corinthians chapter 12, and the verse is 4 to 6. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 to 6. According to the word of God, this is in the case of heaven gifting his children. The case of heaven gifting his children. The word says that he said, now there are diversities of gifts. There are diversities of gift, but the same spirit. The same spirit with capital S. So, which means that all gifts, all gifts, all gifts from above will not be active or operated except through the Holy Spirit. If God gives you a gift, that gift will be activated and functioning only through the Spirit of God who is the Holy Spirit. That is what this scripture means. So you can see that in the area of God working with his children for his purpose in the surface of this world here, it cannot be done outside God's spirit, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the custodian of the working of the gifts in the children of God. The Holy Spirit, he is the one behind the activities, the performance, the working of the gifts that God gave to his people. If truly the oppression of the gift is coming from Almighty God, then you're going to see the act of the Holy Spirit just in there. If the spirit behind the gift is not the Holy Spirit, then that gift is not from Almighty God. This is so important because such a time like this, in the end times, where many spirits are out there, where signs and wonders are being done in various places, and matter of fact, so many are caught not by the word of the Lord, but by the miracles and the signs and wonders. But the point is, is not, we are not led by miracles. We are led by the spirit of God. So the fact that a spirit can lead you already is a very dangerous ground. That one must be extremely careful. Because how would you know that the oppression of that gift is of, the, of almighty God or not? If it is of God, then it is being operated by the Holy Ghost. If not, then the spirit behind it is whatsoever spirit that is of the world. This must be clear because many are being led astray by such a time like this one. Many, many spirits are in the world out there and operating under the, you know, all kinds of anointing, so-called anointing and miracles and signs and wonders that are happening, but they are not from Almighty God. If the, 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 the signs and the wonders are from God, you will see the mighty work of the Holy Spirit. To God alone be the glory. Now there are diversities of gifts. There are diversities of gifts. But the same spirit. I'm not talking about the gifts today. I will talk about the gifts of God to his saints. To edify the church another time. But today... My whole purpose it will, is to let you understand the function of each person in the Trinity. We said that the Holy Spirit is the one that is behind the working of Almighty God in his children's life through the gifts that are from above. 
verse 4 of first corinthians verse 5 verse 5 of first corinthians chapter 12 that we are reading he said and there are differences of administrations but the same lord there are differences of administrations but the same lord so the gift will not function except the holy spirit comes in to make it work to make it work but now he's talking about administration so the administration wise it is all he said by the same lord lord meaning jesus christ lord meaning jesus christ and then let me read the, ver the last verse which is verse six then i will explain he said and there are diversities of operations but it is the same god which worketh all in all please these scriptures are extremely important because for a child of god most of the time we are confused about the trinity who is doing what and when I, I am praying who do i pray to i'm answering you right away you pray to god in the name of jesus by the empowerment of the holy ghost i said this before but now how is the whole you know god's purpose being done here the trinity god the father and the son are sitting in heaven the son sitting at the right hand of the father both of them are sitting in heaven the only one that is here on earth is the holy spirit matter of fact he is not just roaming around he is just right there in you dwelling in the believer dwelling in the believer and at the same time the lord using his people to do what he has called them to do now when heaven have decided to do something on earth here how is the trinity going to go about it this is this 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 scriptures here these scriptures are explaining how god works how heaven works here on earth now he said that god the father he is the custodian of all operations because what he does is that once he has something in mind that he wants to do all that he would do he will go ahead and tell the son jesus Christ jesus christ being the administrator so administ the purpose of administration is to make sure that things are organized and watch for it to happen the one that is going to make it happen is the holy spirit we said it but before it happens there must be administration there must be structured there must be organization and this all is the function of jesus christ so if god wants to do something here on earth the lord tells the son almighty god the father tells the son jesus christ this is what i have in mind and what i would like to do jesus christ will look into the heavenly resources and start putting things in place angels are on assignment the children of god that are called here they are also going to be on assignment who has a gift that the Holy Spirit must come and empower him for the purpose of Almighty God. This is how the Trinity works over here. So you can see that he said it is God the Father. God the Father. Who worketh all in all. So the power behind it all is the one that sits on the mightiest of throne. He delegates the administration part of it to the Son. And what the son does, he looks at his, his host. Remember, the commander-in-chief himself. The general overseer of the heavenly army. And he's going to move the angels. He's going to move the purpose, the saints of the living God, to bring forth the purpose of Almighty God. This is how Trinity works. So this is the reason why you cannot be confused. You cannot be confused. The father has gifts for his children. The son also has gifts for his children. And the Holy Spirit also has gifts for his children. Why? Because each one of them has a different role to play, but in one accord. In one accord. You can see that all the Trinity is targeting the common goal. The purpose is from the Father. The accomplishment, everybody must get involved. The Jesus Christ will come in, activate the whole heaven. You know, whosoever must be involved, to get them involved, and watch over the word to be performed by the empowerment of the holy ghost the holy spirit will go in action 
He said he sent forth his word. Who is the word going to? The word is going to the Holy Spirit. Because even if God is asking a man to do something for, for his purpose, a man cannot hear directly from heaven. It takes the Spirit of God to hear the things of God. So it comes that the Spirit of God must be communicating with the Spirit of man. We talked about this last week, just last week. We talked about 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, all the way down. So it is all explaining that the spirit of man knoweth only the things of man. And the spirit of God also know only the things of, 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 God, of God. So for the purpose of heaven to be established through man on the, in the surface of this earth here, God must communicate to the Son, the Son communicates to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit communicates to man, and the Lord Almighty God, the Trinity, they are all watching for the performance of what has been said. To God alone be the glory. Hallelujah. There is something that is said about Jesus. Listen to this. That is the reason why I put kiss, kiss the Son and live. Kiss the Son, Jesus Christ, and live. He said, Jesus, being the brightness of the glory of the Father. Jesus Christ, being the brightness of the glory of his Father and the express image of his person. So, you see Jesus, you have seen the Father. You see Jesus Christ, you have seen the Father. You will see him as he is, not only in the image, but also in character. Also, in character because being the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power nothing works in god's purpose outside his word and that word is jesus christ by the way and he said when he had himself purged our sins the father sat, sat him down on the right hand of the majesty on high this is simply saying that the father, after glorification of the son, set the son on his right hand. When the father wants to do something in the surface of this universe, all that he must do is to communicate it to his son. And the son will move in, get it all administered, and the Holy Spirit will move in by the leadings of the, of, of, of the son because he receives from the son and moves in, bringing all they that are involved over here to get that thing accomplished. Everything falls at the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is an explanation about this. The communication between the Father and the Son is what we have just seen. The communication between the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, the book of John, John chapter 14, and the verse is 7 to 9. These are words that came out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, He said, If you have known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. So, it is coming as what was said before. The very brightness of his glory and the very image of his person. So, Philip came to Jesus and said unto Jesus, Jesus, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And Jesus said unto, unto Philip, he said, how have I been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me? Philip, he that had seen me had seen the Father. And how sayest thou that? Show us the Father. So, you know, like we said, the image of the Father is the Son. The character of the Father is the Son. There is uh, John 1, 18. It talks about, he said, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, who is at the bosom of the father, he had come and declared him. This is a very bold statement because we know about Moses that asked God, God, let me see you, show me your face. God said, you can't see my face and live. A man cannot see my face and live. 
but man saw the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came. The, the John 1, 17 talks about, he said, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. What the people of the Old Testament experienced through the law, what we are experiencing through the, the grace and the truth that came with Jesus, is on a higher level. It's on a way higher level. You cannot compare any New Testament believer or new covenant believer with an old covenant believer. What is in you? They didn't have it. That is why a child of God cannot be like a chicken mangling when you, you yourself, you know that you are an eagle that you're supposed to be flying. What you have today is way greater than any of this great, great prophets that lived before. You are greater than John the Baptist. But the Lord said that, you see, among they of the law, the greatest doesn't even come close to John the Baptist. But they that are in the kingdom of God, the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. So you can't compare yourself with Isaiah. You can't compare yourself with the Jeremiah. You can't compare yourself with Moses. You can't compare yourself with, with, with David. and people, Even including a man after my own heart. You have the Holy Spirit with you. You stand on a better covenant. If you have seen Jesus, you have seen God. If you have seen Jesus, you have seen God. Why is it that you are asking me, show me the Father? You have seen me, Philip. You have seen my Father. You see how I am acting, how I behave in my home, how I, I, I carry myself out there. You have seen the character of the Father. For us, it's so great. Jesus Christ came here and never got married. It wasn't the plan of the Father for Christ to marry. But he was constantly indeed a man, a family man. He had like eight people to take care of. He worked. He worked and he worked very, very hard. We are not talking about the ministry work. We are talking about a man living. A man living. The man's ministry started only at the age of 30. He had three and a half years only in ministry. But he lived 33 and a half years. But the 30 years of his life, was like any ordinary man. For what purpose? That man could be able to look unto Jesus Christ as the author and the finisher of our faith. Nobody in the Old Testament ever made this statement, follow me. Nobody. Jesus Christ was the only one and the first one that says, follow me. Follow me. We cannot follow any of the Old Testament because... If you say that you want to follow according to the heavenly purpose for the children of God, when we are following someone, we must follow the person in image, in character, in everything. Jesus Christ came here and lived that life of example. He went through every struggle that you could go through. He went through, Pastor, but Jesus, he didn't get married. So how can he know what I'm going through with my husband? Let me tell you, there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But our God is faithful. So the Lord knows everything about it. Whatever that you will be going through in your family, the Lord has been there. And he has gone through things that you, you will never have that opportunity to go through these things. If you have seen me, you have seen God. In other words, our characters, our behaviors must, as children of God, if people see you, they must see Jesus. If they see Jesus, they must see the Father. Somebody here, I pray for you, that someone sees you and see the image of God in your life in the name of Jesus Christ. I made a statement before. And I'm going to explain it because I said, I want to know the connectivity between Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, the communication channel. Before that, hear this statement from God the Father to us. In the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 1, and the verses 1 and 2, the word says, he said, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the Father's by the prophet. What is this scripture saying? It is simply saying that I mentioned it that we are standing on the better covenant. He said in the time of old, in the old covenant, God was speaking to his people through chosen men, 
We call men of God prophets. Prophet. Prophet. But watch this. But he said, had he, in verse 2 of Hebrew 1, had in these last days, God had in these last days spoken unto us by his son Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. In these last days, God himself, he talks to us. He talks to his children through not the prophets. If the prophet is going to hear anything from above, it must, pro it must be proceeded from the son. Because the father talks to us through the son, whom he had appointed as of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So you can see that as far as Jesus Christ is concerned, there is nothing, nothing done in the surface of this universe from God Almighty outside the sun. Please, a clear understanding because sometimes people don't know how to worship God. Said, so should I worship God the Father? Or should I sing unto Jesus? Or uh, uh, sh should, I, should I praise the Holy Spirit? That is how I will make it. You know? And these things are becoming problems because some of them are emphasizing only the Holy Spirit. Some are saying that, no, 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 the no. Holy Spirit is not important. Uh, Jesus is all. So let's, let's worship Jesus. Some say that, no, 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 no. If Jesus is there, if I have access to the Father, uh, let me just go and worship the Father. Let me tell you, according to the word of God, the Father receives nothing except through the Son. The father receives nothing except through the son. That is why I said, kiss the son and live. Kiss the son and live. If you want to bring, live your life and bring that greater glory to almighty God, please kiss the son and what? And live. Kiss the son and live. Hallelujah. Mm. These are so powerful because if you are in the sun, now you don't need to go to any prophet to hear from God. If you are in Christ, a child of God, you do not, you are not an Old Testament believer. He said in the Old Testament, the Lord was speaking to his people through the prophets. But these last days, and we are in the last days, God talks to us through his son. So now, if you want to hear from God, then you better develop the channel of hearing from Jesus. Hallelujah. We must know how to hear from Jesus Christ. And then that will be it. So, let me answer the statement that I made before about how is the communication between Jesus and the Holy Spirit since the Father and the Son are in heaven. Between the Father and the Son is not a problem because we have just, we have seen it. He said he talks to the Son right, right at, his, at, at, at his right hand. But the Son, to the Holy Spirit, how is it being done? The book of John, John chapter 16, and the verse is 12 to 15. Coming out of the mouth of Jesus Christ himself, Jesus said, I have yet many things to say unto you. He was talking to the disciples. So basically, he, you are the disciples of Christ today. The Lord was just addressing to you. I have many things to say unto you. But ye cannot bear them now. Ye cannot bear them now. You know, at that time, it was very true. Because at the time that Jesus was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit has not been given. The Holy Spirit has not been given. And this is... This is, this is John, you know, this, this, this is John 16. John 17 is the prayer, the priesthood prayer. So Jesus Christ is about to be taken to heaven. And these are the last words from Jesus to his children, to his disciples. And today that will come to him through the disciples, you and I. He said he has many things to tell them. So he, which means that he has been telling them many things because he was physically present and he, keep, you know, he kept teaching them, teaching them. But now he's going to be taken away. So I still have many things to tell you, but 
Some of these things, when I say them, you will not understand them. He was talking about a level that a man or a believer or a child of God needs to get to start you know, receiving some secret things from, from heaven. I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. You cannot bear them now. You cannot understand them now. You cannot take them now. Like people, when they are overwhelmed, they said, I can't take it anymore. Uh -huh. But the Lord said that you cannot bear them now, but listen to what he said afterwards. He said, how be it? When he, hallelujah, when he, the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth with the spirit with capital S, that is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. The third person the Trin of the Trinity. I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now, that when he, the Holy Spirit, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. He shall glorify Jesus. Holy Spirit shall glorify Jesus. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father had are mine. Hallelujah. You have seen me, you have seen the Father. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore said I that the Holy Spirit shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. If you receive from Jesus, you have received from God. Hallelujah. If you, have, you are receiving from Jesus Christ, you are receiving directly from the throne of Almighty God. It's amazing. The Holy Spirit, who is our helper here, the one that is in us, and helping us to talk to heaven, for heaven also to talk to us. This is the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, he will not author a word. He will not say a word. He will not act until he had received the instruction from our Lord Jesus Christ. Because he knows that whatsoever the Son will tell him, it is the word of the Father. It is the word of the Father. He said, every single thing that the Holy Spirit will do in you, it will bring glory to Jesus. And we know that Jesus Christ himself is not taking glory He's returning the glory to the Father. Hallelujah. What a mighty structure. What a mighty delegation. It's so wonderful when people can come together in one accord. What they can achieve is just amazing. Everyone has his, his role. Do you think that, I mean, you just watch it. Do you think when the, the Father sits down and wants to do something on earth, it is in the power. Everything that must be done here on earth must be done in power. Because of the forces that are at work. Here is the domain of the devil. Here in this world is the domain of the, de of the devil. Why am I saying that Jesus Christ himself saw Satan coming and he said the prince of this world. If he's the prince of the world, it means that this is for him. He said the prince of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. But in his priesthood prayer, in the John 17, you come to find out that he told the father, he was praying to his father. He said, Father, the work that you gave me to do here, I am done with it. And I am coming back. But the people that you gave me, when I was here, I kept them. But now that I'm coming, oh Lord, they are in the world, but they are not from the world. They are in the world, but they are not talking about you and I. They are in the world, but they are not from the world. Therefore, keep them away from the evil one. So this place is, is an evil place. The world is an evil place. And we know this because everyone who has not, you know, any understanding of this place being evil has been fallen victim. Second Corinthians 4.4, 4, he said the prince of this world, he's moving around blindfolding people. So even their eyes are completely blind. They are moving around not knowing what is going on. And destinies are being scattered, shattered, and people are missing God's purpose. But the Holy Spirit is given. The Holy Spirit is given for, and it is given inside people, in a week. In a week. So when God is about to do something in a man's life, 
when God is about to do something for his own glory through a man, let me tell you, there is no power of darkness that can stand against the move of Almighty God. Because it is decided from the throne of heaven. It is decided in power. And the one who made the statement for it to move forth and get it done, released the statement to the son. The son put in place all the necessary things. The angels and the favor and the anointing and everything else that must be in place for that child of God to move ahead and get it done. I have not seen it. Yea, have not heard it. Neither have it entered into the heart of any man. The things that God had prepared for them that love him. But God had revealed those things unto us by his Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. The things that God wants you to do, they are hidden in Almighty God. No man has access. No man, no man, no spirit has access to. Because the Holy Spirit, who is even the Trinity, the third person of the Trinity, he must search deep in God to find out what the Lord has in store for your life. And he's the one who is going to do it. Faithful is he who calleth thee. He also will do it. Hallelujah. When, you know, that is why you should not be living your life in contention. You should not be living your life in envious. You should be happy when you see people doing well. You should be able to come with brethren and for heaven purpose to be established. Why? Because today, Maybe it's your brother's turn. Tomorrow, it's going to be your turn. We are not to be jealous about one another because heaven had plans for everyone and each one of us. And heaven that gave you that plan, no power can stand against that plan. The only one that can destroy it is you. Because God is not going to do anything against a man's will. So as you stand against the purpose of God, it will never come to pass in your life. But if you come, you know, in line, with the leadings of the Holy Spirit, everything that God has called you to do will surely come to pass unto his glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, my Lord. That is the reason why in Romans 8 and the verses 14, he said, as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. You see, the reason why, if God, you are a child of God, you are led by the spirit of God. In Romans 8, 16, he said, because how, yes, I asked this question before, and the answer is just right here. As many as are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. Okay. So, this is how we recognize a child of God. A child of God is the one that is led by the, the, the spirit of God. But you, how do you know that you are a child of God? How do you know? It is very easy for you to know who is a child of God? Who is the child of God is the one that is led by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Ghost. But how do you know that you are a child of God? Let me tell you how you know that you are a child of God. Romans 8, 16. He said, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Hallelujah. You cannot know that you are a child of God unless you receive inner witness. You cannot know that you are a child of God unless it is being witnessed by the Holy Spirit to your spirit. So this is not feelings. We are not talking about feelings. We are talking about inner witness. When you are a witch, you know you are a witch. So it is, if you are a child of God, you know you are a child of God. How do you know you are a child of God? The Holy Spirit that dwells in you. Witness with your own spirit that you are a child of God. Uh, so the point is very clear. If truly you are not deceiving yourself. If truly you are not moving around portraying who you are not. And you will come to be sincere to yourself. Every area that the Lord requires you to work out. You will be sincere and you will be working it out. Why? Because you want to make it back home. You want to make it back home. You don't want to be destroyed on earth here. They that are sent by God, they preach the word of God. And they that are sent by God, they do God's will. So if you come to find out that indeed, 
You are a child of God by the inner witness between the two spirits. The Holy Spirit who is looking into heaven, heaven's records and saying that, oh, okay, this one here is a child of God and will be testifying to your own spirit that indeed you are enlisted as a child of God. Then you know. And once you know that this is who you are, you move around accordingly. When you are a prince, you don't move like a servant unless you have lost your state. This is what the heaven, you know, it's amazing how heaven sees us. We don't even know. You know, we come moving around, rikiki, children of God. That, like, but heaven, the purpose of God for our lives, what heaven has done for us, they are so mighty, so mighty. I received something from heaven and I told, I met the person yesterday and I told the person, I said, you know what? This is uh, what I received about you. She said, ah, Pastor Charles, <laughs> I'm very afraid, oh, but I, I know you are not afraid at all. Why are you not afraid? I know you are not afraid. I said, madam, why must I be afraid? Why must I be afraid? Because your God that loves you so much, whatever that the enemy has planned behind the scene to bring it as a surprise package unto you, has come to the broad daylight has come to the light of the living God and you are being, you, you are being you know, told about what the plan of the enemy against your life is all about. Rejoice! Rejoice our God he reveals to redeem. Deuteronomy 29, 29, he said the secret things they belong to God, but the things that are revealed, they are for us and for our children. Now that you know what the enemy is about to do, stand with the authority in our Lord Jesus Christ. Use the heavenly tools, the salvation tools. Stand against that. Whatever that you decree here, it shall be decreed in heaven. You bind here, it shall be bound in heaven. The whole heaven is already at work. The proof is that you came to receive it. You receive it. How did you receive it? From the above. From the above. So before heaven does anything, we saw it. That the father himself must orchestrate it, operate it. In order, he's, he's the custodian of operation. And afterwards, release the administration wise to the son. And for the performance of the Holy Spirit. So if you are receiving from above, the Holy Spirit reveal it to you. And if the Holy Spirit reveal it to you, it means heaven, the father is already aware of it. So rejoice. Rejoice. All the applause will come to naught in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are not moving around as orphans. We are children we are not bastards we have a father a heavenly father who puts you here on earth for his purpose even when we come to lose our earthly parents we still rejoice because we know that there is a higher a higher father a higher power that is watching over our lives that we are here on assignment and the good thing about it is that someone said he said I don't like Mother's Day. I don't like Father's Day because I have lost my parents. And nobody is going to keep his parents forever. Nobody. Because your parents, they have been also somebody's children. And that is how life is. No one will escape death. You, won't, you can't. So what is important is that now that they gave birth to you, uh, you know, they gave you the training and all that. Your system values are built by them. We thank God. Now you know God. Start living the purpose of God for your life. Start taking glory that many that also had parents did not even have the opportunity to live and be having the number of years that you are having. The enemy one way or another killed them. Killed them. But you are alive. Celebrate their lives. Celebrate the fruits of their labor. Because you are the fruit of their labor. So rejoice. Rejoice. So in Father's Day celebration, Mother's Day celebration, you have to see God. You have to see God. You have to see God. You have to see the purpose of Almighty God in your life. We are not hooked to people. We are children on assignment for God's purpose. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm bringing everything to an end, but not without this. The book of Jeremiah 29 and let me read the verse 11 to 13. God said something through his prophet Jeremiah. He said, Jeremiah, let me tell you my mind concerning mankind. Say, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. 
not of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. To give you an expected end. God who put you here has a wonderful plan for you. He knows why he put you here. He has a plan for your life. That is why when one is living his life, moving around carelessly, and I don't know what God has called me to do and all that, you know, you come to God and allow the Holy Spirit to move in your life. I, I guarantee you, you will know what God has called you to do. Probably you are even doing it. You will be doing it when you don't even know that you are already in God's plan. Jeremiah, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thought of peace. We give God glory. The Lord always have wonderful plans. God is not a God of evil. Your God is not here. He's a father. He's not here to punish you. The Lord is here as a father. If you are going on the wrong route, his responsibility is to put you right. Is to put you right. The thought that I think of you, they are thought of peace and not evil to give you an expected end. So to God alone be glory. Where you are going, the Lord has been there. Hallelujah. Where you are going, where the Lord is taking you, he has been there. You know, it's so wonderful how heaven works with his people. If God is taking you from point A to point C, God will walk through A and C and come back to A and hold your hands and say, my son, my daughter, let's go. Our destination is C. When we get to B, it is not the final. The Lord keeps you going. So that is why no matter what goes on in life, continue holding on this God. Because as far as there is a scent of water in this body, as far as there is a scent of water in life, there is what? There is hope. So you, if you are not to be, you know, uh, careful about what people are saying and what people are doing and what, all the circumstances that are happening around you. The Lord holds your hands. And he said, you shall see that thousand falling here, ten thousand falling there, but it will not come to your dwelling. But even many, 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 when so much is happening, People say that there, are, there is a casting down. But you, you, because God holds your hands, you shall say there is what? A lifting up. To God alone be the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. To give you an expected end. So then how can you obtain God's plan? How can you obtain God's plan? The Lord said, verse 12 of Jeremiah 29, to obtain that plan, then ye shall call upon me. God's plan is not done outside God. God's mandate for your life is not done outside God. I have said this before. That there is no unbeliever that can fulfill the heavenly plan for his life. Listen to me. God can use you. But for the plan of God to be fulfilled in your life, it takes the Holy Spirit. So when you are not a believer, the Holy Spirit is not given, given to unbelievers. You have to come. Holy Spirit is only given at salvation. So when you have come and accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, automatically, you don't even need to pray. Holy Spirit comes in there and starts heavenly plans for your life. Unbelievers cannot fulfill God's plan for their life. But you, you, ye shall call upon God and ye shall go and pray unto him. How do you call upon God? Go and pray to God. How do you fulfill heavenly mandate over your life? Stand in prayer. Continue praying. Continue praying because as you pray, you are activating, you are calling upon the heavens. Ye shall go and pray unto me. And I will hearken unto you. In other words, I will listen to you. And ye shall seek me. Ye shall seek me. Ye shall seek me and find me. You look for God, you will find him. Ye shall seek me and find me. And he, when ye shall search for me with all your heart, be single minded, focus, focus on the heavenly mandate. Know that the one who can establish it is your almighty God. Set your eyes on God, call upon his name, no matter how difficult the circumstances are. Continue focusing on God and allow God to hear from you, and he will be doing the wonderful things that he has called you to do. My last thing, thoughts, let me give it. It's going to be through scriptures. Now, most of the time, the Holy Spirit talks to us, and we are not hearing him. We have already established the communication between the Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So now, as far, the only last communication is between the Holy Spirit and man. Between the Holy Spirit and man. 
By default, God gave us a gift. It is called the gift of discernment. It is called the gift of discernment. This is something that the people of the old did not have. Because it's, it is, it's, a, it's an inner life thing. It's an inner life thing. It is a work that is done internally by the Holy Spirit. And a man, a child of God, must be sensitive to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. To the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't shout. It's the small, still voice. So it needs quietness. I'm not talking about uh, environment noise. I'm talking about the inner quietness. A channel that is open to hear from the Spirit. A channel that is open in a child of God's life to hear from the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit doesn't shout. The Holy Spirit is the prompting Spirit. He will prompt you. Do you know how the law of God was given to Moses? In the form of tablets. Tablets of stones. We, children of God, in the dispensation of grace, people say, as we read in one, John 1.17, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. It seems like the law is over. Yes, the law of Moses is over, but not the law in Christ Jesus. Not the law in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.2. He said, for the law of the spirit of, of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. Law of sin and death. That is the law of Moses. But the law of the spirit of life, the law of the spirit of life, life has a law that is in Christ. Every child of God is ruled and governed and led by the law in Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit. So even if it was not read to you that this is sin, don't do this. Let me tell you, by the time that you are getting yourself in there, you are going to hear the prompt of the Holy Spirit. This is how people come, a, come around and say that, oh, I was going to do this and I felt like, oh, something told me. It is, there is nothing like something that told you. It's an inner, inner word from the Holy Spirit. You never come to find out the exact word about that particular situation. Probably never read it. But let me tell you, the day that you get yourself into that situation, the Holy Spirit will read that word to you. He will prompt you. You will know that say, mm, this is not... I shouldn't be getting myself into this. Hear the, 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 the voice of the Spirit and stop it when the Holy Spirit is stopping it. But you know how man is. Man starts seeing his interest in all kinds of situations and overruling the voice of the Holy Spirit. God knows this. So the Lord did one thing. He said, since I will be talking to you when you are alert and you will blush everything that I will say, I still have a choice to talk to you. I still have ways to talk to you. Let's see these ways. So, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2 and the verse 7, a statement is made in a form of promise from the book of Joel. He said that, he said this, he said, it shall come to pass in the last days, and we are in the last days. Says God, I will pour out my spirit, I will pour out Holy Spirit, I will pour out Holy Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters, shall prophesy. And your young men, they shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Hallelujah. Your old men shall dream dreams. So in the last days, the ministry of dreams and the visions, they shall be increased. The ministry of dreams and the visions shall be increased in the last days. Because God said that this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. This is so wonderful. Because that is exactly what Jesus Christ said in John 16 that we just read. Jesus said, Holy Spirit will take from me and show it unto you. Matter of fact, he will even show you things to come. He will even show you things to come. When people are moving around, visiting fetish priests, uh, Baba, and this one, and that one, roaming around, getting powers and all that, let me tell you, heaven watches over your life. Heaven watches over your life. Power, there is no power but of God. Let them go. To the sea, let them go to the highlands, let them go to wherever that they want to go. But they will come to you in evil way, and the Lord shall scatter them all in the name of Jesus Christ. It's a fact. It's a fact. When you are, you you you, you will just be lying there. Watch this in the book of Job, Job 33, and the verse is 14 to 18. So, in a dream, in a dream, in a dream, please watch this. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, 
Then God opened the ears of men and sealed their instruction that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. Hallelujah. I'm going to explain this because if you are here and you are dreaming and you are taking your dreams for maybe the movie that I watched yesterday, please don't assign these dreams to the movie because the enemy is stealing from you. And if you are here, a child of God, and you are not receiving dreams, still you have to do something about it. The enemy is also stealing from you. Dreams are heavenly visions. He calls it dreams. He calls it the vision of the night. When deep sleep falleth upon man. When the body is not in action anymore. Yes, you are not dead. You are on that bed. Your heart is functioning. But he said, the Lord openeth man. Openeth man for what? Open the door, the spiritual door of man's life. And he sealeth man instructions. Instructions. Instructions for what? So that man would not... He said, then he will redraw man from his purpose. Redraw man from his purpose. What purpose? Man comes here. God gave him a purpose. Man gets here. And man starts doing his own thing. But that is not God's will. The Lord knows that that thing that you want to do so much on this earth here, this is exactly what the enemy is going to use to destroy your life. It will not bring any glory to God. But that is what you are living for. You are so much, you know, so much working for it and all that. But God knows that that is exactly what is going to destroy you. The next thing you know, heaven is open to you at night. And the same thing that you are working so hard for, you come to see completely crushed or something happened to it. And you stand there, you wake up in the morning and you say, Hey, in the name of Jesus, devil, I bind you. Don't bind devil, it was God. Do not bind devil, it was absolutely from Almighty God. God is telling you that what you are doing, where you are spending all your time, all your resources, energy, and everything else, it will amount to nothing. That is not his will. It's not his will. So, he redraw man from his own purpose. Redrawing you from your own purpose and take pride out of man. The man is doing that for his own so that when you move around, hey, doctor, <laughs> hey, honorable, and your shoulders are like this. Meanwhile, you are more than uh, <laughs> nothing before God. More than nothing. Uh, so what profited the man to gain the whole world when he loses his soul? That is exactly what this scripture is saying. He said, I open man's mind in the realm of the spirit so that I can keep man back from his soul being destroyed. Did you read that? He said in verse 18 of Job 33, he said he kept it back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. His life from perishing by the sword. So I have come to tell you, we are talking about how to hear from heaven. You have seen that we have talked about so many things. How heaven keeps talking to us. How heaven keeps talking to us. This is it. If you are here doing your own project, please. Start praying. Call upon heaven for the Lord to put you on the right channel. If you are here taking dreams for granted, please start praying. That may the Lord God guide you to his perfect will. If you are here, you are not dreaming. Or you dream and you, have, you wake up in the morning, you have forgotten everything. Start praying. Ask the Lord to show you the way. To open that way to you. So that you will receive from above. This is how we hear from God. In various, various, various ways that we have talked about. May the Lord bless his word in your life. May the Lord's purpose be accomplished in your life. Whatsoever that God has called you to do, you will not come here and waste God's resources, but you will come and do what God has called you to do. To him alone be the glory for your life that you are living here. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. And bless you and bless you. Everyone is very welcome and we thank God for your lives. Today we have a word from the living God that we titled, Life after the flesh kills. Life after the flesh kills. 
It is very simple. You know, in the book of Genesis, we're not going to read the details. The book of Genesis chapter 4 and the verses 1 to 8. There is a story of a family that opens the Bible about Adam and Eve's family having two children, Cain and Abel. We come to find out that Cain killed his brother, his junior brother, Abel. And we're asking ourselves so many questions about what happened. Bible relates so many things about the details the Lord telling Cain, Cain, sin is lying at the door. Be careful. He's looking for you. When he gets you, you are not going to be well. It comes to a point that Cain despised what the Lord God is saying. And at the end of it all, he finished by killing his brother and all kinds of problems that follow. But the point is this. We are from the same family. What is it that had gone wrong for a brother, for a sister to kill a brother, or for a brother to kill a sister, for a brother to kill a brother, for a sister to kill a sister? Something definitely is not right. In the case of uh, Cain and Abel, we come to find out that Hatred, jealousy, anger, selfishness, obvious, all these things, they come together for a brother to kill a brother and a sister to kill a sister. These are the devices of the enemy. And when one is not having a clear understanding, you come to be a victim of the craftiness of the devil. Victim of the craftiness of the devil. Jesus Christ made a statement in Matthew chapter 7 and the verse is 18 to 20. He said, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is when down and cast into the fire. Wherefore by their fruit we shall know them. Wherefore by their fruit we shall know them. So you man, God is not mocked. And you cannot deceive almighty God. And so it is also for our lives. As Jesus is, so we are. We are not to be deceiving ourselves either. If you are of the nature of good tree, you will bring forth good fruit. If you are of the nature of evil tree, you are bringing forth evil fruit. Uh, a good tree by nature cannot bring forth evil fruit. This is what the word is telling us. So there is nothing like, or oh, it looks like, nothing like that. It is either black or it is either white. Clear. The line of demarcation is the word of God. He divides it. He divides it. He pierced to the asunder and divided anything that cannot be divided. But the word comes in and everything is clear. So we cannot be moving around as children of God and deceiving ourselves. He said, by their fruit, we shall know them. We shall know them. So what is the difference between a child of God and a child of a devil? Because that is a fact. We have children that are of the devil and we have children that are also of almighty God. How would you know who is of the devil and who is of our Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, Romans 8, 9, he said, If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If any man had not the spirit of Jesus Christ, that person do not belong to Jesus. So if the person is not of Christ, then the person is of the devil. Are only two kingdoms. Only two kingdoms. If you are not of Jesus Christ, you are of the devil. No matter what you say and whatever that you believe. Confirmation here is in 1 John chapter 3 and the verses 10. He said, In this
this, the children of God are manifest. And the children of the devil, you see that? The Bible tells us two categories, two groups of people. The children of God on one side and the children of the devil on the other side. So he says, how do you distinguish them? He said, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. So in other words, there are certain things that people do that allows you to know that this is a child of God and this is not a child of God. It's as simple as that. So as a child of God, your nature, it is what is in you, what is operating in you. Because he says that if you are a child of God in Romans 8 now, 8, 9, he said that if you are a child of God, the spirit of Christ is operating in you. If you are a child of God, the spirit of Christ is operating in you. But if you are not a child of God, it is the spirit of bondage that is operating in your life. The spirit of bondage that is operating in your life. The nature of the good fruit, it is brought forth by the children of God. The children of God. And they that of the nature of evil, they are bringing forth evil fruit. They are bringing forth evil fruit. So by their fruit, we shall know them. By their fruit, we shall know they are the children of God. Or by their fruit, we shall know that they are the children of the devil. Clear. If you are of God, you will be doing the righteous things of Almighty God. If you are not of God, you will despise every righteous way of living. And you go after the world. So as children of God, what sort of fruits are we supposed to bring as children of God? We have known it. He said that we are supposed to bring good fruits. But what is good fruits? What is good fruit? In Galatians chapter 5 and the verse is 22 and 23. He said, but the fruit of the spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law, no limit. These are good fruits. As far, you know, they say the fruit is good. If you want to eat, you can eat. Please, fruit is good for your body. Eat. Don't limit yourself in fruit. You know, you are, you are, you, you are on diet. They said... Go ahead. Fruit is good for your body. Good fruit. Continue. Eat as much as you can. These things, there are no limit. You are a joyful person. Continue being joyful. You are a peaceful person. Continue being peaceful. There is no law against it. Limit. There is no limit. Continue. So what does this scripture truly mean for us? It is saying that God's spirit, it makes us loving. It is the spirit of God. The good tree is bringing forth good fruit. How? The nature of the tree produces good fruit. The nature of the child of God is after the spirit of God. The spirit of Christ. And it makes you to become a lovely person. A happy person. A peaceful person. Someone who is patient, kind, good. Faithful, gentle, self-controlled. In these things, we said there is no limit. There is no limit. These are things that, you know, patiently, we say, oh, what is it that you are joyful about? I, I am joyful because the spirit in me is a spirit of joy. Why are you so peaceful? I am peaceful in the midst of this tribulation because the spirit in me Cannot do otherwise. That is why. Because we belong to Jesus Christ. We have killed. Every selfishness. Every desire that is not of God. We kill these things. The spirit of God is not a spirit of selfish. The spirit of God is not a spirit that desires evil things. Until they have caused somebody to fall, they will not have their peace. They only smile when they see somebody going through afflictions. 
When someone is in trouble, that is the time that they smile. You see, I told you. I told you that it will happen. I told you. They take joy when they see somebody being sorrowful. Someone in trouble. Someone that is facing problems, that is the time that they take joy. This is of the nature of the evil children of the devil. Children of the devil. By their fruit, we shall know them. God's spirit gives us life. So we should follow the spirit of God. And not going after the, you know, the deceitful way of the wicked. When you know where you belong to, you make sure that you bring forth those good fruits and not following things after the you know the, 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 the kind of their nature evil evil we are not like that so ah uh, we are talking about the deeds of the flesh what does the bible says about life after the flesh what does the bible says about life after the flesh. In Romans 8 and the verse is 13. Because the whole point is this, right? It is the life after the flesh and the life after the spirit. So he says, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. One life leads to death. But if ye through the spirit do modify, mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So, two things that we are talking about here. On one side, the flesh. And the other side, the spirit. Connoting the flesh linking to the bad tree. And the spirit linking to the good tree. So, if you operate with the spirit of God, you are meant to bring forth good fruits. If you are operating with the spirit of the world, the spirit of bondage, the spirit of the devil, what are you bringing forth? Evil fruit. Evil fruit. And the evil fruit is leading one to death. Operating being evil, wicked people, their ends are what? Death. Simple. Simple. So your time of joy because you see someone going through troubles. And you have now a topic in your home to talk about somebody and saying evil things and taking joy at that time. You know what is awaiting for you? Death. Death. It will never ever result any form of life. Not to yourself, not to your family, not to your children, not to your generations to come. Because your nature, your nature is what you are impacting in your generations to come. Your children, they grow up. Also talking about people. They have grown up also with the, all the evil things that you are doing. They hear you parents saying these things. So they think that is the right way of, for, to go. But it is not. A life after the flesh shall die. But the life after the spirit. You know it is not a life of yoga. It is not a life of yoga. When I have identified something in my life that is not right. I am not going to be playing yoga to get rid of it. He said it is the spirit of God. It is through the spirit of God that do mortify. Mortify. Mortify meaning put to death. The deeds of the flesh. So it's not by yourself, by your strength. By your, you know, <laughs> he said by strength shall no man prevail. You are not going to overcome those deeds of the world in your life by your own strength. Everyone and each one of us has something to work out with. Every single time. And that is one thing that I was saying. I said, you know what? Christianity becomes extremely boring. If you don't identify things in your own life to work with. If you are not identifying sins, you have to look into your life and say that, you know what? Uh, I'm not going to wait until New Year. To make a new resolution about maybe a spirit of lies that is operating in you. And said that this year, so you have made yourself, you are taking the whole year to deal with that situation. As if God needs a whole year for the spirit of lies to be out of your life. No, it is every moment of your life that you come across a situation 
or a trend of life, a behavior, something that is in you, and you know that it is not of the tree, it's not of the good tree. This is not something that is good fruit. We see these things. When you see a fruit that is polluted, you can see and you don't eat it because it is not good. That is why we go to the market, we look at them and we choose the fruit that we are taking home. The choice of the fruit because of our criteria. So when something is wrong in our lives, we know we are not going to deceive ourselves. This year, uh, this is what I'm going to do. It is too long for the whole year. You tell yourself, Spirit of the Lord, please, I need help. God, this situation is like I can't help lying. Every time that I hear a story that I have to go and tell this story to someone else, I'm always adding something. Why am I adding this? By the way, this is just the gossip. So why am I even taking this story to someone anyway? Lord, please help me. And as you keep asking God for help, the Lord will help you. It's not yoga. It's not yoga. So through the spirit of Christ, we will mortify the deeds of the devil, of the flesh. They will all go. But we have to be willing to do so. In Galatians 5 and the verses 19 to 21, let me make sure I don't go too fast, so we have a clear understanding. We have just read clearly that as children of God, if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if through the Spirit we live after the Spirit, we then mortify the deeds of the flesh. So now what is important is that what is the deed of the flesh and what is the deed of the spirit? Let's start with the deed of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5 verse 19 to 21. He says, now the works of the flesh are manifest. He said, now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revealings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So these are the things that the Lord is saying that, you know, these are big, 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 big ways. But let me break it down. The meaning of this scripture is simply saying that some people's desires have made them to be immoral or have gone to immoral ways. They are desires. So filthy thoughts, shameful deeds, they don't even see those things as things that are not glorifying God. They worship, they go and worship idol. They practice witchcraft. They hate others. They are hard to get along with. They are consultants of anything that can be consulted. Readers of palm, they want to know this, they want to know that. Except God, that can give them all solutions. They don't want to know about Almighty God. And they are practicing these things. So they become jealous. They are angry when they see somebody doing well. They are selfish because they wish it is them that is in that situation. So they are not happy. These are not characteristics of children of God. These are not the characteristics of children of God. Because normally a brother doing well, we are supposed to be happy with the brother. Because our nature is joy. We see people in joy, we join them in joy. We see them in peace, we join them in peace. When someone is long-suffering, we join them in their long sufferings in whichever way that we can help. We go ahead and help them. But we don't make room for them to fall. Or when they have fell, we are not rejoicing because they have, <laughs> they have been fallen. Absolutely not. These are not children of God at all. The children of God, they help each other. They make sure that everyone is okay. He said, pray for each other so that you may receive your healings. 
praying for each other. The prayer of the righteous man, a valid match. We were talking about these things. So if I am not praying for you and you are not praying for me, where are we going? One is bringing down thousand, two, ten thousand. So when you are praying, maybe you don't know how many of them that are against you. You need a help of a believer to also stand with you to bring your situation completely down. These are the children of God in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is living after the Spirit? John 16 and the verses 13 to 14. Jesus Christ made a statement. He said, how be it when he, the Spirit of truth, talking about the Holy Spirit, when, he said, how be it when he, the Spirit of truth is come, when the Holy Spirit is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you on things to come. He will show you things to come. He will show you things to come. Not only that, he shall glorify Jesus Christ. For he shall receive of Jesus and shall show it unto you. He shall receive of Jesus Christ and he shall show it unto you. We struggle to fight life battles simply because we are ignorant of the Holy Ghost input. But most of the time, when the child of God is connected, whatever that is on the way, what is to come, the Holy Spirit, one of the greatest ministry of the Holy Spirit is revelation. 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 He reveals the word. He reveals not only the word of God to you, but what the enemy is also doing in darkness. What they have planned against your life. What they said that they are going to use against you. By the time that you are sleeping. By the time that you are reading your word. By the time that you are connected with the spirit of God. The Lord almighty God. One way or another. Will highlight unto you. Will bring forth what the enemy is planning against you. That is why. We walk in such a mighty faith. We are weak as children of God. But that is why we are strong. Because when we are weak, we are strong. We humble ourselves before the Spirit of Almighty God to take absolute control of our lives. Who is the devil out there to come and say that, you know, what God wants to do, I will not allow it to come to pass. When the Lord is moving, nobody there coming around and say that, ah, you will not move. It is because the power, we are not in touch with that power. We have seen all kinds of situations. What the devil has done over people who are ignorant. When we come in, the Lord turns the situation around. How much more what the Lord God is going to do? Who is the devil out there to stand on the way and say that I will not allow God's purpose to come to pass in your life? Nobody can stop God's purpose for your life. The only one that can stop it is you. Unless you don't want it, God will not force you. But otherwise... We haven't come across any situation that the devil is in control that we come with the God spirit and this, the devil says that, no, I will not go and the situation continually remains. No, we haven't seen that before. Unless you yourself, you want to be in that situation. But if you want God to take you out of the situation, you will be out of the situation. That's it. The ministry of revelation is so powerful. Amazing. And it's through that that we function. He shall take from the Father and me, Jesus, and he shall reveal it unto you. So the will of the Father is revealed unto us by his Spirit. By his Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we are going nowhere. Without the Holy Spirit, a child of God is going nowhere. And the Holy Spirit is not. He is a gift. As soon as a believer, you come to believe. As soon as you come to believe, automatically the Holy Spirit is given. You don't have to pray for the Holy Spirit to come. You don't have to pray for you to receive the Holy Spirit. Absolutely not. As, just believe. Just believe. It's as simple as that. Yes, it is as simple as that. It comes as a salvation package. There is a difference between receiving the Holy Spirit, which is a gift automatically. As you believe in Jesus Christ, 
you have it. You have the Holy Spirit. And there is another level of the fellowship with the Holy Spirit that is called the filling of the Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit or being baptized with the Holy Spirit. These are different things. But do you have the Spirit of God in you? Yes, as a believer, you have the Spirit of God in you. That is why you belong to Jesus Christ. If you do not, you do not have the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit in, in, in you, you are not of Christ. You are not. It's as simple as that. So it is time for you to yield your spirit unto the Holy Spirit. Tell the Lord, please, let with my own free will, Holy Spirit, take over. Take over. Take over my ways. Take over my thoughts. Take over my deeds. The next thing you know, because you ask him, he will do it. If you are not asking, he will not do it. Otherwise, it's like he are, you know, he's forcing God's will on you. No. Holy Spirit is a gentle spirit. As far as you don't ask him anything, he will just be there waiting. The day that you acknowledge him, that day, he will work with you. He will work with you. That's how he is. The small, still voice, you know, his voice is such a mighty, small, still voice. Mighty, small, still voice. Mighty, but small, still voice. My son, this is not a place to go. You blush it. Because your friends are there, so you are going. My daughter, this is not something to say. Hey, there, let me say something. He, he has to know. He has to know. Who do you think he, he thinks he, he is? I am my, me, 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 me. Hey, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? You don't know what is going on in the realm of the spirit. The Holy Spirit is telling you, please be quiet. Hand over your battle to me. Let me fight for you because you don't know the implications of all these things. I have seen them doing these things. I know exactly where it is heading to. Let me take over. And you are standing there because you are in the flesh. You think that because of your height, because of your money, because of your standard, that you, you are going... No, we don't fight the spirit world with the flesh. We fight the spirit with the spirit. It is only they that are spiritual that can conquer spiritual things. It is only they that are spiritual that can conquer spiritual things. You will conquer the spiritual things and they will be manifested in the physical. Hebrews 11, 3, he said, through faith, we understand that the wilds were framed by the word of God, that the things that are seen, they are not made of things which do appear. So what you are seeing, that is not what it is. I have been saying this all the time. What you are seeing, that is not what it is. Get spiritual to find out what is really happening. Get spiritual to find out what is really happening. The person that is walking with you, he say, oh, my friend, uh, we go shopping together. Oh, we do this together. We do that together. But the day that God will reveal that person to you, you'll be shocked. You'll be shocked. You'll be shocked. I thought you are my friend. Yeah, that was a thought. That was just a thought. It was a thought. A man needs to get spiritual so that you can move by the direction of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 and the verse is 14. He says, he said, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You see that? As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Where is the Spirit of God leading you to? Where is the Spirit of God leading you to? Romans 8, 29, he said, For whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among the brethren. So what do we do? We are destined to become like Jesus Christ. We are destined to become like what? Like Jesus Christ. What does it mean? That we are also going to raise dead and doing exactly as Jesus you know, did in his ministry. Not just that. Not just that. Because Jesus Christ himself, he said that we, you know, we are going to do mighty works and even greater works than he did. Because of the Holy Spirit. And because he's at the right hand of the Father. 
So as we have been predestined to become like Jesus Christ, in which way? People, most of the time, they see only the ministry of Christ. Please, it's beyond that. Because the ministry of Jesus Christ only lasted three and a half years. But the man was already 33 and a half years. The man was already 33 and a half years. So if you had only taken the three and a half years life of Jesus Christ, you will miss it all. You will miss it all. There is nothing like ministry without preparation. There is nothing like life without preparation. If you are not prepared, that is why we train our children into life. If you don't train them, they get into life with a lot of struggle and messed up. So we train them the ways of the living God so that when they grow, they will not depart from the Lord. They will have a standard of living. A standard of living. When people are going astray, they will be able to go the right way because they are guided by the spirit of the living God. The children of God, they are led by the spirit of God. The children of God, they are led by the spirit of God. Our children, you cannot. A good fruit is supposed to bring forth. Is it a good tree supposed to bring forth a good, a good fruit? Do you know what is in the fruit? A seed. A seed. Can the seed of the good tree be an evil seed? No way. No way. No way. So, you know, if truly you are a child of God, you will train your children to be children of God. You will train your children to be children of God. So, if you are a child of God and your children have gone astray, question your own integrity and fellowship with the Holy Ghost. Something definitely has gone wrong somewhere. But it is not too late. Because that is one thing about Jesus Christ. Always at the door, knocking. One great, great thing about the Holy Spirit is that gentle spirit waiting for the day that you open him or you hand over things to him and he said my son my daughter it is not too late as far as you are alive life goes on i will take over from now whatever that the enemy has done i will come in and turn things around but from now onwards please listen to me listen to me because i know the thoughts that i'm thinking towards you thought that i thought towards you the thought of peace and not evil to bring you to that expected end. So the expected end, you will not get there until the Holy Spirit takes you there. You don't know where the Lord is taking you. He said that he had predestined you to become like Jesus Christ. How can you become like Jesus Christ when you only know the three and a half years of his ministry? He was a child. He was born as a child. He came to the time that he was 12 years. He was in the family. He had brothers and sisters, eight people in the family. So we don't only see Jesus Christ raising dead. You have to also see Jesus in home. The man was a carpenter. So you have to see Jesus Christ also working. You have to see Jesus also working. Carpenter for what? He wasn't making beds for the whole house only. He was making carpentry work to sell so that he can feed his family. He can feed his family. Jesus was not married but Jesus Christ has responsibilities. Joseph died. By the time that Joseph died, you know, seven people still in, 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 in his, in his, on his responsibilities. So before the 33 or 30 years, all these years, Jesus Christ lived a regular life like all of us. All of us. Yet, the man, he was humble. Son of God, he was humble. He knew what was operating in him. He was humble. He was humble. You, you wouldn't, you know, they were so surprised to the extent that they saw Jesus in his ministry. They said, ah, is this not Jesus? The brothers are here. The sisters are here. Is it not the same person? The little Jesus that we saw, nobody had any bad thing to say about Jesus Christ. Except those religious people. His time of ministry. It's amazing. They didn't say that Jesus, we saw you stealing at the age of 12. And now you are here telling us that you are a man of God. Are you not the rapist that we saw around? The thief that we saw around? We saw you carry people's uh, a TV. It wasn't not you. None of this. 30 years of his life. Nobody had any bad thing to say about Jesus Christ. Uh, well, 
If you are not like that, that doesn't condemn you. Because that is exactly what the Holy Spirit is all about. There is no condemnation in us. Because Christ was born out of any form of filthiness. He was without sin, but he was made sin. You and I, we were born as sinners. Christ came and cleansed us. We are clean. Now that you are clean, will you go back? No. We stay with the nature of God and we continue. We continue in life in Hebrews 12 too. We continue looking unto Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith. We look unto him because he's our destination. We look unto him because we want to have the same character. You know, character is something that is very much outward. But you see, there is an internal, internal behavior. The spirit that is in you will bring forth your character. It is the spirit. Character, we only see the character outward. It's, it looks like it's something outward. It's something that is outside. We display our character. But the point is that your character is triggered by what is inside. Your character is triggered by what is inside. So we are talking about the nature of the believer. Either you are of the nature of the devil or you are of the nature of almighty God. You cannot be in between. So what is that? The person is coming to church. Praise the Lord. He says hallelujah. At the same time, when the witches and the wizard gathered, he also gathered with, with them. And they say, let's kill him. They say, yes, crucify him. For what? Something definitely has gone wrong. We look unto Jesus to become like Jesus Christ. Because Jesus, as we said, condemns nobody. That is why he has given us a spirit to take us ahead of life. Bringing us onto a better future. In Romans 8 and the verses 15, he talks about how Jesus Christ had set us free from the law of sin and death. We are talking about life after the flesh. He said it kills. It kills. But we are not to operate after the flesh anymore because in Romans 8 15 he said ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but ye have spirit the spirit of adoption whereby we cry Abba Father we have spirit the, we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry Abba Father the spirit that is working in you is calling upon the name of the living God that is what we said by their nature by their nature we shall know them by their fruit we shall know them so we are free and we are free by Christ. Romans 8 2, he said, The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So we are regulated by the law, which is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So if you are in Christ Jesus, there are certain things that you will not do. There are certain things that you will not do because your environment is regulated by the law which is in Christ Jesus. And that law which is in Christ Jesus, that is what sets you free, make you free from the law of sin and death. Some people ask themselves, say, why God gave the law? How would you have known about sin if the law was not there? How would you have known about sin? This is why. So we are free. We are free. You know what that freedom means? That freedom means that sin shall not have dominion over you. In that Romans 6, 14. Sin shall not have dominion over you. So it's not like you don't have power over sin. So no matter what, you have to fall. No, it's not like that. It is not like that. You have a power, internal power, an outward power. Because you are led by the Spirit of God. You are empowered by the Spirit of God. They see you, people that of the evil. People that are of, of, of the nature of the devil, when they see the children of God, they know, they know, they know, they know, they know, they know, they know the difference between a child of God and the child of the devil. Because they that are of the same nature, they fly together. So shall the children of God. If you are of the nature of light, you love coming to the light. If you are of the nature of the devil, of darkness, you don't like light. 
That is why they fight you. That is why they fight you. Because when light is coming, it is exposing them. It is exposing their deeds. It is exposing, destroying their work. So they fight you. But God had given us that power to stand against any work of the devil. Anyone that stands against your family, by the spirit of you, that power shall bow in the name of Jesus Christ. We are set free and we are set free by Jesus Christ. And the word says that in John 8, 36, he said, if the son Jesus Christ shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. If Jesus Christ make you free, you are free indeed. Unless you are not sure that you are free by Christ. Unless you are not sure of the spirit that is operating in you. Eh, it comes to a point that a man is not very sure. Obviously, if you are operating with the deeds of the flesh, you have gone to see a fetish priest. Oh, Baba, help me. Oh, eh, eh, so, so, and so, help me. And by the time that I get this, I will come and honor you and this one. And at the same time, you are in the church. So, what are you thinking? As pastor is preaching and talking about the spirit of God, you wonder what spirit is operating in my life. What spirit is operating? Did the thing that I obtained, was it God that did it or was it the Baba that I went to see? You are the step. Let me tell you, you are of the devil. You are of the devil. Because if you are of God, you won't even think of Baba. You will not. May the Lord God bless his word. May the Lord God bless his purpose in everyone and each one of us. Everything that God says you are going to become, you will become in the name of Jesus. Every power that stands against you, against your family, we come against them in the name of Jesus. Whatsoever that is battling your life and saying that they will not allow God to move forward, they cannot because of the spirit that is operating in you. You are free by Jesus Christ. You are free indeed. Go out there and bring forth good fruit unto the glory of the Father. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. So we thank God. We have a word from the Lord for you today. And this word is titled, Is there anything too hard for God? Is there anything too hard for God? You know, it is always very... Uh, Interesting because we Christians, children of God, when we are serving Almighty God, if we serve God without understanding of his word, you might come to a point that you are being frustrated because you have not read what the word says about your calling, your fellowship, your, your walk with Christ. The Lord never told any one of us that we are going to have it easy simply because we are children of God. But it was completely the opposite. Jesus made a statement in the book of John. John chapter 16 and the verse is 33. Jesus said, These things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. But in the world, ye shall have tribulation. In me, ye might have peace. But in the world, ye shall have tribulations. You know, the book of Psalms, Psalm 34 and the verses 19. The word of God says, he said, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord deliver him out of them all. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. So this is the state of a child of God. You know, we, we are thinking that when we are children of God, we are exempt from sicknesses, diseases, trials, tribulations, afflictions, financial issues, all kinds of issues that might come on a way of a, a believer or as unbeliever, we are just thinking that as we serve God, we are not entitled to go through those things. That is a lie. Because Christ never said that. Jesus Christ 
never ever told us that we would not be facing problems. It is completely the opposite. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered them. Oh, God would deliver. So, you know, the good news is that <laughs> problems you will be going through simply because you are righteous. You will be going through problems because you are righteous. Matter of fact, you are even going to have more problems than the unbeliever that is out there. The Lord said that many are the you know, afflictions of the righteous. But the good news is that God will deliver you out of every problem that comes on your way. Almighty God will deliver you out of every single problem that comes out of your way. That comes in your way. The Lord will deliver you. So it's a matter of you understanding the word of God and having peace in your heart. It is our reactions towards the problems that are going to determine truly who we are. The difference between you and an unbeliever that is out there, someone that is not serving God, is that the problems that are killing that person, when those problems come on your way, you are delivered simply because you serve God. But when the problems are here as a believer and you are just behaving as an unbeliever, you don't have faith, not knowing that your faith is one that is being drowned and you are not understanding what the Lord God is doing in your life, then what, where is your faith? Then why are you saying that you are a child of God? Then what is the difference between you and someone that have not come to know our Lord Jesus Christ. These things are very important for us to understand so that we have the right attitude when we are facing difficulties. We say that we are children of God, followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. First John chapter 2, verse 6. The word of God says. He that saith he abideth in Jesus ought himself also to walk even as he walk. He that saith he abideth in Christ Jesus ought himself also to walk even as he walk. In other words, if you are saying that you are disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ, then you have to follow Jesus. Following Jesus means that what Christ did, that is what you are also meant to what to do. And the Lord Jesus Christ's behavior towards problems, you know, were very peculiar. The Lord Jesus' behavior towards problems, we have to see how Christ reacted towards issues because as a son of God came into this world here he was not exempt from problems he had issues as you and I might also have problems but Christ's attitude towards those issues Jesus Christ's behavior towards those problems he was tempted yet he sinned it not so how did he do this how was it possible for christ to live in this world here where temptations and trials are just the arrows of the enemy towards the child of god's life every moment the man went through so much yet not even a single one sin And he was a man. He was a man. So, how did Jesus Christ pray? What did Jesus, what did he say when he was going through 
situations. What was Christ's reaction when problems were thrown on his side? It is important for us to study. You know, obviously, a man's life is full of issues. And Christ's life was also full of problems. We are not going to be able to bring them all, but at least highlight just a couple of them so that we will be able to react when these things show up in our ways. The right things that we have to do, the right things that we have to say, we will be saying those things, and then we will be called indeed the disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. The book of John, John chapter 12, and the verses 27 to 28. Jesus Christ was facing difficulties. And the word says, he said, now my soul troubled. That is problems. My soul troubled. And what shall I say? So I am in difficult situation. And what shall I say? My soul is troubled. This is Jesus speaking. My soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause, came I unto this hour? No. Father, glorify thy name. Father, glorify thy name. Let's explain this. Jesus Christ said that his soul is troubled. There are issues that are troubling Christ. What should be his reaction towards these issues? What do you say when you are in the midst of problems? When your heart is down. When you are feeling depressed because something pressed you. When you are facing these situations. What do you say? Are you going to pray saying that Father deliver me out of these problems? Father comfort my heart. Father heal me. Or you will say what Jesus said. Father glorify thy name. Father glorify thy name. It seems so right to pray that prayer saying that Lord, my heart is troubled by this particular situation. Deliver me out of this situation, my king. That is seeing things from your point of view. Maybe the Lord wants you to go, th this, you know, go through this situation to glorify himself. But you are thinking of your own glory. So you said, God, please deliver me out of this situation. It is so interesting. It is the will of God as we live that we want to live. Jesus Christ in his ministry, in his earthly ministry, the Lord was not healing everybody. People say that there is no sickness that Jesus healed. Christ didn't heal everybody. You know, when you read the book of Acts, you will see that Acts 4, getting to the end 5, you're going to see a man that was lame from his birth. And he was taken to the beautiful gate every moment. And the man was all constantly asking for arms. And the religious people, the people that were going to church, were constantly giving him money, including Jesus Christ. Do you know how many times Jesus has been in that temple? Several times. But we are told that Christ never ever healed that man. But the man was asking for money and the Lord gave him money. Because he did not receive the promise the father's will at that time for Christ to heal that lame man. It was 
to present themselves after Christ has been glorified. For this man to ask arms when he says Christ, run. revival wouldn't have taken place. So it's not every single thing that we want that the Lord will just go ahead and do it for us. Whatever that we desire, we have to desire those things according to the will of the Father. So Jesus Christ himself facing difficulties. Obviously, I am sick. You want to see Jesus Christ will pray the time, bring the name of God to be what? To be glorified. And this has to be our attitude also. Jesus Christ's ministry. Wonderful things that obviously if you are going to make a decision about your life, most of us might just move in and start doing what we think is right. Jesus' ministry, the people that were coming to work with Jesus Christ. In the book of Luke chapter 6 and the verses 12 and 13. He said, and it came to pass in those days that Jesus went out into a mountain to pray and continue all night in prayer to God whom also he named apostles. This is very important. So in other words, in order for Jesus to choose his disciples, people that were going to work or represent him, over here the lord has to go on the mountain the whole night he was in touch with the father and he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for what purpose just to be able to choose his followers he came out and he chose 12 people To follow him. Do you know that most of us, as Jesus is, so we are. So that, you know, if God created us as monkeys and Jesus as a human being, it would have been very difficult for man to follow Christ. In our own image and likeness so these things that we are saying it's not like it is something that is impossible for man he came here he lived as a man and he was able to go through these things and we look at what he did and we watch over the man was constantly seeking for the will of the father and always trying to do what is pleasing in the sight of his father is it what is driven your life are you living glorifying God? Is it what is in your mind in everything that you do towards the kingdom of God? The life that you are living. Are you living for yourself or you are living for the name of God to be glorified? If you are living and the name of God is not being glorified in your life, then something definitely has gone wrong. Because there is nothing be, you know, different between you who is at church singing and praising God and someone who is not. The one that is in the world out there singing and praising the devil. But you are not doing the will of God as you are in the church. So since you are not doing the will of God, automatically you are doing the will of devil in the church. You are just a church goer. And we do know that the true church of our Lord Jesus Christ is the invisible church. Is the church that is connected by the people's hearts. The heart that Christ sees. The true believers of Christ, the ones that are doing the will of God. These ones are indeed the followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. The situation might seem right to you. Every single thing, when you look around, you will see that, okay, this is the right decision that I need to make. 
what is it that is a big deal especially when people have been following him from the very beginning automatically what will come in the mind of christ is that the ones that started with me the people that have been faithful to me these are the ones that i'm going to choose no I prayed about it jesus christ he prayed he went before the father and said that whom do i choose the father gave him the names and the lord jesus christ chose judas the lord chose judas among the 12 and he called them the apostles he called them the apostles interesting scripture in proverbs chapter 3 verse 4 especially 5 and 6 the word of god says he said trust in the lord with all thy heart trust in the lord with all thy heart and lean not unto thy own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path trust the lord with all thy heart don't trust your job do not trust your own understanding because your understanding might not be the will of god lean not unto thy own understanding but in all thy ways in all thy ways all means all in every single way that you are going to take you need to bring god in acknowledge god acknowledge god and the spirit of god will direct your path we are talking about is there anything too hard for god It is about our attitudes towards the problems that we are facing. How we approach the problem. How we react towards the problem. Our reactions in the midst of the trials and the tribulations are going to determine the glory to God. And we have said that a life of a child of God is a life that is purposed to bring glory not to yourself but to Almighty God alone. A life of faith hebrews 11 6 without faith it is impossible to please god and he that cometh to god must believe that he is and he is a rewarder of day that diligently seek him the lord will reward you when you acknowledge god when you seek god in the midst of the ways that comes to you every single way that you are taking how is your school doing you think that you're gonna be successful by your own canalities you need god in that situation how is your health how is your finances what about your marriage what about your children what about every single thing that you are going through is god's name mentioned in there are you acknowledging god in that situation if that is the case then you are not to be worried because the lord will glorify him his name god will glorify his name and it is so interesting because the moment that we bring god in any situation the name of god is in question the is in question in other words the moment that we pray about the situation seeking god's way for, for, you know by the situation automatically god's name is in question the lord has to stand for his name and he will glorify himself how do we react when we have problems we're going to try and take one example from the old testament and another example from the new testament what type of problem that you have and what is your reaction towards these problems book of john chapter 11 verse 1 the word of god says he said now a certain man was sick named lazarus of bethany the town of mary and her sister martha this is a problem the man lazarus was sick it's a problem to lazarus and it's a problem to the family Martha, you also have a problem and you'll be in this world here 
you will be having problems so having problems is not the problem it is our attitude towards the problem and how the whole situation you know will end this is the issue that we're talking about here this is the new testament lazarus is sick genesis chapter 15 and the verses 1 and 2 says after these things the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision saying Abraham fear not fear not I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward and Abraham said Lord God what will thy give me seeing i go childless that is a problem it's a problem lazarus is sick it's a problem abraham did not have any child the lord came to him and spoke to abraham saying that abraham don't fear of anything don't worry about life i am thy exceeding great reward and abraham said god you are my reward but so far i have a problem and my problem is that I am childless. Someone is out there that is barren. Someone is out there that has no finances. Someone is out there that has no shelter. Someone is out there that is sick. Someone. Abraham and Abraham is telling Almighty God in his face that God I have a problem I have a problem yes can you be worshiping God and have a problem yes can the Lord God be telling you that I am your great and exceeding reward and you have a problem yes he had a problem so mary and martha in the case of their brother Lazarus, the word of god says in john 11 3 he says that he said therefore and martha sent unto jesus saying lord behold he whom thou lovest is sick And Lazarus, that is John 11, 5 to 7. He said, Jesus loved the three of them, Mary, Martha, and the brother Lazarus. But verse 6, when Jesus heard, therefore, that Lazarus was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, said he to his disciples, let's go into Judea again. Could the Lord Jesus love you so much? And at the time that you express your problem to Christ, and Christ said, I'm waiting. Christ loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus so much. And they have sent to tell Jesus Christ that Lazarus is sick. And Jesus' statement is that I have to wait. I have to wait. Our reaction, if you love someone and you heard that your mother that you love so much, your child that you love so much, that child is sick. Wherever you are, whatever that you have to do, you will do it quickly, rushing to come and see your mother, see your father, see your child. It's, an, it's a reaction of love. But the Lord Jesus, the word says that he waited Two more days. He aborted in the same place for two more days. Mm. Jesus, didn't you hear that Lazarus is sick? The one that you love is sick. But he waited two more days. 
Well, what we are talking about here are spiritual principles. Because we took one from Genesis and um, from uh, from Old Testament and another one from the New Testament. In the case of Abraham, Genesis 17, 19, 15 to 19. In the case, we saw the case of Lazarus and Jesus Christ's reaction. The case of Abraham, Genesis 17, 15 to 19, he said, And God said unto Abraham, God coming to Abraham told Abraham, He said, As, as for Sarah, as for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. The man has came to God as God came to him. God said, I am thy great exceeding reward. And Abraham said, God, I know you can reward me with everything. But I have a problem. I am childless. And the Lord left after their conversation. And Abraham was waiting for the problem to be solved. As the messenger was sent to Jesus, Lazarus is sick. And the Lord waited two more days. And God coming to Abraham again, the Lord telling Abraham, Abraham, I am here. From now onwards, concerning your wife, Sarai, don't call her Sarai anymore. Call her Sarah. Call her Sarah. And I will bless her. Verse 16, I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of men. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said unto his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah, that is ninety years old, bear? And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant. And with his seed after him. God, you have still not solved my problem. The Lord said, Abraham, I am going to solve your problem. But at the time that the Lord heard Abraham's problem, and what God has come to tell Abraham now, you know, years has been passed. Abraham has not seen anything. You know, now Abraham is old, and Abraham is telling God, out of his own promises to him, that God, what you are saying, I understand. I know I have faith. But is it possible? He said, the man, he laughed. He laughed. He said, I am 100 years old. We all know what it means to have 100 years old. And my wife, Sarah, is 90 years old. Is it possible for a man of 100 years and a woman of 90 years to have a child? And God said, I am the Lord. I am talking to you. I'm telling you what I'm going to do. The child is coming. Call his name Isaac. And I'm going to have a covenant with this child and his seed. Father, to you alone be the glory. Maybe in the midst of your issues that you have brought before the Lord, God has spoken to you. And the Lord said, he will do it. You have been waiting one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, and the no child is coming out of this marriage. Ten years after there is no child, everybody is talking. Because traditions, you know, and human beings, that's the way we say, after they have gotten married, you know, within a few months, we are expecting these things as a normal course of life. So after 10 years, after 5 years, and nothing is happening, oh, human beings has already written you off. She's barren. And if God is not in there, you already had a concubine that had had many children that are already mocking you. Desperate. Depression. Name it. Name it. 
is in the midst of trials that you will know a heart that is calling on the Lord. It is in the midst of issues that you will know a true child of the living God. By their fruits we shall know them. It is not by their fruits in good times only. It is by their fruits in tough times. Are you going to call on the Lord? And when you have called on the Lord, what about if the Lord tarries and he's not coming? He said he would do it and he's not doing it. What is your reaction towards that? Are you going to stop coming to church? What do you do? Especially when he keep promising you. You don't have no child. But every time the Lord comes around and showing you that you are playing with your children and with your family. That's what God was doing with Abraham. Abraham is 100 years old. You know, the wife is 90. No child, but God is talking about nations that come out of them. God is talking about a, 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 a child that is going to be born called Isaac. And the man laughed. He said, God, I heard this before. I think we had this conversation. I told you my problems. And you have not done anything about it so far. But he laughed. Maybe you are also laughing at God. Maybe you are fellowshipping in the church. And you are still laughing about God concerning your situation. He laughed. Mm. Well, Jesus Christ has not come to Lazarus' rescue yet. And the verse 11, chapter 11 of John, verse 14 and 15, he said, Then said Jesus unto them plainly, his disciples, he said, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes, for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent ye may believe, nevertheless, let's go unto him. By the time they called him, Lord, come, Lazarus is sick. The Lord tarried and he didn't come. By the time you are in the midst of your problems, you have prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and there is no results. No results. Nothing is happening. And suddenly, after his own time, telling his disciples, by the way, let's go. Let's go to Lazarus because he's dead. Let's go to Lazarus because... He's dead. The man was sick. So in other words, now that the situation is worse, everything has gone beyond human's intervention. What is it when it comes to death? The man is dead. He's gone. And Jesus said, let's go. I am glad that I was not there and none of you was also there, that you were here with me. So ye shall be witness of anything that the Lord God is going to do. Let me tell you, this is such a wonderful statement because our reactions towards the situation when it is hard, it has gone beyond measure. It has gone beyond, you know, solution from any man. How do we react? Then Jesus went to see them. When Martha and Mary saw Jesus Christ, then Martha said unto Jesus, John eleven twenty one. 21, he said, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. We called you. You love us. Lazarus, you love him. Lazarus was sick. We just asked you to come that you love you didn't show up now the man is dead if thou would have been here Lazarus wouldn't have died now you make this statement what do you think how this statement came out of this man's mouth 
I mean, this is a woman's mouth, Martha's mouth. Maybe she was angry. Maybe, you know, I mean, you could imagine the brother is dead. After trusting so much because she knew that Jesus has the ability to do something about the situation. But the Lord didn't come and the man is dead. And he's showing up now that he is dead. If only you were here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. What do you say when the situation had come to an end that you know that everything is over? Not wonder Abraham laughed. Not wonder Abraham laughed. And Genesis 18, 9 to 14, you know, not only Abraham laughed before, he said God visited Abraham again. And when God came, the Lord said, Where is Sarah thy wife? And Abraham said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. And Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of woman. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also. Hallelujah. God keep visiting this family. And every time that the Lord visits Abraham, God is talking about the seed of Abraham that is coming. God had, Abraham had already laughed about what God said. Now the Lord visited Abraham again. And now God is asking about Sarah. Where is thy wife Sarah? Sarah was in the tent. He said, Sarah is in the tent. He said, okay. A year from now, thy wife Sarah will conceive. Sarah heard it and she laughed. <laughs> Sarah heard it and she laughed. She said, at this age, everything. He said, it was everything that concerns a woman has been given up. In other words, it is menopause of pose and pose every pose has marked a pose in that woman she said there is no way so she laughed it is impossible she laughed jesus christ if you, only you were here lazarus wouldn't have died lazarus wouldn't have died this is the case that you you, you are grieved with god God, if only you answer my problem, I wouldn't have been in this situation. God, if only by the time that I was praying and fasting so much, you answer me, I wouldn't have been in this problem by this time. Our reactions towards the issues that come on our ways, they laughed. Mm. But remember, there is a scripture in Matthew 19, 26. Jesus Christ telling them that it will be very difficult for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God when the man's heart is after money. And people... This is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You come to a situation that with men... It is impossible. Sarah saw that with men, her situation was completely impossible. Martha saw that with men, her situation was completely impossible. But God said, the moment that you move higher, you move from the level of men to the level of God, with God, all things are possible. You know, I say this, I say, where men limit, where our limit is, that is where God starts. When we of God, when we hit our minute, our limit, that is where God is important for us to understand. The Lord starts when we cannot do anything. And it is very, very difficult for the children of God to understand these things. So John 11, 42 and 42 to 43, in the case of Lazarus, 
he said and when he that had spoken he cried with a loud voice christ is coming you know he had come and he's bringing lazarus out he cried with a loud voice saying lazarus come forth and he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave grave clothes and his face was bound his face was bound about with a napkin and jesus said lose him and let him go hallelujah he came and everything was given the man was buried with a loud voice after he had prayed he said i'm saying this thing so that people that are around they hear and i'm saying them loud so that everyone will hear i was not here and this thing has happened everybody knows that four days that the man is dead for man it is completely impossible but that is where the lord starts and he said lazarus come forth lazarus came forth with the grave clothes covered him he said i need you to do something go and lose him god does not work alone the lord always impact his word in his children he said go and lose him so that he will go every bandage every power of darkness shadowing your situation any situation that the enemy says that it is over when the lord shows up the grave clothes will be removed the situation will be over what man says it's impossible it is the beginning of almighty god and the lord shall stretch for the hand with a voice and call you out of that situation and ye shall know that indeed there is a difference between they that call on the name of the living god and they that are just roaming around without serving god many are the afflictions of the righteous but the lord delivered them god deliver him from all It is important for us to understand these things. These are kingdom principles. That's the way God works. That's how God works. If God has not given up on you, and I know the Lord will not give up on you, it is not your responsibility to turn your back on God because everybody has given up on you. It is the beginning of the great things that God is going to do in your life. That is why they have forsaken you. That God will never ever forsake me. If God be with you, who can be against you? And everybody can be with you. And if God is against you, you have nobody. You have nobody. Sarah have laughed. Abraham has laughed. And they have come to a point that is everything is over. Genesis 18, 13, and to 14. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which I'm old? Is anything too hard? The Lord, at the appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life. And Sarah shall have that son. <clears throat> Glory be to Almighty God. So, he said it again. Why are you laughing? I am the Lord. Is there anything difficult for me? What I say I am going to do, I know man has closed over your case. But I told you, I repeated myself, and I'm telling you again, that such a time like this in a year time, your wife Sarah, no power of darkness will keep her in darkness. Nothing will continue keeping that situation when the Lord God will come in and call the situation out of darkness. No way. Such a time like this. Why are you laughing? Don't laugh. We mean business. Is there anything too hard for God? God will always glorify himself. John eleven forty, And Jesus said unto them, unto her, Martha, he said, I said not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, 
that should it see the glory of God. If only you will believe, you will see the glory of God. If only, as she told you, if only you will believe, you will see the glory of God. As you have prayed and you have the inner witness that the Lord will do something about the situation and the situation has gone to an end and you thought that it was finished. If only you will still believe God that the Lord will come in at our appointed time and the Lord is going to turn that situation around. I am standing here with the word of God to you that that situation is not over until God has come in and finished it. We serve a covenant living God that is subject to his own principles. A kingdom that faileth not. There is nothing that is too hard for God. Nothing that is too hard for God. I do know that with men, these things are impossible. But not with God. I told you, Martha. Mary, I told you, if only you will believe, you will see Lazarus coming out of the grave. Didn't I tell you? I told you. And everybody will see what the Lord God has done in your life. All they that mock you, they will see what God has done in your life. All they that have given up over you, they will see what God has done in your life. All they that thought that you are not going nowhere, they will see what God has done in your life. May the Lord God strengthen us to pray for our enemies that they will not die. Let the Lord give them long life so that they will see what God had made of us. In Genesis 21, 1 to 8, and the word says, The Lord visited Sarah as he had said. God visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken for Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age and at the set time of which God had spoken to him and Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him whom Sarah bare to him Isaac and Abraham circumcised his son Isaac being eight days old as, as, as God had commanded him and Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. Hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, Sarah who laughed said, mm, God had made me like to laugh. <coughs> God had what made me to laugh God had made me to laugh so that all that here will laugh with me all that here what the Lord has done will laugh with me they that mock you in your joy they will celebrate you they that gave you up in your joy they will join you ha in the mighty name of Jesus this shall be the person of every child of God around this world that has put his trust his faith in our Lord Jesus Christ if you are hearing the voice of the living God anything that has been given up in your life that you have not given up on God almighty God will show up and that thing shall be revived and people that forsook you shall celebrate you they will celebrate you they will celebrate you they will celebrate you they will join me to laugh they will join me to laugh and Sarah said who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given a child suck for I have borne him a son in his old age and the child grew and he was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. Hallelujah. That feast, everybody came. That feast, they were all there to come and celebrate. You see, this is the reason why the book of Philippians chapter 4 and the verses 6 and 7. He said, be careful for nothing but in all things. With prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. 
and the peace of the Lord that surpasses all understanding shall keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me tell you this. Your responsibility as the problems are going on, continue praying. Continue praying. Continue praying. Either God, show, God shows up or he is not showing up. Continue remaining. You see result? You don't see result? Do the right thing. You see God showing up to talk to you or he's not coming? Do the right thing. The appointed time, the Lord will come in and that situation will never, ever, ever be the same. Because he made that statement to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 32, in the verses 27, the Lord said, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Behold, I am the Lord, the Lord of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for God? It's not too hard for God. Your situation, it is not too hard for God. Continue fellowshipping with our Lord Jesus Christ. Remain steadfast, steadfast in this faith. Continue praying. When they are mocking you, continue doing it. And the Lord said, Behold, I am the Lord. Is there anything too hard for me? There is nothing too hard for God. At the appointed time, the Lord God shall glorify himself in your life. May the Lord bless you. Amen. Everyone is very welcome. We thank God for your lives and for this day that the Lord has made unto his glory. We have a word from the living God that is titled today, The Principle of Cancelling the Expectation of the Wicked. The Principle of Cancelling the Expectation of the Wicked. Thank you, Lord. The book of Luke, Luke 12, let me read from verse 1 to 3, about the statement, statement that Jesus Christ made. Jesus said, Beware ye of the living of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. The living of the Pharisee, which is hypocrisy. That shall not be known. Ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light and that which ye have spoken in the year in closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetop. Hallelujah. I am so much interested in the uh, beware of the living of the Pharisees which is hypocrisy. And then for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed. This is a promise, statement. There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. <laughs> so whatever that you speak in darkness shall be heard in the light. It's, it's so wonderful. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. So, in the book of Jeremiah, the Lord said unto Jeremiah, a conspiracy is found among the men of Judah. A conspiracy Jerusalem, they are turned back to the iniquities of the affair. The gods to serve them, the house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken with their fathers, have broken my covenant which I have made with their fathers. They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers. They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers. To God alone be the glory. 
Jeremiah 11:21. We're going to break down things. Then we will explain all these scriptures. He said, "Therefore, that says the Lord of the men of Anatoth, that seek thy life, the men of Anatoth, that seek." for your life. They are looking to terminate your life. So in Jeremiah 11 as we will be visiting them has given me knowledge of what? Knowledge of the Then thou showest me their doings. Not only God told him what is going on concerning the plan of darkness, as Jesus said, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. God have made known of the spoken word of darkness into Jeremiah who is in the light. And Jeremiah said, now God's revelation for you to know what the enemy is being planned against you. And Jeremiah said, I bless the name of the Lord who had made known of it to me. And now I know that something is going on in my life, that my life is in line. He said, my life is in line because when the Lord revealed the situation to me, I was like a lamb being led to the slaughter and I did not know you can be in life cruising thinking that everything is well when matter of fact the reality spiritual is completely different from what you are living you know we as children of God he said the just shall live by faith and Hebrews 11 3 says that he said through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God that the things that we see, they are not made of things which do appear. So, the way you, you live your life and think it, okay, there is a spiritual reality that you do not know of until God comes to you and reveals that reality to you. Jeremiah saw it by the mighty work of God. And Jeremiah, Jeremiah said, my goodness, I am like a lamb. Chained to be slaughtered and look at me moving around thinking that all is well but I was about to be slaughtered and I did not know what will happen when you are not in touch with heaven is that the next thing you know you have been attacked with such a disease the next thing you know that you are killed It is because you are serving God in carnality. A church is not run in the flesh. I wake up in the morning and saw what the Lord The church of God, the children of God must pray. The church has to pray. The church has to stand for people that are There is a spiritual world out there until God shows you how it looks like, you will not be, you know, you can just be running the church in, in, in the flesh. And matter of fact, when you are running the church in the flesh, it's full of contention and strife. Because you are not spiritually in touch. So you don't know how to go about the things of God. God is concerned. I saw a young man, a Ghanaian young man. If I see him physically, I will recognize him, but I restore someone that I know. I saw this guy in the revelation of the night. The guy has made a call to Ghana and talking to somebody in Ghana and telling the person that had the man of God given you the revelation about what I'm supposed to do. And this guy is like going crazy in the land of Chicago here. I wake up in the morning. I say, ah, Lord, 
Today is supposed to be the dedication of my child. Look at what you are bringing forth. My spirit was just burdened. And that burden will not be released until the people of God are conscious about the fact that the church must pray. The fact that you are cruising in life does not mean that someone out there is not suffering. The fact, the fact that God has saved you, that you are now swimming in the grace of God, you have to know that somebody out there, you used to be there, but God brought you. You have to extend the same grace towards them. Pray for them so that the Lord will also bring them. Jeremiah said, I didn't know that this is what has been planned concerning my life. And the Lord brought it to my attention. And now, when I came to find out, I saw that they have devised devices against my life. I saw that they have devised devices against my life. Saying what? In Jeremiah eleven nineteen, he said they have devised devices against my life saying, let us destroy the tree with the fruit thereof. And let us cut, cut, cut him off from the land of the living. And his name may be no more remembered. God came to him. He said, the people of Anatot, they are looking for your life. The Lord brought forth the insight of the whole story and showed Jeremiah. Jeremiah, look at your state. Jeremiah, you are sitting down. You are eating. Look at what is coming to happen to you. My dear brother, you are sitting down in Chicago cruising. Look at what is being planned over your life. My dear sister, you think that you have gotten it all. But look at in the realm of the spirit what the enemy is planning against you. And Jeremiah looked at it and opened his ears and he heard that they say, let us cut the tree off. Let us cut the branches. He said, the fruit thereof. And let us also, you know, make sure that his name is not remembered anymore. So in other words, not only they are terminating you, which is the tree, they are coming also after your children. These are the fruits. And not just that. They said, we want to go to one level, another level. And that other level is that we want to make sure that it does not stop on your children. Because that your name shall not be remembered. Your name shall not be remembered. Your children must not bear your name. Your children's children must not bear your name. So the evil has set the path. The devices that are planned against your life is that none of your family will ever survive what we are going to put in place. So if that is okay with you, continue cruising in life. We said we are talking about the principles of canceling the expectation of the wicked. So Jeremiah now having this information, what must I do now? This is the principle. Jeremiah eleven twenty. he went before the Lord and he said, O Lord of hosts, that judges righteously, that triest the rain and the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them. For unto thee have I revealed my cause. You see, for unto thee have I revealed my cause. The principle is this. God that brought you the knowledge about what is about to happen to you. Now that you have had that dream, you wake up and you are telling people, Oh, honey, uh, yesterday this is the dream that I have. And you will not do anything about the dream. You will go about your daily business. But this is the reality of the living God. That the Lord sealed instruction unto his children in the middle of their sleep. So that they will go his way. So Jeremiah said, no, 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 no. I am going before the Lord and, and revealed my cause. The same God that revealed the situation to me. Jeremiah said, I'm going back to him. I'm going back to him. This is not the time to be worried. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. He said, in such a situation, be careful for nothing, but in all things, with what? Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. You go and let your request made known to God. Letting your request made, be made known to God. That is, I have come to reveal my cause to you, God. The Lord brought you the knowledge. 
The knowledge must go back to God in prayer. In prayer. In prayer. Jeremiah went in prayer and said, Lord, avenge them that are after my life. Avenge them that are after my life. From the time of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God is suffering violence. And it's only the violence that will take it by force. You want to take your life and remain living unto the purpose of God. You better stand and be violent. You better stand and be violent. Christianity is not a fun fair. Christianity is not a cruising land. Church is not meant for us to come on Sunday and just be dancing on wonderful songs and then be going. You say everything about you is being recorded. The life that you are living from home. Matter of fact, the church is even starting from home before you come here. You cannot come and stand here and be thinking that all, all is well when you, have, you are not in touch with the spiritual world. A matter of fact, your service unto God is, is really questionable. You know why? It is because in John you know, 4.24, he said that God is a spirit. And they that worship him, they must worship him in spirit and in truth. How can you receive from heaven when you are totally disconnected from heaven? 1 Corinthians 2.10, he said that the things, matter of fact, from 9, he talks about, I have not seen, ye have not heard, neither have it entered to the heart of man, the things that God had prepared for them that love him. But God had revealed these things to us by his spirit, the Holy Spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, the, yea, the deep things of God. A man cannot serve God in carnality, in flesh, and be thinking that everything is well. You must get in touch with, with the spiritual world. You have to exercise your spirit man to be able to know what is going on in the realm of the spirit. You yourself saw a woman coming to stand here today and testifying of how she was dead in Cook County and the Lord brought her back to life. Do you know what happened? Let me tell you what happened. This woman that we have been praying with for years, we will go pick her up from south side, come and lock ourselves in the prayer room and we keep praying. One Sunday after church, I went home relaxing. I saw the woman in a, in a vision. And this woman came out of her car in front of my store, computer store, just right there. And the woman could barely walk. And I just, the vision was taken out. I said, oh my goodness, this is Sister Iwama. This is the plan of the enemy against her life. So, interestingly, the following day, Monday morning, as soon as I get to work, this woman came exactly as I saw her in a dream parked her car in front of the store. By this time, she was fit and well and walked into the store with two more people with her. I pulled her aside. I said, Sister Wama, uh, we have to pray hard because the enemy has packaged something against your life. The woman went home. The same day, the night, she said she was not feeling well. The next thing we know, she ended up in uh, Cook County Hospital. It happens that the nurse that was taking care of her that night was an, our own sister Grace that is also in the prayer, prayer team. You better make sure that you join prayer groups so that you can start praying. You don't know who is going to save you out there. The woman recognized her and said, my goodness, just that woman, what are you doing here? She said, please, when you go home, when you are done and go home, call Pastor Charles. Tell him that what he told me today had come to pass that he should let the church know and the church to pray for me. We came, we started praying and praying and you do know what happened. By the time that Sister Grace was discharged to come home, another nurse took over. In the session of the other nurse, this woman, in her strugglings, whatever that it was, suddenly she died. She died in the hospital over there. Calling, cold, blue, coming. So, but they are trying to Come and take her after the paperwork. Take her to the mortuary. They come back. Now they are ready. Open the door. They come to find out that this woman is sitting on the bed. Hey, what is happening here? So when she came and stood here and said that I was dead and God brought me back. You know, most of us, <laughs> I know what truly took place. But most of us do not have understanding of what God did. 
You see, Jeremiah said, I was going to be killed and I did not know this. When she was, she was fit and well. But the reality, the reality of her life was the spiritual reality which was revealed. Do you know why? When she started stating that, oh, uh, I was in the wheelchair and I was in the walker and I was in this. It is because exactly as we saw that she could not walk. I mean, walk, the woman was completely paralyzed. They put her in the wheelchair. The church said, okay, the wheelchair will not stop us. We will send the church van. The church van will go and pick this woman up and down every time. Prayer must go forth. She stood out of the wheelchair. They gave her the workers on the side. He said, we will still go. We will go and pick. You know, she has been praying faithfully, praying, stating her cause before the Lord. Look at her today. She stood here. She gave the testimony unto God's glory. Our God is a powerful God, though. He said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God. Avenge my enemies, O oh Lord. They that are after my life. If you'll be sitting down here in Chicago, in America, and be eating one dollar chicken, they will kill you. No prayer life. You go, come back, you sleep. They will kill you. So, when he finished his prayer, then in Jeremiah 11, verse 22 to 23, listen to this. He said, therefore, that says the Lord of hosts. Remember, he called on the Lord of hosts. And the Lord of hosts answered Jeremiah. God said, behold, I will punish them. They said they will kill Jeremiah. God said, I will punish them. I will punish them. What is the punishment that I'm going to bring upon them? Remember what they said. They said that they're going to cut off the tree which is Jeremiah himself, the fruit thereof, his children. Matter of fact, his generations to come, let me eliminate all of them, that Jeremiah's descendants will never be called, ever. His name will not be remembered. As simple as this. God said, because of what they have said that they are going to do to you, that your name shall not be remembered in the land of the living. Watch, this is what I'm going to do. God said, I am going to punish them. The young men, in other words, their young men shall die by sword. Their sons and daughters shall die by famine. And there shall be no more remnant of them. You see that? They said, Jeremiah, there won't be any seed of you. God said, I am coming after you. I will kill your, your young ones. I will kill your sons. I will kill your daughters. And not just that, I'm going to eliminate your nation. You said you would terminate my lineage. God said, I will terminate your nation. You come after the apple in all of my eye. I go after you. I go after your mother, your father, your sister, your everything. And matter of fact, I don't stop there. I go to your village, I will finish them. I come to your cities, I will finish them. I come to your country, I will finish the country. He said the remnant of them, that is the nation, the nation. He said, because I will bring evil upon the men of Anatot, even the year of their visitation, God is going to visit them with evil. So, this is the principle. And you know what Isaiah said? Isaiah said, in Isaiah 54 verse 17, I'm stopping just right here. Isaiah made a statement, knowing the power that had been made available to entertain in your life. Sin is not something. If you are shaking the hand with the devil, how can you come and say that you are going to, you, you know, break the devil? You can't break the devil when you are fellowshipping with the devil. He said, if the kingdom is divided against itself, it shall not stand. So there is no way that you can be in the kingdom of darkness and thinking, working against darkness. No way. You want to have power over darkness, you have to be in the light. You want to know what is happening in, the, you know, in darkness so that you can overcome it. It is brought to the light. It is brought to the light. So let us have the clear understanding of what the Lord God is doing and how the kingdom of God works. Before it comes, our God is more than willing to show it to you. And when the Lord has revealed it to you, it is your responsibility to come back to God and say, Lord, this is the plan that they have against my life. The Lord will stand, fight them. The, the battle is not yours. It's God. He knows where they have been. You know, so I said something. I said, 
It's a waste for a child of God to start thinking and running after his enemies. For what? Why would you do that? I don't have time for you. As a matter of fact, God, Jesus even said, pray for your enemies. He pitied them. But what must a child of God do? A child of God must concentrate on God. Do the right thing. What is the right thing? The kingdom principles. It is revealed your responsibility. Go back and talk to your God and let God deal with them. God knows where they are coming from. God knows where they plan. You didn't know. The Lord came to you and told you that this is the plan that they have against your life. So when you stand there and say, Holy Ghost, fire, who told you that they are there? They are not there. It's not time for them yet. You see that? So, but God knows when to target them and come and perform and fight your battle unto his glory. He said, no weapon. No weapon. Fashion against you shall ever prosper. To God alone be the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Blessed the name of the Lord for his goodness and mercies upon our lives to bring us all together unto his glory. We have a word from the Lord today that we titled, Walk by Faith, Not by Sight. Walk by Faith, Not by Sight. Thank you, Lord. We give you the glory and honor for your special grace to usher forth your word into the heart of your people. Holy Spirit of the Lord, speak to us. Let us fulfill that it is written concerning our lives and at the end of it all, glory and honor that shall come out of this word be returned to the Father alone. In Jesus' name we pray, let's say amen. Amen. Walk by faith, not by sight. The book of Colossians, the book of Colossians, Colossians 1, verse 16 to 17. Colossians 1, 16 to 17. A fact that all of us should know is this. It says, For by Jesus Christ were all things created. For by Jesus Christ were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created by jesus and for jesus hallelujah and he is before all things and by him all things consist to God alone be the glory thank you father you want to make sure that the projection I think he's having difficulties over there concerning the scriptures they are not rightly projected so check with him thank you Lord by Jesus Christ were all things created the things that were created in heaven and things created on earth and he said in creation there are two things there are things created meant to be seen that is the visible aspect of those things and there are things created that are not going to be seen not by the same eyes which sees the first one so this is very important very very important because if you are thinking that what you see that's what it is then you'll be wrong because the lord says that creation has at least two things one that can be seen with the regular eyes and another one that might not be seen at all so we cannot take what we see for it or for granted absolutely not i said it's a very important scripture because most of the things that so many are afraid of the lord is talking about thrones dominions principalities powers 
He says, he is the one who created them all. What people are running away from, what the enemy is using to chasten people's life, the Lord God says, he is the one behind all of it. Amen? This is very important. Very, very important. Because if I serve a God, that I know that he is the source of all creation, anything that I will come across, it is the handwork of my God. Therefore, my attitude is not going to be the same. Walk by faith and not by sight. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, this is more like a message of awareness. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and the verse is 3. The word tells us, he said, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. This is truly talking about what we can see and what we cannot see. We walk in the flesh and we know that when we are, we are walking in the flesh, we are not fighting anybody. We don't wage any physical fight against anybody. But the Bible says that that is the physical aspect of it. The reality behind it is that if another eyes will be opened up unto you, or another world will be opened up for another eyes to be given to see in that world, you are definitely going to know that your walk is a war. Hallelujah. Your walk is what is a war. This is very dangerous because what we see physically had become what we live and what lead us in life. But for God, that is not the case. Almighty God never said that we should take the physical aspect or the flesh aspect of our lives for it. Matter of fact, he said, don't even trust that one. Put your trust in the physical, I mean, in the spiritual aspect of the life that you are living. What you cannot see, that is what you have to hold on unto his glory. Amen. So clearly stated here is 2 Corinthians 5, 7. That is the title of the message. He said, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. For man, sight is everything. What we see, that, that is what we can trust. What we see, that is where we can possibly go. But God says, what you can see in the flesh, you walk in the flesh, but you cannot trust the flesh. Because there is a war behind the, the flesh, which one must see. So God is calling his children not to live their lives after the flesh, but to live their lives after the spirit. Man is three in one. He's a spirit being. He has a soul and he lives in the body. The body is what we are very sensitive to because that is how we have our senses and we are okay with that. But when it comes to spiritual aspect of our lives, it is very difficult for man to come to himself. So faith that God commands us to live with becomes extremely very important. Extremely important to get hold and understand what faith is all about, about because we come to find out that this faith that the Lord wants us to walk in is the life that God has called us to live, basically. Amen? Very important. The word faith has been prostituted in the Christendom, but for God unto his children, that is the essence of life. That is the essence of life. And God defined, he defined faith in this way. Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. So now, 
how can something that is evident and it is not seen you see the lord is still defining what faith is all about for a child of god that must not walk by the sight but must walk by faith 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 world has to be tangible has to become evidence for a child of god to walk in so god wants us to have an a spiritual eyes to be open to a world that is not physically visible amen but he wants you to see it beyond tangibility he wants you to see it beyond the physic that your physical eyes can actually see and then walk in that environment hallelujah we are spirit being and god wants us to walk in the spiritual realm god wants us to live our physical life in the spirit form let me put it that way very important it is not it is not seen but it is evidence it is not seen but it is an evidence so faith which is the spiritual world let me put it that way faith is spiritual world faith is spirit faith is spirit and man is spirit so man has what it takes to interact with the spiritual world even though man is living in a physical body and seeing everything around him god is reminding us that we are of his nature that god himself is a spirit that we that are worshiping him we have to worship him in spirit and in truth so is the lord requiring of us to live our lives seeing the spiritual realm as physic as much as the physical realm is really physic to us or really tangible to us or really known to us that we we have to come to really live our live our lives and knowing that the spiritual world is the reality this is it it took me a little time to <laughs> basically that's 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 what it is god wants us to live our lives in the physical realm here as we are in the flesh but the hidden man of a man the hidden person of a man is a spirit being and the lord said that i want to see you living your life coming out as the spirit being and interact in the spiritual world which is your rea reality which is man's reality and so these scriptures are very short 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 scriptures but very powerful very very powerful and very tangible reality of a man anyone that is disconnected from this principle that the lord is saying here you are completely disconnected of life dead living you don't see it physically but it is there it takes another eye to see in that environment that is what faith is all about and we worship god that way we, we worship a god that we don't see we don't see him physically but we see him spiritually so the lord said if you want to be alive be conscious about the spiritual world how do we come to be aware of faith how do we come to be aware of the spiritual world watch romans 10 17 it says romans 10 17 said so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of christ what is your understanding of this scripture here it says that in order for the spiritual world or spiritual environment to be reality to you it is at the result of your interaction with the word of god that's what it is hallelujah if you want to be active in the spiritual world you have to be acquainted with the word of god because it is the word of god that 
opens you up unto that world. Very important. And this is not, this one here is the word of God. It fails not. You can try it and you will see that it will work. Give yourself three, just three days. Three days, just start reading the Bible. Focus on what you are reading. If something will not happen to you, come and tell me here. Pastor Charles, I did that and nothing happened to me. Start filling yourself with the word of God continuously. Not just little here and then you go do your stuff. And, no, but, you know, seriously interacting with the word and allow the word to sink in you. Within just three days, I am giving you only three days. If the spiritual world will not be opened up unto you, come and say that God's word is a lie. People will have move around. They said, oh, I am a... I, 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 I dream and I can't remember my dream. Some, they say, I don't even dream at all. Do you know where I start them from? I start them from the word of God. I start them from the word of God. Because I know that this verse, the Bible that you are reading is not a book. It's not a novel. It's not just an ordinary book. It's a spiritual book. And the words that are written in there, these words are spirit. So there is no way that you will interact with this spiritual book that something is not going to happen to you. Definitely. And I have seen it working over and over and over and over. Without doing anything, you tell the person, I need you to start interacting with the word of God. Start reading. What the enemy is robbing him and stealing him from is going to be an evidence unto him. That's how it works. Because the person is tr truly disconnected from the spiritual world. You know, dreams are spirits. Spiritual world. Dreams are the things that are happening in the other side of the physical aspect of it. He said, the Lord comes and seals instruction when we are sleeping. Deep sleep falleth on man. And God comes and seals instruction. So, when you are dreaming and you are seeing yourself in such a great danger, or maybe the enemy had come after your life and you are even killed right there in the dream, you wake up in the morning and realize that you are not dead. You are not dead, you are still alive. And you say, thank you, Lord, because this one, I thought I was finished. The reality of it, is that it is not Satan that came and showed you that dream. It is your God. Satan has no business to come. He's a deceiver and he's a thief. He has no business. And a matter of fact, he's after your life. So he has no business to come and tell you what he's about to do. I know he's st stupid, but not that far. He will not come and tell you what he's about to do. So... The program of the devil against your life, it is through the word of God that God will come to you and start showing you what is about to happen. Hallelujah. What is about to happen. Let me move on. So, in the book of Hebrews, we are still trying to understand. In the book of Hebrews 11, and the verse is 3, a scripture that I'm talking about it all the time. It says, Hebrews 3, I mean, Hebrews 11, 3. It says, through faith. In other words, through spiritual world. Through spiritual world. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Can you see that? So nothing do exist without the word. Jesus through him is the source of all creation. Thrones and dominions, powers, principalities, you name it. That is the first scripture that we read in Colossians 1, 16 and 17. Whether be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him. And without him was not anything created that was created. And in him all things also consist. He is behind the creation of all things. So the Lord is saying that the word of God is the source of creation. 
So when the word is telling you here that through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. The word of God is the essence of all existence. The word of God is the source of all existence. So framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Listen to this. This is there is nowhere in the Bible that you will find such revelation. Let me tell you, it is just right here. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. God said that Jesus, through him, he created things that are in heaven and things that are in earth, visible and invisible visible and invisible and this scripture is telling you right here that it is through the word of god that you will come to know what do you know or what is existing and behind that word it will also take you to the behind of whatever that is existing so when we say you know live by faith and not by sight the reality is that if you come to know the spiritual aspect of the situation then you have a reality if you will only take what you see in the flesh in the physic as the finality of that thing you will be deceived you will be deceived so we can never through this scripture here we can never take anything of the physic as a reality. I don't know you unless the Lord reveals you to me. I do not know the situation unless God takes me to show me the behind of the situation. I cannot take anything that is coming on my way physically, whatever that it is, good or bad, as it. It is only when the Lord will reveal the spiritual aspect of that thing to me that is when I will take it as a reality. Very important. So many have been deceived because they don't understand this principle. They say, oh, the man is very good. He is good physically, but behind the physique. Do you know that man? They said, oh, she's my wife. Hey, well, that's a wonderful woman. She is very, very much your wife physically. But do you know who you have married? So this is what the whole situation is all about. You are going through a situation that it looks like everything is working against you. Physically, you are being tormented, you are being harassed, you are being disappointed, disappointment and everything else. But have you go and talk to your God for the Lord to show you the outcome of what you are going through. Have you gone and talked to your maker? Lord, what is it that I am going through? What am I going through right now? What, what, what is your intention? What is your purpose? What is this thing that I, I am going through? Unless the Lord starts revealing the situation behind your struggles you will not know the reality because it is a reality the spiritual reality that is going to help you to stand praying the right prayer the right prayer the right prayer it is the word that is the source of that situation the word that is the word of god is the source of that situation so it will take the word back to god for the lord god to reveal the hidden things of the creation this is how we stand against the face of the devil and say devil I know you I know you I know the source of your strength and you have no power over me because I know who I am this is it through faith we understand that the world you know I love he didn't say the world because you might just be thinking he said the worlds so the worlds 
It could be physical world as spiritual world. He said the worlds were framed by the word of God. Is it not what he said? He said things created in heaven that we see as a spiritual place and things created on earth, visible and invisible. Man is very much connected to the visibility or the visible aspect of our lives. But the invisible, the faith aspect of it, we neglect it. And that is where our problems are coming from. God says that start connecting yourself to the spiritual world. Start interacting and start living as a spirit being. Then your reality physics would definitely change unto God's glory. Say amen to that. We are giving you the solution to come out of all problems that you are going through. The Lord God is telling you that there is nothing else behind these two worlds. And he is the source of that creation. That's how he made it. The one who made it know what he did. Who did it is telling you this is how it works. Come in line with my requirements and no power of darkness. He said he created thrones, dominions, principalities, rulers of darkness. I am telling you the things that are pursuing people's life and people are running away from. These are the things that God said, it is my word that brought this thing to existence. This is it. This is where the power is truly coming from. Amen. You have a problem with them and they tell you, you wait and you will see. Then they walk out. He didn't point a gun, a gun in your head. He did not slap you. He didn't do anything. He said, you wait and you will see. Simply telling you that it is not, we are not done. You might be having mastery in right now. But he said, wait, because there is another place where we can take this battle also to. This spiritual reality that people are not aware of, this is what they are falling victims of. Victims. The one that the spirit is over the physic. The one that the spirit is over the physic, over the flesh. That is why the Lord said, I walk by your nature. Walk by your nature. To God alone be the glory. Thank you, my Lord. So, as a child of God, as a child of God, the calling of the Lord upon your life must be sensitive to this spiritual world so that you will come out doing what God has called you to do, living the life that the Lord God had called you to live. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, let me give you an example, even in the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament, to tell you that this is <laughs> without dispensation. It's a principle that is all times. Second Kings, Second Kings, chapter 6, and the verses 16 to 20. The army came after the life of a man of God called Elisha. The Syrian army. They wanted to capture him because every time that they are about to bring forth some kind of craftiness against Israel, this prophet of God would just tell the king of Israel, this is what is to come. Because he was a spirit man. He was a spiritual man. So he was always interacting with the spiritual world and the Lord is showing him, said, hey, this is it. This is what they are planning. The Lord will even take you to this situation. The Lord will take you to the situation, yet you are on your bed. They that are spiritually disconnected and living a, a, a physical life, their lives are restless because they want to know. So they have to go from one place to another consulting whatever that they can consult. But the child of God, the Lord said, if you have this spiritual reality in you, then that what you want to know shall be brought unto you. They are looking for Elisha. And you know what? Elisha <laughs> is telling their business so they want to capture him and uh, 
Gehazi being his servant was so much afraid when the Assyrian army came after the life of Elisha. And <laughs> he came and Gehazi, uh, Master Elisha, these people have come, we are finished. He said, fear not. Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Hallelujah. In order for somebody to talk like that, it means that the person is seeing something else. In order for somebody to talk that <laughs> two people are standing, they are looking into the same situation. One is seeing a great army that have come after their lives. Another one is seeing, yes, a great army, and behind that great army, another greater army. He said that they that are with us, they are way many greater than the ones that you are seeing that are running away, that you, you want to run away. So fear not. Fear not. Now, this is, this is also telling you the difference between people. They that can see physically and they that can see physically and spiritually. Uh -huh. And God gave us both. But we are not always operating with both. So, then <laughs> Elisha prayed and said, God, I pray thee, open the eyes of Gehazi that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Hallelujah. You know what it means? It means that the situation that you are going through that you think that it is over, that your life is just, they are finishing you. They are crushing you, terminating you. May you pray that may the Lord open your eyes to see what is behind. May the Lord open your eyes to see the Lord's provisions. This is it. We go through situations, we are seeing the physical aspect of it, and we say that this is it, it's over. It is not over until the Lord says so that it is over. And the Lord saying that it is over, it is not by words or just by physical display. It is by the spiritual givings. 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 And we have been living our lives that way. We have been living our lives that way. Hey, the enemy is coming. Let's run, let's run. I say, hey, don't go anywhere. Stay here. Because God has not said that we should go. Pastor Charles, what are you saying? Every indication points to that we have to move. Let's go. I said, no. God who brought me here didn't say I should leave. He didn't say I should leave. He brought me here. By the time that he wants me to go, he will tell me that it is time to go. He did this before. Why wouldn't I trust him now? This is it. When it is God's time, you will know that your spiritual world becomes your reality. Your physical reality. So we don't take what is happening physically, what we are going through physically, as the eight of the situation behind it. Yes, you are going through trouble. Yet, the, I mean, yes, the army is just right there surrounding them. But has the Lord opened your eyes to see the chariots of fire and the horses that are surrounding this army? This is it. This is it. This is it. So, the fear not becomes very important here. If I serve the living God and true God, the creator of our Lord, I mean the creator of heaven and earth, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, if he is my God, then I am secured. Because everything bows before him. Everything bows before him. He is the source of it. There is nothing that cannot say I, am, I will not obey God. Every one of his creation obeys him. Even when you say no, I don't obey you. It's because he wants you to say no, I don't obey you. 
This is it. The Lord is. It's just a matter of time. Connect to the spiritual aspect of the situation and see what the Lord has in store for your life. If it was Gehazi alone, ha, that man would have been taken off and leave the prophet behind. Hallelujah. And I thank God that he prayed for his eyes to be opened. Because if Elisha did not pray to God for Gehazi's eyes to be open, <laughs> we have told him, he said, hey, I know, Pastor Charles, <laughs> you are a man of God. I thank you for your God, but <laughs> not this situation. Not this situation. Hallelujah. So, there is a statement in Ephesians that Paul made. Ephesians 1, 17 to 19. Ephesians 1, 17 to 19. It says that the God is a form of prayer. He said the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ. Remember what we are talking about right now we are talking about walk in faith and not by sight. And when it comes to our calling, how, do we, how are we supposed to interact and be pleasing in the sight of God by fulfilling that which God called us to live here? This is it. So he prayed that prayer that in order for you to be successful in your calling, pray to God. That he may fill you with the spirit of wisdom and revelation of Christ. Revelation of the knowledge. Or revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Important element. Verse 18. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. The eyes of what? Of your understanding being enlightened. That is that this, this is the eyes that we are talking about as of today. Not the physical eyes. The physical eyes we said we cannot trust that one. But the eyes of the understanding to come to a point to know that your reality is not a physical reality, but it's a spiritual reality. If you do understand this, everything that will show up physically, you will overcome it. You will overcome it. You will. You will overcome it. This is a very powerful prayer. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling? What is the hope of God's calling upon your life? And what is the riches of, of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? The riches of the glory of his inheritance in you. The riches, the inheritance, that which God had planned for you to get. Including what you are going through right now. If only you can get to the spiritual world, you will see where the Lord is going with you. This is it. The eyes of your understanding may be enlightened that you may know the hope of your calling and the riches of glory in his inheritance and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, to us who believed according to the working of his mighty power. You see this one here, let us not go too fast. It is, it is, it's not enough for you to see. It is also important for you to accept that the one who showed you is capable to overcome it. Hallelujah. Let me read that scripture again. In your calling, that your, the, the, the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, 19, for you to know the exceeding greatness of God's power. To S word, who believed? You, a child of God, who believed? The exceeding greatness of God's power in your life, according to the working of his mighty power. God who revealed, he is also able to redeem. Amen. The Lord who took you into that situation and gave you a knowledge of what they are planning against you. When you will stand and pray unto that God, God is able to turn that situation around. He is. That is the mighty power. So it's not like, uh, yeah, we said it. 
Remember where we are coming from. He is the source of all creation. Nobody can stand in the face of God and be boasting of say, that is what the enemy is always doing. They come after your life and they let you believe that they can nobody can save you. Nobody that God Himself cannot save you. That your life is over. That is the lie of the devil. It is the lie of the devil. It is because you are not aware of the spiritual eyes that must be open to see the situation that is behind his boast. The moment that you come to be aware of it, the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I know who I am as a child of God. I stand in your face and I come against you. I come against your strength. I come against your hold. I come against any force that you are displaying before me. In the name of Jesus This is how we overcome the works of the devil. This is how. We are not afraid of them. But you will be afraid if you are spiritually disconnected. Because you, can, you cannot see the reality of what is running after your life. They will pity you. Haven't you seen them in deliverance? In deliverance, they always speak that boasting and say, Hey, who are you to come? And I have been there 500 years. I am the saying speaking blasphemy 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 and then in the session in the course of the session of deliverance why are you why are you tormenting me why are you tormenting me? hey everything is changing the lord reigns he reigns he reigns hallelujah thank you my lord for what purpose that the Lord wants to see his calling upon your life working in that dimension. Watch. Why would God open your eyes? For what? Why would God open your eyes for you to be seeing these spiritual things and you just, you will not be doing anything. You just see them and you come, you sleep and why would God do that? It's not beneficial unto you. Let me tell you one thing that the Lord did and we are all going through this. Human beings our physical eyes can only see physical things. It would take God, as Apostle Paul prayed that prayer, to open the eyes of your understanding, to understand the spiritual world. Elisha prayed that prayer for Gehazi. Lord, open his spiritual eyes that he may see in the spiritual realm. So, as far as we human beings are concerned, Every time that we see the physical situation, we say, that, oh, this is how it is. And all. But the Lord said, that's not how it is. That's not how it is. If you really want to know the how it is, get into the spiritual realm. Once you have it, God open your eyes to see that the Lord wants you to do something about it. Isaiah 42 and the verses 6 to 9. Isaiah 42, verse 6 to 9. It says, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. I, the Lord, I have called thee in righteousness. And I will hold thy hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. Hallelujah. Listen to this. This is very powerful. Why God must open your spiritual eyes? For what? Why my, you know, must you see the spiritual world? What for? The Lord said, he himself that showed you or that took you into that spiritual situation for you to know what is going on. It's because now he's going to enter into an agreement with you between the situation. It could be you or it could be family members. It could be just your work situation, your husband, your children and all that. I, the Lord who took you and show you this. I am going to work with you. I am going to work with you. In what sense? He said, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. God is not showing you that you are spiritually in bondage according to the situation that you are going through physically. That now that you know, God showed it to you. That you know that your life is caged spiritually. This is the reason why things are not moving forward physically. 
and you just wake up from that dream and you start crying oh lord my i am finished i am finished my enemies have gotten me oh the witches of my family and to be pitying yourself and crying over your situation over and over god said that is not the purpose of me opening your eyes he said the purpose of me showing you the spiritual things behind your situation it is because i want you to come out i want you to come out of that situation by what to bring out the prisoners from the prison the children your own children that you are seeing that the enemy has them captured the lord wants you to bring that this this kid out of captivity he wants you to stand and start calling upon his name for his mighty power to be at work so that they are out of captivity bring them out let the prisoners come out from their prisons let them that sit in darkness come out from their prison houses it doesn't stop here and then he said because i am the lord that is my name this is powerful god he tells you he said that you know i, I i'm showing you this if only you will act in accordance to my agreement with you i the lord i will turn the situation around the promise of the lord god does not speak according to god speaks in his power he speaks in his mighty power what the lord says he is capable to do it he's not a man he cannot lie what he says that's what he does so if god says i'm taking you there don't be afraid you do in agreement stand and pray i am the lord that is my name and my glory will i not give to another neither my praise to graven images neither my praise to graven images you know what it means it means that i the lord who created you and set a life of a glorious life for your life i will not allow the devil to destroy you and be rejoicing in his destruction upon your life that's what it means when we say god is good that God is love and all that. It is true. He is good and loving God in his deeds. In his deeds. God is not saying that I am the Lord to be boasting that I am saying that I, with my, my, I share not my praise with no one. Not to be saying, to be saying that to be boasting of himself. You are the praise of almighty God. Hallelujah. You are the glory of almighty God. So every time that God is seeing the devil reigning over your life, the Lord sit there and said that, no way, this is my child. This is not the plan that I have for my child. And the Lord will come around, start showing you the behind scene of what you are going through. And if the child of God will stand and say, Lord, I want to give you praise and glory for what you have shown me therefore any power standing against my life any satanic orchestration any cage upon my children break in the name of jesus and fires are descending fire descend that's how it works so i share not my glory with another god wants to see you coming out in glorious way he wants to see you that your life is bringing glory to him some people are moving around oh if god is there why are all these uh, children in africa uh, 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 you know hunger killing them if god is there why are all these shootings and killing all this hey let me tell you shut up your mouth shut up you don't know you don't understand the spiritual spiritual things you yourself is not even spiritual you can't speak blasphemy against god This is the reason why I'm always telling, no matter what the situation, I'm always saying it is well. You be at the dean, everything is calm. When there is torment all around, I'm, I said it is well. Because I know that it is definitely well. Nobody ever come before the Lord that your situation is going to be the same. Unless you have not come to the true God. You have, unless you have not come to the true God. Because the presence of his light alone the presence of his light alone will deliver you from any situation. I tell people, I said, oh, I'm going through this. I'm going through that. I said, come, let's pray. Come, let's pray. 
Ah, Pastor Charles, and your prayers at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning. You are not serious about what you are going through. Let the devil take you more through. And the Lord said, in the verse 9 of the same Isaiah 42, he said, my child, remember, remember where I took you from and how much I have been with you all along. He said, behold, the former things are come to pass. The former things, they have come to pass. God who did it before, God who made it possible and opened that door, for you to be in wherever that you are, that today you are so much in complaints. The same God tells you, remember where you are coming from. I am the source of it. And new things, he said, and new things <coughs> do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Hallelujah. You know, let's read this scripture again. The Lord said, behold, Isaiah 42, 9, behold. The former things are come to pass. You have seen God's glory before. You have seen something, you can point something in your life that you know that God is the source of it. That the Lord is the one who did it. So if you can only have one thing as a testimony for your own life, then the Lord is telling you, I am about to still do new things, I declare unto you. And I am saying them now before they come to pass. You are physically going through situations, but I, the Lord, I am telling you that in the spiritual realm, I have a plan that is beyond what you are going through. You must go through this for me to take you out there. I share not my glory with no one. You will see my glory. People will see you and start speaking of what the Lord has done for you. This is it. This is it. We give you the glory and honor. Thank you, Father. So, let me close right here. This is the reason why a child of God must not take what he's going through as it. What must you do in any situation of the devil's end against your life, against your children, against your marriage, against anything that is not glorifying God? This is what you do. Ezekiel 33 and the verse is 6. Ezekiel 33 verse 6. It says, If the watchman see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any, pre any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I required at the watchman's hand. Hallelujah. Okay, let me read that scripture again. God said, a watchman is the one that watches over. Okay? So you that God came and show you the spiritual situation, I mean the spiritual, yes, the spiritual facts about the physical situation that someone or you yourself is going through. The Lord said, if you will be a prayerful person, I, the Lord, I will come and I will set, you know, I will, I, will, I will show you, I will show you what you're supposed to, to know. In other words, he said, if the sword, remember what it, if the watchman see the sword come, that is evil coming, that is the situation that you are going through, or something that is about to happen. The one that is watching at the tower, God spoke to you. This is what the enemy is about to do. If you have heard it, if God showed it to you, what is your responsibility? He said, if you see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, praying, you don't pray about it. You saw it, God revealed it to you. You don't do anything, you don't pray about it. And the people be not warned and you are not going to, you know, be taking responsibility about the situation. When the Lord wants you to go and warn somebody, hey, please, put this right. Please do this. Please do that as the Lord is doing all the time. He said, if you receive and you are not doing anything about it according to the direction of the Lord, and if that sword come and take any person from among them, 
he is taken away in his iniquity he said you are responsible of that person's death you are responsible of that person's death this is what the lord is saying so don't just uh, be standing around and say that oh i know this was coming and then god showed it to you because he wants you to stand and start doing something about that situation with his great wisdom we live and overcome situations we don't fight a physical battle is it not what is written here he said though we walk in the flesh we do not war after the flesh the lord showed it to you in the spiritual realm and what he wants you to do is to be able to stand and start acting spiritual actions which might trigger or which is going to trigger physical things it is the spiritual action spiritual actions that changes physical situations amen ah, you guys are amen, amen. <laughs> you know you are saying i have taken your time because you didn't give me time to preach the word no you are not ready the time is up hallelujah amen, amen. these things are so important this is what the enemy holds that we children of God, we are not always aware of. May the Lord open your spiritual understanding. That you may come to know these things and bring glory to him. To him alone be the glory. In Jesus' name we worship today. Let's say amen. Amen. God bless you. Everyone is very welcome and we thank God for your lives. We have a word from the living God. For us today that we titled our walk with god our walk with god we have just been talking about how long we have been around and living our lives serving whatever that we serve uh making sure that you are living for the purpose and the plans of almighty god making sure that you serve not anything else but you are serving god through our lord jesus christ so what should be the fruit of, of our, our service to god what should be the fruit of our service to almighty god because if you walk with god you are serving god and what should be the fruit of our service? Romans chapter 6 and the verse is 22 to 23. Apostle Paul wrote, he said, Now being made free from sin and become servant to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Powerful scripture. We're going to break it down so that we will find out who is really a servant of God. How can I live my life and serve God? Am I living a life and telling myself that I'm serving God when I am not? Then something has to be done concerning my thoughts so that I will come in line with the purpose of the living God. So, how do you become a servant of God? How do you become a servant of God? The answer is right here in the scripture that we just read. He said, being made free from sin and become servant to God. So, you become servant to God when you are made free from sin. People are moving around thinking that he said, oh, if only I can... Uh, uh, quit my secular job then i would dedicate my life to serve god i'm a servant of god when i have been you know abandoned everything and just dedicated my life to serve god no it is absolutely wrong according to this scripture when you are free from sin then you can become a servant of the living god and when you are serving this god there has to be fruit coming out of your service what type of fruit that is coming out of your service a fruit unto holiness a fruit unto holiness so if you are 
a servant of God, you will be working to get rid of anything that is not glorifying God. So bringing forth a fruit unto holiness. Your life must become holier and holier. Do not be afraid of the word holy. Do not be afraid of the word holy because from the very beginning it was the nature of man. We fell and Christ had come to give us a second chance. And everyone that would love to embrace Jesus Christ will be free from sin. Holiness is simply living a life free from sin. We are serving God unto the fruitfulness. Fruitfulness unto holiness. And at the end of it, a result, eternal life. Eternal life is where we are going to be with our Lord Jesus Christ and the Father forever. 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 If you are coming to live here on earth, you have to know that your life is in the hand of Almighty God because God put you here. God put you here. So, if God put us here, it's because God has an assignment for our lives. And that assignment for your life should be the purpose of your living. But, you know, the, the most dangerous part of it is that man as the creation of God. We come here, and as man comes to recognize himself, his mind is also being developed onto his own agendas. Man start thinking of what he will do. And I have always been saying, I said, you cannot know what is planned for your life until you have come to know Christ. Outside Jesus, God's plan is not revealed. It is only when you have come in Christ, then the Lord will unfold his plans. You cannot, you cannot be living the purpose of God when you don't know God. You cannot be living the purpose of God when you have not come to know Jesus Christ. It is impossible. It is impossible. Because all things were made by him and through him all things consist. So there is no way that outside him things that bring glory to God will be manifested absolutely not everything is done through jesus christ everything is done through jesus christ everything is done through jesus christ so whatever that you are doing you might be such a successful person we are not talking about your achievements we are talking about salvation have you come to know jesus christ now so that you have a real life this is for someone that have not come to know Jesus yet. What about you that is in the church hearing Sunday after Sunday the word of the living God? You also have to ask your, you know, yourself some questions. Are you truly serving God or you are serving yourself? Are you truly serving Almighty God or you are living for your own plans? What you want to achieve, you look back and we thank God as the year is coming to an end, Many are coming to make different resolutions. But the resolutions, we look onto the things that had happened previously. Or happened, you know, up to this time of our lives. And we said that this year, I went through certain situations. I don't want to see these things happening. This year, I have done certain things. I want to carry these things on a higher level. So, we assess our surroundings and we take things further. So it's a time that one, everyone and each one of us should be thinking of, you know, what is ahead of us in life. The eternal life, a life where we will be with our Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, you see, the verse 23 that we know so much of Romans 6, he says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. What gift is he talking about? He is talking about, you know, that eternal life, which is the gift that is from Almighty God to everyone who will seek to be free from sin. That is the gift. That eternal life is the gift from the Father 
to everyone that will seek to be free from sin. So, to everyone that will seek to serve God. So, as you keep coming and saying that I'm a Christian, a Christian, your lifestyle should speak for you. People should see you and the way you talk, the way you carry yourself, how you do things. Uh, said, ah, this one is a Christian. Because it's a lifestyle. It's not a religion. It's not the fact that you come to Sunday. You know, you come to church on Sunday. When they see you on Monday, nobody knows if you went to church on Sunday or not. Unless you tell them. But your lifestyle, your character, your personality, you yourself, how you live your life, people might see you and recognize you as someone who is different. There is a light in you that attracts people. And as they come around, they would like to find out, where are you getting this joy from? What is it that is, you know, we are all doing the same job. I know we get the same pay and all that. Probably we are living in the same neighborhood. And, but what is it about you that, I, I mean, your home, your children are behaving right. Your husband is not giving you all these hassles. It seems like your wife is behaving. And all. So, so, so what, what, what is your secret? It's an inner life. It's an inner life. They want to know. You tell them, you know, I, I'm a Christian. You are a Christian. Yes, I am a Christian. There is a scripture here. First John chapter 2 and the verse is 6. If you are a Christian, the life that you are living is after the life in Christ Jesus. So, you are a Christian, you walk as Jesus Christ walked. You live your life as Jesus lived his life. Jesus has become the role model for your life, an example of life that everyone that says he's a Christian should be living. So the word says, he that saith he abideth in him, talking about Jesus, of himself also to walk, so to walk even as he walked. Let me read it again. He said, he that saith he abideth in him, of himself also so to walk even as he walked what does this scripture mean this scripture is simply meaning that if you say you are in christ if you say you are a christian then you should walk as jesus walked this is the meaning of the scripture if you say you are a child of god then you should behave as the son of God, Jesus. So by their fruit, we shall know them. By their fruit, we shall just know them. Uh, if you are moving around and you say you are a Christian, you must live as Jesus lived. Anyone who says he's a Christian must walk as Jesus walked. Anyone who talks he is a Christ, he's in Christ, he must walk as Christ walked. Breaking this scripture down, it meaning that you must walk your talk and avoid being hypocrite. I'm going to explain this. You must walk your talk and avoid being hypocrite. If you don't walk what you say, he said, anyone that saith he abided in him must walk as he walked. If you say you are a Christian, you must walk as Jesus walked. What you say, that is what you told people. I'm a Christian. Then your life should demonstrate Christ-like type of life. You must live your talk. What you say is completely inconsistent with your lifestyle. People see you as hypocrite. As hypocrite. You say things, but you are not, you know, the life that comes out of you is different. 
The tongue is saying, but the lifestyle, the deeds, what is inside, it's amazing how, you know, the scripture put it. If you say it, he didn't say that if anyone say, no, he said, if you say it, if you say it, it means that you have come to a point to recognize, you know, there is a scripture here because that will help us to elaborate more on this that are the foundation of Christianity. Matthew chapter 12 and the verse is 34 and 35. He said, Oh, generation of vipers, how can ye be in evil? Speak good things. You see that? There is nothing good that proceeds from the evil. How can you be in evil? Speak good things. The reason is because he said, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. The mouth speaketh. So what is inside you, that is what the mouth is supposed to bring forth. What is inside you, that is what. So if you are saying something, usually that is what is in the heart. But your attitude, your behavior, it's not in line with what you said. And people are watching you. You told them that you are a Christian. You become the Bible that they are reading. At your workplace. Oh, yesterday church was so great. Amazing power of God. And you are boasting of how you spent your Sunday. They said that they were working in their garden. You said you were at church. But right few minutes after, someone have gotten somebody on his nerve and the person the cursing all over and you are joining the same company. You are sharing their thoughts. Uh -huh. Ah, you have given it to him and that is good, that is good. You have become the evil fire behind. But you said you were at church yesterday. You couldn't even give the right counsel. You could not dissociate yourself from the evil talk. You boast of <coughs> Christianity, but there is nothing of Christ-like coming out of you. Hypocrite. Generation of vipers. How can you be in evil? Bring forth any good thing. Let us not deceive ourselves. What you are taking in, we are not talking about the good food that you are eating that is coming out. It is about life experiences, what you are storing within your heart. That is what is coming out. You are a Christian, you come to church. The type of movies that you are even watching in your homes. How crafty the devil is. He can just bring forth very nice and good movie. 45 minutes that you are going to sit before that movie. Out of that 45 minutes, there might be only two minutes of sexual screen or scene. Two minutes. But I can tell you, out of that 45 minutes, the greatest thing that you will remember will be that scene of sex. And it will be there. It will be there in your mind. You will remember that movie, the first act that will come in your mind is how that man was making love, how that woman was making love, that house, that sexual act. So we make sure that whatever that we do is all Christ-like. All Christ-like. All Christ-like. All Christ-like. Very important. So, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak it. Verse 35 of Matthew 12. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringing forth evil things. You can't deceive. You cannot deceive nobody. You are just deceiving yourself. That is why I keep saying, I said, make sure that you don't become victim of somebody's craftiness. 
We have people that are moving around here deceiving themselves and they have made room for the enemy to use them mightily. They will come around you and your home will be broke. The home will be broken, completely broken because all that they do is the evil seed that they sow. They will come around you and your day will be messed up. Because what is inside is all evil. So their deeds will not deceive what has been stored. But the mouth, the mouth, the mouth can deceive. The person might be telling lies. But the behavior tells you exactly who that person is. This is what we are talking about here. So as we walk with our God, we make sure that you cannot deceive God. You can mock God. So the only one that can be deceived in this whole situation is yourself. That is why I keep saying that you make sure that no one deceives you. Don't be victim to their craftiness. The evil that has been moving around and going from home to home. And you open your door for him to come in. Do you think that by the time you are crying, the evil is crying for you? Absolutely not. By the time that your home is destroyed, that you are crying. The one that came around and destroyed it is laughing. His mission was very successful. And taking joy out of it. But because you didn't have the understanding, you opened your door. You thought that, oh, that was a Christian sister. What Christian sister are you talking about? A Christian sister that has not given the right counsel when, uh, you, you know, another sister is going through situations in her marriage. What type of Christian sister? Please, a uh, generation of vipers. Let us not be deceiving ourselves. Coming to the point that you have to guide your tongue as a Christian so that you can serve God with this tongue. Do you know that it's with this tongue that we are also serving God? We bless the name of God and we are also cursing people with the same tongue. A Christian is someone that lives Christ-like type of life. It's amazing. Someone asked me this question. Say, how can God who created Adam and Eve very superior beings man was not made like any other creature in the surface or in the creation of god in genesis 1 20 says he said the lord god said let us make man in our own image and in our likeness man is the only creation of god who has the image and the likeness of god and god has a will so man is the only creation of God that God gave a will. Have dominion over the fishes of the sea, over the fowls of the air, over the cattle, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Dominion over all the earth was given to man. So you tell me, who has dominion over man to come and deceive man? Nobody. Nobody. Yes, Angels were created superior to man. But the angel that came to the garden was a fallen angel, Satan. Man had absolute dominion over every creation of God. But what is very unfortunate, one day we're going to have to talk about the details of the fall itself. Did God said, craftiness of the devil coming in to deceive and man was to embrace what pains me that much was that it seems like you know satan came to the woman and when you read the scripture you will be thinking that uh, 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 adam was not there in genesis 3 one down which you read the story you come to find out that in verse 6 adam was just right there Eve deceived, pick up the fruit, ate it, and gave some to the husband. It never said that the husband has gone to work on the other side of the garden, and when he came back, Eve gave him. He said that she ate it and gave some to the husband. Everything that devil was saying at that time, Adam was just right there. A Christian woman is a woman 
that is said in Proverbs 14 1. He said that a wise, he said, every wise woman builded her house, and the foolish one plugged it down with her hands. You have to know how to keep your home. A Christian, you have to know how to keep your home. How to keep your home. Adam was a man <laughs> that did not have any power in that house. Adam couldn't say a word when Satan came directly to disrespect him. You move into somebody's home, husband and wife, and you went and talked to the wife. What is wrong with you? And the woman didn't have that wisdom to say, you know what, Satan, please go to my husband. She wasn't. She wasn't. It is your responsibility. You are not to make the decisions as a woman in that house. A godly woman is someone who has respect and built her house. Isn't that amazing that the house is built by the woman, not by the man, by the woman. The house is built by the woman. And you have to have a godly woman for a house to be built. Every wise woman built at her house. A man is the head of the family. I understand that. We are, you know, by tendency, children in the house, they have the tendency to run to their mothers all the time. When the child has done something wrong and the father will say something, you are not, as a woman, to run around and be, you know, demonstrating that you, the man is wrong towards the child. Even if your husband is wrong, there is a way to come around the whole issue later on. But you never dare demonstrate before the child that your husband is wrong. Never. Never. They come to you as a woman, send them to your husband. And as a husband, with the submission to one another, does not mean that the woman has become dormant. Absolutely not. It is for the sake of peace in home. Christian life. We are Christians. We are children of peace. We are children that carries light in our homes. The enemy has no power over us. We are submissive to one another. My dear husband, what is it? My wife, this is the situation. What do you think about it? We come together and we make the decisions together. We are making the decision according to the standard of Almighty God to see what is right for our homes. You cannot control other people's children, but you can make sure that your children are controlled in your home. Uh, this country, school and all that, they spend, the children are spending more time outside than home. So if you are teaching these children, you have a standard, a guideline, and all that. They went out. Some type of vocabulary that is never ever taught in your home is brought forth. You heard it. Hey, my, my son, my daughter. This is not good. We are Christians. We are children of God. We are different. We don't handle things that way. This is a word that is a very bad word. And you know how children take things serious. That is how you can deceive them in Christmas. Everything. Uh, because they have written to Father Christmas already. And you said that they have posted. Unfortunately, you have become the post office. It went around and the envelope has come just right to you. You look at it, what they want. The following morning, they wake up and they come to you. Ah, the joy. The joy. I remember. And I believe it. I believe it. I say, yeah, for the Christmas next year, I know what I will ask. Because this.
that I said. He brought it. He is good. So, there you, that you'll be doing something wrong, and your mom will come to you and say, hey, make sure that you don't do this thing, because otherwise, Father Christmas might not be very happy. Oh, you might not. Say, mommy, I stop it. I stop it. Before they come to be stubborn and standing against you and talking to your face, they were kids that were growing. You have to know how to handle them gradually, impacting in them. Our homes has to be Christ-like homes in every area of our lives. This is what we are talking about here because the year is coming to an end and we have to make sure that we have peace in our homes. John 16, 33, in me, in me, you will have peace. But in the world, you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. This is Christian home. Anyone that says abided in Christ must walk as Christ walked. Uh, let me talk about one area, Jesus' attitude to sin. Jesus Christ, his attitude to sin. Hebrews chapter 1 and the verses 9. He said, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, had anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Hallelujah. Powerful scripture. Why did God anointed, you know, why did God anoint Jesus more than <laughs> he anointed everyone else? He came as you and I, ordinary person. Why did God probably anoint someone else greater than you? Why is it that Jesus Christ has so much joy in his life, even though all that has been planned for his life, the passion and everything else, but the man was living with such a wonderful joy? Why is that? Uh, the reason was because Jesus Christ. It is said here, he said Christ has loved righteousness. So the man loved righteousness. And he hated sin. This is why. This is the reason why. Why God anointed Jesus more than his fellows, more than everyone else. It is because Jesus Christ loved righteousness and he hated sin. It's very difficult when you have been now, you have gone to somebody's house, they have invited you, and then, you know, as Christian home, you have to watch. We have said it, the type of movie that you are watching. You have to watch. You have to watch the movies that you are putting in. Because there are some scenes that the devil is going to just grip them in your mind. You watch it. We have talked about it. We watch what we say. We watch what our children are saying. We watch our behaviors. We are watching their behaviors. Our homes have to be watched. Christ-like woman, a wise woman, you are building your house. It's not everything that they are saying out there that you are bringing into your home. Unnecessary pressure. Please, I pray for you that anything that is not glorifying God, you will not take it to your home in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, you don't have to have your friend's behavior. You don't have to have your friend's behavior. You are you and not someone else. If you hate sin and love righteousness, the Lord will anoint you. You know, he said that Christ hated sin and he, he, no, he hated sin and he loved righteousness. So as a result of that, he was anointed with oil of gladness. They don't know why you are happy. This is why you are happy. Your happiness is not something that you work for. Your happiness proceeds out of your nature. The man hates sin and loves righteousness. So as a result of that, God anointed him with oil of gladness. It is called joy. Gladness. He moves around with the contentment of heart. Oh, he doesn't have as much as you have. He is not carrying forth such a wonderful project and three house, uh, uh, three story buildings or anything else. That is not, I'm not talking about that. But the person has, you know, you are probably more richer, more anything you have all that. But he is in, in his state of poverty that you might think. The joy is there. The peace is there. The children are doing well. 
no sickness, no disease. Hospitals are not their portion. They are moving. They are still moving. A life of contentment. And the most beautiful out of it is that when your assignment is over here, Jesus Christ had prepared a mention for you. John 14, in my father's house, he said, there are many mentions. And I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And I will come for you. So it's not a life that is just going to stop here. It's not in vain for one to live a you know, Christian life. You will enjoy it here. Hey, most of the high blood pressure that are being detected in the hospitals, they are not of anything. Sometimes they are just too much thought. Too much. Too much in your head. But we are to release onto the shoulders of Christ. Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing. In other words, don't worry about anything. But in all things, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, you let your request be made known to God. What is your motive of serving Jesus Christ? Are you serving God because you hate sin and you love righteousness? Or you are serving God because you have to have something to say on Monday morning with your colleagues that you want to church? With your own motives? What is your motive of serving God? You are the only one that can answer that question. What was the motive of Jesus Christ serving God? Of course, he loved righteousness and hated sin. But also because he knows that sin dishonor God. Dishonor God. If you are a servant of God, you will live to serve God and to please God. A servant, a good servant, supposed to be living, pleasing its master. Having that faith, in that Hebrews 11, 6, for without faith, it is impossible to please God. But he that cometh to God, that is the servant of God, must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of they that diligently seek him. You shall be rewarded with holiness. You shall be rewarded with eternal life. It's a gift from the Father to us. So you living, seeking to live, to honor God. Sin dishonor God. Anyone that doesn't love righteousness, dishonor God. God has to be your reason of your living. The reason of this season is Jesus' own. So he has to be the reason of you coming to church on a Christmas Sunday. And not just that, but every moment of your life. You make sure that the Lord reigns. And one day, you know, we are going to be like him. Uh, let me bring everything to an end. First John chapter 3 and the verses 2. Listen to what the word says. Apostle John, by the empowerment of the Holy Ghost, he said, Beloved, now, said, Now are we the sons of God, and it doeth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Glory to the God. Glory be to almighty God. Hallelujah. Please, let's read this scripture again. Because probably you are asking yourself, so at the end of it all, eternal life and all that, what, is, what, what, what it is? So now, I read the sons of God. We are servants of God. And you do not yet appear what we shall be. It doesn't seem, we don't really grab how are we going to be. But we know that this is the assurance that when Jesus Christ shall appear, we shall be like him. When he shall appear, we shall be like him. So, you know, perfection will come gradually. We will be like Jesus when Jesus Christ shall appear. You will be like Jesus when you shall see Jesus Christ. So now you can see that 
you know, Christian life is, is, is a race. We have always been saying this. Uh, between the time that you are born again, uh, that is the time that you are starting, you know, your life. But by the time the finishing line, you shall be like Jesus. Because Jesus Christ, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Born again, that is the starting point. Uh, the finishing line. The finisher of our faith. That is the end of it all. And the end of it all is a life of glorification. You shall be like him when you see him. You shall be like Jesus when you see him. In between your starting point and your end point is life span, lifetime span. Many years in between. And all kinds of events that have been happening. And I keep saying, I said, do not fall victim to somebody's craftiness. Someone might decide not to care about God and become an instrument in the hand of the devil. Ah, that devil, you know, your home door must be closed. Your life must be closed to that one who had released himself onto the purpose of the devil. You don't have to. You don't have to. So, what is the difference between being like him and walking like him? There is a difference between being like Jesus and walking like Jesus Christ. The difference is that being like him, being refers to the total personality. That is your being. That is your personality. That is you. You are not changing. Your personality is your personality. Without any form of activity, it's still you. When you are sleeping, your character is your character. That is you. You are who you are. But the walking aspect of it, that is the consciousness. It's a conscious act. It's a conscious act. So that is the difference. On one side, be like him, that is your personality. And the walking, you know, as Christ walked, that refers to the consciousness. You are consciously, the walk is the consciously, you know, let me see into the life of Jesus Christ and making sure that Christ become the example of my life. And Christ being the example of our lives, you have to see it from the two angles. The outward aspect of it and then the inner life that the man lived. Because walking like Jesus, you might just be thinking that, oh, Christ raised the dead, so as a servant of God, let me also pray that I will be raising dead. Christ healed the sick and this. No, no, we are not talking about just that. The inner life, Christ had a home. He was in a home with responsibilities. The man was working and, you know, humility and everything else. That is what we are. The man will not tell lies. He's not going out there and swearing. For the sake of life circumstances, we even forget about we being Christians. The Lord said, I shall not swear. We go out there. We said, who are you? He said, I'm a Christian. He said, your Bible? Okay, take it. Swear that you will tell the truth and all the truth. He said, I swear. And only God knows that you are not going to tell the truth. And all kinds of things that are going on, we walking as Jesus Christ, gradually, according to the consciousness, you know, area of our lives, we have to choose to live a life according to the principles that Christ lived with. Being, that is the working aspect. Being conscious of the principles, godly principles. You choose to go God's way, not the enemy's way. Hallelujah. Romans 12 and the verses 2, he said, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind, that ye may be proof what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You have to be approved by God. The will of God. We are living, making sure that the will of God come to pass in your life. The purpose of God come to pass in your life. And if you don't pay attention, you will be you know, conformed to the world. You will be conformed to the world. 
It's amazing when something had appeared on TV. You see the presenter, the type of tie that he wear. This is the type people are watching TV. And every program that they are watching, they make sure. This particular program is going on. They see how people are dressing in. This is the new style of the year. And the celebrities, half naked and moving around. And he said that this is so wonderful. Why don't you just come complete? Why, why are you even wearing something? Just come out there. Because it seems like this is what is really dragging the world now. They don't even, if they are wearing something, they are wearing something so light. So our children are also dictating to us what they want to wear on Sunday. You don't dictate to your parents what you want to wear on Sunday. Parents tell you, they tell you that this is, today's Sunday is church. It's not your rikiki jean that you think that you are so cool that you are going to church with. I have bought a suit for you, my son. Wear the suit. And the son will be looking at you and say, Daddy, this one is not cool. We are not talking about cool. We are talking about education. We are talking about education. And don't be proud, you know. I mean, the problem that we are having today, you are in America. Your children, they will speak English. There is no born American that is proud of speaking English. It is their language. As wherever that you come from, the language that you speak, that is your language. Why would you be proud of speaking your language? Monkeys, they have their own science and language that they speak. And they are proud of what they have. Obviously. So there is nothing to be boasting of. It's normal. It's the, you know, it's the nature. Your child is born here. He will speak English. He will. Addition things that you can add is to make sure that they are also speaking your language. So that when you go to the shopping mall and the child is misbehaving, and instead of telling him, ah, I can see stop. I can see it's not stopping because the word stop is light. But when you look at the I can see die. Akwasi will, will die. Akwasi will definitely die. He will stop. So it's, it's beneficial. You see, so you are seeing these kids as, you know, they are so cool. It pleases you to see your sp children speaking English. And, 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 no, don't be proud of the children speaking English. They are born here, they will speak English. If there is anything that you can add to them, please add it. It's going to be extra. Extra extra they are not coming to dictate to tell you what 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 you have to do these are your children you have to tell them what they have to do when they are you know grown by themselves they can go out there and make the difference if you don't educate them right they will be a thorn in your flesh you can never have your peace knowing that your child is out there probably locked in prison or messing up out there no way no way. I can't handle this child anymore. I, I, I'm going to throw him out. Let me tell you, system has nothing for them. That is good. Nothing. So keep your people at home. Keep your children at home. Give them the right education. When you can't handle them, you say that, hey, uh, police, come and take them away. Children are even calling police on you to come and take them away. It's not right. Things has to come under control and under the godly umbrella. A home that is ruled by the regulations of God. Almighty God. They are just children. They are coming up. Give them the right education. Tell them the right thing to do. They don't know. They revolt. Yes, today they are revolting because they don't understand. But down the road, they will be thankful to you. May the Lord give you wisdom to train your children that way. In the name of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ comes, my last scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and the verse is 18. He said, we all with open face beholden as in the glass the glory of the Lord are changed unto the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. As you continue looking unto Jesus, there is no way that your life will not be changed. There is no way. This is it for today. Continue. Christ has become our role model. This is where the light, the life proceeds. Because uh, 
in John 1 4 talks about Jesus' life becoming the light of men. Uh -huh. So by looking onto his life, we are gradually being transformed from glory to glory. From glory to glory. Uh, year after year, you have to see this transformation in your life, in your children's life. When the child was 12 years old, you can see it is good. Everything that God, every single day, and it's, 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 it's a model. The six days that God used to create, Genesis 1, you're going to find out that every time that the Lord creates, he looked at it and he said that, behold, it is good. A time comes in a man's life that you have to look onto your children and say that, behold, then you, you, you say what you see. Don't deceive yourself. Do not deceive yourself. If it is not good, say it is not good. Behold, <laughs> I'm coming to be in trouble. Let me do something about this. But if you don't want to tell yourself the truth, they will grow up. They won't even, by 16, they are already ruling your life. And my children are giving me headache. How can the children give you headache? God never said that the children are meant to give you headache. He said you train them and they will go the way that you tell them to go. And when they grow up, they will not depart from what you have given them. I pray for everyone here. Any power of the devil that has taken control over your children, I cancel that power in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord God bless you. Amen. Today, we are bringing a word of the living God and we title this word the problems of closed doors of breakthroughs the problems of closed doors of breakthroughs in other words we have these trends in life they are trends in life happening over and over and over every time that you are going to hit success then something will come and then the whole thing is completely scattered and this can be the lifestyle of many that will be going through one experience to another and they will not achieve what god has called them to fulfill it. so it is important to understand what destiny is all about and live and fulfill your destiny then what is destiny in the book of matthew matthew chapter 26 and the verse is 24 jesus christ made a statement concerning himself he said the son of man goeth as it is written of him the son of man goeth as it is written of him meaning that your destiny is when you go as it is written of you your destiny is when you go as it is written of you but then it can be diverted also it can be destroyed it can be perverted it can be smashed into pieces or in fragment the Lord God has called everyone and each one of us. You are not in this world by accident and you didn't come here by yourself. That is a fact. No matter how much you would debate on this, there is no one in the surface of this earth that knew what happened in the day one of his birth. To tell you, you didn't know when you were in the womb, but God said he knew you. You did not know when you were not in the womb, but God said he knew you before he put you in the womb. You have no clue of the days of your, the early ages of your life. What really happened? And sometimes when your parents are showing you the pictures, he said, mommy, daddy, why are you doing this to me? You don't want to see those things. Or oh, some of us, we are gladly to see these things because, you know, these are the times of our lives that we don't remember anything and that is why they can stand and tell you he said look at you today you are standing before me and boasting 
But let, wait, wait, my son. Let me show you something. And then your daddy will just run. Go grab a picture that he has not shown you before. Because he wanted you to grow up. And show you by the time that you think you have become the boss of the house. And then in the, this picture is out. Grown up as you are, that you are the big guy. We seen you with pompous and everything else. And look at you. May the Lord forgive us. Wonderful plan of God for our lives. For sure. But since you know that God put you here. And the life that you are living is not your life. But the one that put you here. You want to make sure that every single thing that God has called you to do. You live your life unto fulfillment of those things. Destiny is nothing else but to accomplish what is written of you in the book of life. Of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and the verses 9. Apostle Paul made a statement. He said, for a great door. An effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. A great door, an effectual, is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. There are adversaries that wanted to prevent Paul from entering into that great door, and that is the fact of life. Jesus Christ himself, when he was coming, Herod was just standing right there saying that, you want to come here and save people. You will not come. And he will go ahead, slaughter children. Because he wanted to lay hand on Christ and terminate his life. That is the cause of life. Someone do not want you to live. Someone do not want you to be saved. Someone do not want to see your happiness. Someone do not want to see you getting married, having business, and name it. That is a fact. So, the door of salvation that's supposed to be open to people, by the coming of Paul, Satan said that Paul, you will not get there. So the door of salvation can be closed onto a person's life. Some of them, it's the door, the academic door has been closed. Others, their career doors has been closed. Marriage doors can be closed. Financial doors can be closed. Prosperity and health doors can be closed. Businesses doors can be closed and breakthrough doors can be closed. It is just the fact that as you will be living and be willing to fulfill God's mandate over your life, you're going to have to be aware of these things and not be taking your life for granted. You want to live. God wants you to live. But there is one that is standing out there, Satan and his demonic powers, saying that we are not going to sit and watch you to be happy. We will not fold our hands and see you, the little one that has been growing up. Now you are coming to come and rule over us by your prosperity. By your education, by your marriage, by your finances, no way. You will stand and fight you. You know, the situation is simple. Somebody said, he said, I have not done anything to no one. So why would they do this to me? This is not the right way to think. Because this world is an enemy to the children of God. This world, number one, they don't want you to come. This is the reason why when you are in the womb, already they are fighting you. 
So by God's grace, if you are born and you were not aborted by your parents, and you are living, and not only that grace has found you to be saved by our Lord Jesus Christ, and had packaged tools for you to stand and live your life, what you need to stand against the one that will say that I will not allow you to live. Christ has given those things to you. You have to be conscious about what you have in your hand. And use them. They are not automatic. They are not automatic. So all the messages that we are hearing about grace. Grace has done it. So I have to fold my hands. And see myself cruising in life. It is not true. It is not true. What you don't confront it has the right to remain. He said you have to resist the devil and he will flee. Devil that you don't resist will always be there in your life and will end up destroying you. Because every time they try one thing, it's not working. They're going to strategize and come up with something else. And since you are ignorant of the devices of the enemy and not using the tools that God has given you, you will become a victim of life. You will die out of their wickedness. And the Lord will ask you, why are you here? And you are going to stand there and tell Jesus Christ, my auntie, Jesus, that auntie was a witch. She was a witch, such a great witch. She's the one that killed me. And Jesus said that, okay. So you did not understand the reason why I resurrected from the grave. That death has no power over you. Because I died for you. You didn't get it. Go to hell. Let me burn you. Second death. So, this life is not a fanfare. You have to battle to survive and live unto the glory of the living God. It is not automatic. Therefore, I pray for you that by the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, Every single thing that is standing at the door and will not allow you to receive your breakthrough, I bind it in the mighty name of Jesus. You will live and declare the glory of the living God. And you have to take this thing serious. Because remember the story about Cain and Abel. The Lord came to Cain and told Cain because Cain has intention to go and kill his brother Abel and the Lord told Cain before everything happened he said sin is lying at the door and his desire is to have you sin is lying at the door and his desire is to have you so that is a principle every breakthrough door there is the man of sin that is lying just right there you want to break through, you're going to have to battle. You want to break through, you're going to have to what? Battle. Battle to break through. Success is not cheap. Victory, it is not cheap. There is no victory without battle. Christ fought and he fought for us to give us what we need to overcome the world. Whatsoever that is born of God overcometh the world. And it is by faith. It is by faith in Christ Jesus only. And one has to have that understanding so that you will not come to be a victim. Because at the door of every breakthrough, there is always a terrible battle. So, Jesus fought these battles all the time. Every time that there was going to be a breakthrough... There was a battle for someone who is going to be healed. The Pharisees would just come and say that today is Sabbath day, you can heal this man. Etc, etc, etc. The same way that when he was coming to this world that Herod was standing to fight him. It is principles of life that someone is standing there. To make sure that you don't make it as the Lord God has called you unto success. 
The enemy can close doors. And if you don't understand this, you will live right from the womb, struggle upon struggles and upon struggles and upon struggles. And you wonder, why me? You will always be making this statement. Why me? You keep coming to church and these things are happening to you. And you say, why me? Is God not true? God is true. But the Lord had already done everything that he has to do for your life. Salvation to us, Holy Ghost has been given. This morning in Sunday school, we were taught how sin is a law. A law is a law. The law of gravity is a law. You throw it up, it will come down. That is a law. And we were explained that no matter how much you try to hold it, a time will come that it will still come down because you will get tired. So if you are going to do it by man's will, it will not work. That is why the law was given to the people of the Old Testament for them to learn that you cannot do it by man's will. You want to, but you cannot because it is a law. You want to overcome sin. Romans six fourteen, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law. You are under grace. John 1, 17. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So Jesus came with the truth. And the spirit in grace is the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is given for man not to use his will to overcome sin, but allow the Holy Spirit to help you by the power of the law in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.2. There is a law in Christ Jesus that had set us free from the law of sin and death. So the law of gravity will not, you cannot overcome it by your own will, by the power of your will. But you can overcome it by another law that is found in Christ Jesus that has a higher power. If the law says that, if Almighty God says, you're going to throw this, and I'm going to defile the law of gravity. You throw it, and it is suspended. Nobody knows what is keeping it right there, but the hand of the living God that never gets tired under any condition can maintain it forever and ever for your life. Amen. What a mighty God that we are serving. So why is it that people, many people, they can't see when they are dealing with the problem of closed doors? Let me tell you why. The book of John, chapter 12, and the verse is 40. He said that, he said, Satan had blinded people's eyes. And he had hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes. And understand with their hearts and be converted and that Jesus should heal them. You see that? So this is not a matter of you have not done anything wrong to nobody. That's not a problem. It's not that you have done something wrong to someone. The problem that we have here is that this satanic world that we are living in, but God put us here Unto assignment, John 1, 17. The Lord said, Jesus prayed that prayer. He said, Father, I am coming. The ones that you gave me, these disciples, they are here in this world, but they are not from here. And they are in the midst of the evil one. So this world is an evil place. And I ask, Father, that you watch over them against the evil one. It is only God that can keep you going in this world. Hallelujah. It is only God that can save you and keep you going in this world to live a life that you will have joy within you and have joy in your marriage and have joy in your family and have joy at your workplace and have joy 
in every single door, effectual and effective door that God has opened over your life. Understanding of these things, for one, to break through your life. It is very interesting because every door can only be opened or closed with a key. If you don't have a key, you can't open the door or you can't close the door. You need the key. And I say that there is only one key. Only Jesus Christ has the sure key that can open and close any door of breakthrough or any door that the enemy has opened to fight against your life unto destruction. The Lord alone. Revelation chapter 3 and the verses 7 to 9. Jesus made a statement. He said to the angels of the church of Philadelphia, write this. These things saith he that is holy. He that is true. He that had the key of David. That is Jesus. Jesus that opened and no man can shut it. Jesus that shut. And no man can open it. The Lord Jesus said. You church. Of Philadelphia. Members of this body. Of Christ. I know your works. I know your works. Behold. I have set before thee. An open door. And no man. Can shut that door. From then has thy little strength. He said, for thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. So you see, Jesus has the key. But this key will only function for they that have little strength. They that have little strength. In other words, he said, you have little strength. You, would, you did not deny my name. You kept my word. But your little strength does not matter. Because you trusted in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you kept the word of God. The word that is abiding in you, that is where you are going to receive your strength from. The battle, it is not yours. It is the Lord's. So when they come against you, by the time you are sleeping... Your strength is so little, completely unconscious. But that time, because you have kept the word of our Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, and the name of Jesus is a name that has come into your heart and you know it, it will fight your battle in the name of Jesus. It will fight day battle. It will fight night battle. It will fight every moment battle that the enemy will raise against your life because he holds that key he opens the door of salvation unto you and no one as far as you continue in the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ no one can shut that door of salvation into your life Acts 4 12 says that he said neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is only the name of Jesus that a man is saved. It is only through the name of Jesus, the faith in Christ Jesus alone brings salvation into a man's life. And anyone that will, you know, what we are saying here is very important because the enemy tried to deceive people by other powers. To tell them that they can be protected by other sources. Satan cannot protect no one because from the very beginning he is seeking for your downfall anyway. So if by fear you are a parent, you love your children so much, and you don't want the powers of darkness that are harassing your family to kill them, so you run quickly to a fetish priest or to any other source of power that is not of God, to protect your children, to protect the family. 
It's Satan divided. No. He's not. Fetish priest as the sorcerer. They are all the same. They are all the same. It's the same satanic structure that is organized to continue snaring people. You go here, you have a little relief, but this one here is already seeking to finish you. You are, and it is endless. And you come to write the names of all your family members under the satanic book. And the struggles continue. Until a man comes to a point to realize that there is no other name that saves anyone except the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Struggles continue. Struggles continue. Revelation chapter 3 and the verses 10 to 11. Jesus made a statement. He said, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take it thy crown. So there is a crown that is reserved for everyone and each one of us. This life that we are living, we are living to fulfill God's plan unto a great reward. A great reward. A crown. I don't know if you are cautious about it. In your time of living now, that there is a crown that has been reserved for you. But there is a danger because he said you have to hold fast what you have so that no one takes your crown. So it is possible for someone to lose his crown. It is possible for one to live truly called by God. By ignorance, your crown is taken by someone. I want to live and fulfill all that God has called me to do. To inherit what the Lord God has packaged for my life. Very important. If you are living and you are living in the consciousness of a crown that is reserved for you. This is a race of life. And the prices, they are not the same. You cannot give the same. You know, even the people of the world, they know. They said this is Olympic. The first person will get the gold medal. The second person, something lower. Silver and bronze. They are not the same quality. Hold fast what you have so that someone will not take your crown. The race of life and destiny. What this is all about. You know, book of Matthew, Matthew 13 and the verses 25. You cannot stop Satan from working because Satan is Satan. It's like you are trying to convert Satan. For what? He will not. In the very presence of God, he did not change. How much more you? No. You know, this is one of the things that I say. It's not everybody that will come. God had paid the price for mankind. Jesus Christ has died. And Christ has been given as a gift unto everyone to be saved for salvation. God wants everyone to be saved. In other words, the Lord wants to see every breakthrough door to be opened. God wants to see you doing well. The Lord wants to see you being in good health. God wants to see you being able to take care of your children, taking them into school, that they graduate, to become somebody. It is God's plan to see you not in poverty, but in riches. As you are rich in the Lord, the Lord wants to make sure that you don't lack anything of this world. For he created it all for you. For you. But it doesn't seem like this is what is truly going on in your life. Some are struggling and they are struggling very hard. Because it is the lack of understanding itself by lack of in our knowledge, people are perishing. 
And you have to understand what the enemy is doing by the time that you say you are relaxing, that you are sleeping. Matthew 13, 25, he said, but while men slept, his enemy come and saw towers among the wheat and went his way. This is a principle. This is a principle. By the time that people are sleeping, this is the time that the enemy, satanic world, demonic powers are moving around and planting seeds over people's life. So every home that is not burning with the fire of the Holy Ghost, they are allowed to come in. If you are not sensitive to this type of kingdom principles, you will be struggling. Your children will struggle. Your children's children will struggle. And you will not be able to leave anything for them. This is what we are talking about here. These things, we are reading them from the Bible. And God is the one that is telling you that this is how it works. Where he puts you, this is the principle that are subject to this world. You are not going to change these things. You cannot divert the destiny of Satan concerning these things. He knows that there is a time for him. But he has also sworn to himself that he will make sure that the people of God, their lives are miserable. Salvation is released. He is hardening their heart so that they are not accepting Jesus as the gift of salvation. How is he doing that? According to your heart's desire, that is how he will do it. You want to live for cars and the latest of the latest of everything. Don't you know that as soon as the latest has come, two days after the latest is already old because they have already released another one. Do you know how many letters that they have in the, you know, in the conception room? By the time that the limited edition that you said that I'm the top on the top because I, I'm part of the that got one of the limited edition. Let me tell you, it's not limited. If they can do one, they can do two. And you keep living your life chasing these things and the enemy harden you onto salvation. That way, what you love most that goes against the will of God, that is what he will use and snare you and you will not come to know the Lord. You will not come to know the Lord. So be conscious that when man is sleeping, the enemy is working against their lives and planting evil. Planting evil. Therefore, you know, the, 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 you know, the problem is this. Is the oppressions that are going on at night, why the night? Why would you be surprised that they will be working at night? They are of darkness. Night is the time that they, they exercise most of their powers. So the plantings that are taking place in the night, during daytime, you will see the fulfillment of their plantings. People are entering into accident and they are being crushed here and they are going here and this is happening to them. And you know, why? Prayerless. Prayerless life. Your mind, your heart, the whole heart is just settled on worldly things. God is not part of your plans. Almighty God is not part of your plans. There is no, you don't remember anything of God. You just, you know, you have gone to work. You come back to work. You eat and then you sleep. No, even thank you, God. Nothing. Why do you think the enemy will not plant evil over your life? They can come in at any time and live at any time. Nothing is resisting them. The night is the time of their oppression because it is characterized by darkness. It's the time that they can carry forth any assignment because that is their time. Jesus made a statement. He said, are they not 12 hours in the day? So there is another 12 hours also in the night. When it is their time, it's their time. And you will not stop them from operating. But you can stop them from caring for their operations over your life. Over your life. 
You want to live, you have to battle by what has been given to you. You know, Matthew 11 and the verses 12, Jesus made a statement. He said, from the days of John the Baptist, until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. So, it is a time to take by force what belongs to you by being violent. The soft ones, they will lose everything. They will be victims. Fervent prayer. Fervent prayer. A great door is open. It will take great prayers and effectual prayers to remove the adversary. Fervent prayer. From the time of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God suffered violence. And the violence, they take it by force. So, it means that if you have to be violent to take by force what belongs to you, it means that what belongs to you, someone has it. Someone has it or someone has put a hold on it. Stumbling blocks. That job is for you. But they look at you and say, we won't give it to you. That school is for your daughter. Satan is using money. He said that, you know what? You will not get what you need to go and pay for the admission fees. You won't get there. Wisdom. Wisdom to understand how this world is being operated. So that you will have what the Lord has released unto you. It has not been changed. This is why Jesus Christ has been sent forth so that you will walk and live in dominion. What we lost in the garden by Adam and Eve, Christ has come to restore these things unto us. We have them. They are at our disposal. If you want it, you have it. If you don't, God will not force it on you. The gift is already given. Jesus Christ, salvation is through him and Christ has been given. If I hold a gift, I want to give it to you and you say that you don't want it, what can I do? This is what we are talking about here. You don't have to go through those struggles. But you must fight your battle by violent prayer. If you are taking all your time and sleeping and you love sleeping, you even take tablets to help you sleep. It's a means of the enemy to help you getting deeper. You know, the time of 12 o'clock, between 12 and 3 o'clock in the morning, that is the peak hours. I call them peak hours. Why? Because these are the times that most people are deeply sleeping. Deeply sleeping. And it's the high times of oppressions of darkness. Satan is coward. He will not come by the time that you have strength. But you know, God is talking to us all the time. God is talking to us all the time, but you are not. You can hear him. Too much noise in our areas. Let me show you this. The book of Job, Job 33. And the verse is 13 to 18. Job made a statement. He said, Why do thou strive against him? So why are you striving against this man's life? For he giveth not account of any of his matters. God, he said, For God speaketh once. God speaketh once. The Lord God talked to you. Yea, twice, yet man perceive it not. He said it first time. You were too noisy. You couldn't hear it. He said it again. Still, we could not understand what he was saying. So as a result of that, in a dream, God will come. In a dream, in 
the vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then God, he openeth the ears of men, and he sealeth their instructions. In other words, he gives, he tells us, he gives the instructions, he tells us what he wants us to hear that we couldn't hear during the daytime. Your TV was too loud. Unnecessary magazines that you were reading and caught into soap operas. These things will not allow you to hear from God. No room to listen to God during the daytime. Your mind, your heart, and everything of you is all about whatever that you're trying to achieve and has pushed God all the way aside. You could not hear God. So God in his mighty love and determined to see you fulfill his plans will come to you at night and will open your ears to give you his instructions. He does these things so that God may redraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. God keepeth back the man's soul from the pit and his life from perishing by sword. Hallelujah. This is how much God loves us. When we are busy watching, I don't know, whatever TV program that you love so much. And not having time for God. By that time the Lord had appointment with you. He wanted to tell you something that is so important. By the time that you were watching that, that show. It was already 2 o'clock in the morning. When the activities of darkness. In your country were taking place. And your name was being mentioned. At the table of darkness. To kill you. And the Lord wanted to save your life that time. You couldn't. Because... I don't know whosoever was in, on the TV and, and making sure and were caught in TV. Hey, hey, hey. What is that? So God will come to you at night and tell you, my son, wake up and pray. Because by the time you go to sleep, they are coming to plant over your life. They schedule stroke for your life. If you don't have health, what can you enjoy? What can you enjoy? From the time of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence. Violence that this kingdom is suffering. And it is only going to take violent people to live. You want to live. You want to live and receive your breakthroughs. Break through every single door that God has packaged for you. You have to be having this understanding. You will die before your time because you don't understand these things. Your children, they will be miserable because you don't understand these things. You cannot live and leave anything for, for your children because you don't understand these things. And it is going from generation to generation. Talking about that, you don't even know. Friday, I was taught. was a testimony that was given. He said in that family, this is a true story. No woman, no firstborn, no woman, no firstborn woman will ever have a child. And it has been going on over and over and over and over. And these things, they are trends that are happening to many of them. Some will not pass certain age. Some will battle over sex, certain sickness. And you go to the hospital, they ask you, did your father have this? And he said, oh yeah, my mom used to have blood pressure. So that is why I have blood pressure. Who told you that the blood of Jesus, there is any pressure in that blood? This is what we are dealing with. What they did, that was for them. What you are doing now, what Christ, it is for you. Hallelujah. Hey, it is time for everyone and each one of us to have understanding and live your life. 
What killed them cannot and must not kill you. What destroyed them cannot and must not destroy your children. You have to live and declare the glory and the banner of our Lord Jesus Christ over your home. For the Lord has done it all. The firstborn woman cannot give birth, no child, until someone started crying upon the Almighty God. And then they find out that by the time that they were trying to bring an idol into the village, they have to go and take somebody's daughter, pregnant woman, and sacrifice that woman. So as a result of that, Satan has also placed a hold. It was sacrificed unto him. And demons have been using this and placed hold as a curse over the entire family. That is what I was told. And this is a true story. He told us this on Friday night. Let me tell you this. God has paid that price. Great door is open. What you are going through, you don't have to go through these things. If it is happening, be alert, spiritually alert. And stand in fervent prayer. Violent man. Whatever that they have done, to suppress you to keep you under that the marriage will not work the fruit of womb you will not have it the finances you want your health will be miserable all these things Christ has paid for them he has paid for them and has given us the Holy Spirit and the power of prayer to open as he holds the keys if you stand and battle over your life for Christ to open that door, nobody will ever close that door in the name of Jesus. He said it. He said it. He said it. So that is how much God loves us. Stopping you. Come to the dream to let you know that something is going on. And you have to be alert. And I'm stopping just right here. Our last scripture. First Samuel chapter 2 and the verses 9. He said God will keep the feet of his saints. You are the one that the Lord is talking about. God will keep you. God will keep your feet. And the wicked shall be silent in darkness. Hallelujah. The wicked over your life, they shall be silent in darkness in only one condition, that you know your God. That you know your God. Why? He said, for by strength shall no man prevail. For by strength shall no man prevail. God is the one that is telling you that your strength will not make it. You need God's strength. For by strength shall no man prevail. I pray for everyone and each one of you. May you receive grace from above to prevail in any situation against your life in the name of Jesus. Anyone that has purpose to terminate your lineage, I buy their works in the mighty name of Jesus. You will live. Your children will live. Your children's children will live. By the power of the Holy Ghost, by the name of Jesus that has been written in your heart, Unto the generations to come, your people will always call on the name of the Lord. And the Lord shall always stand with them. And they will live to fulfill all that God has called them to do. Unto the glory of the Father alone. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God bless you. We bless the name of the living God for your lives. And we thank God for the wonderful things that he has done. And doing and yet to do. To him alone be the glory. We have a word from the living God today that we titled, Being in the Spirit. Being in the Spirit. The book of Romans, Romans 8 and the verses 5 to 9. Romans 8 and the verse is 5 to 9. 
we are going to understand what it means. What is the benefit of being in the spirit? The word of God says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. So let no man deceive you. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. You want to have a spiritual understanding about spiritual things, you have to get into spiritual realm. You have to get into spiritual realm. You want to be out of the flesh. You must get into the spiritual realm. You see, when one is in the flesh, listen to what the Bible says in Romans 8, 6. He said, for to be kindly minded is death. To be kindly minded, it is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Being in the carnality is being in the flesh. Being in carnality is being in the flesh. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So when one is looking for peace in his home, when one is looking to live, you have to be a spiritual person. If you want to have peace in life, you must be a spiritual person. You know, some of these things, we think that it is our, oh, if only this man will understand this. If only this man, no, please. Uh, the reason why your home is on fire, it is because it is too much carnality in that home. The reason why your life is just shallow, it is too much flesh, carnalities in your life. The Lord said that you want to have life and want to have a true life. Then become a spiritual woman. Become a spiritual man. Bring the spirit of God to reign in your house. And you shall see the peace of the living God that will overshadow your life. That will overshadow your home. That will empower your house. And you will see that the works of the enemy. He said where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. There is liberty. It is not your shouting that is going to bring home peace. It is not your screaming at your husband that is going to bring peace at your home. It is. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual thing. A man is not at peace until that man becomes a spirit man. A woman is not at peace until that woman drag himself or herself into the spiritual realm. He said, a wise woman built at her house. You want your house to be built, you have to be wise. What wisdom? Not the worldly wisdom. He's talking about the carnality. A life in carnality is death. But a life that is in the, in the spirit, that is the true life. And it comes with peace. This is the reason why when you read the book of Philippians 4, 6, he said, the Lord said that, he said, be careful about nothing. He said, be careful for nothing but in all things, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of the Lord that surpasses all understanding shall keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. You see, the, the heart and the mind, these are the two places that man gets worried. When man is anxious, it is happening in two places. The heart is not at peace. The mind is disturbed. The Lord said that the moment that you come to exercise your spiritual right in Christ Jesus, these two places shall be kept by the power of the living God. You might be seeing things that are not right in the sight, you know, in the physical realm. Oh, it is not moving. It looks like too much problems and all that. But let me tell you, when people are disturbed and cast down, you, upon the midst of your waters, Upon the midst of fire, you will feel that inner peace because you know that your God is with you and he will see you through unto his glory. Hallelujah. Mm. The reason why he said to be carnally minded is death and to be spiritually minded is life, he said in verse 7 of Romans 8, he said because 
The carnal mind, the carnal mind, this is the mind that is worldly. The mind that is outside God's wisdom. He said the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. So the mind is not trained for it. You have to see that carnal mind is enmity. Enmity meaning enemy to God. Enemy to, this is the reason why they reject the word of God. This is the reason why they don't want to have anything to do with the gospel. Because the mind is captured by the world. The mind is captured by the man of sin. So the mind is not willing to be subject or submissive to the word, to the law of the living God. It wants to do its own thing. It wants to do its own thing. Everything about that person is all shallow. It's all of the world. And nothing of life. Just thinking that he or she is living when there is no life. True life. So he said that that mind cannot be subject to the law of the living God. So then, in verse 8, so then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Carnality cannot please God. The carnal people cannot please God. You cannot be living your life in carnality and be pleasing almighty God. This is the promise of the living God. He says, so then they that are in the flesh, they cannot please God. But God start talking about you. You who is a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. You who is a child of God. In verse 9, he said, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you, now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Period. If any man has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So how do you know the children of God? By the Holy Spirit. How do you know the children of God? By the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.16 talks about, he said the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You don't need no one to tell you that you are a child of God. The spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. He said you have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God that is crying about father. When you are a child of God, you know you are a child of God. A child of God, there are certain things that, you know, as soon as you get yourself into that situation, you just know that this is not a place that you're supposed to be. This is not a situation that, you know, something that you must do. You are just, you, are, you become so uncomfortable because everything about the situation is contrary to your nature. And you run out. You don't have to know the entire Bible to know that <laughs> you are in a situation of sin. The Holy Spirit himself who beareth witness with you that you are a child of God, when you see sin, when you see the man of sin lying at the door, waiting for you, you run away from sin. You run away from sin. This is the identity of the child of God. So, when one is moving in carnality, you know, carnality, all these sources that you are not supposed to listen to, but listening to the right source, the source of edification. The source of life. He said, the life and peace proceeds out of the spirit of God. A life that is in touch with the spirit of almighty God. It is the Holy Spirit. This is not something that is outward. We are not talking about outward things. We are talking about inner life. Inner life. Inner life. You are the only one that knows exactly what you are going through. You are the only one. If you don't open your mouth to say anything to someone... They might not know unless the Lord, they will also have the ability to know certain things. God has given him that gift. But you will not lie to yourself. You will come to know the truth knowing that I'm suffering. Knowing that my home is not at peace. Knowing that... So, so God said you have to do something about that situation. Peace is only coming from Almighty God. Peace of life is only coming from Almighty God. I know what might be running in some of you's mind. 
He said, if only I have money, I will have peace. I'm telling you, we have people that have money, they are throwing themselves. They are killing themselves and they have much money. If you are living here and you are thinking somebody's life, you say, oh wow, if I can only have this man's life, this woman's life, you don't know what that man is going through, that woman is going through. You better live your life seeking after spiritual things that the Lord builds you. The Lord Almighty God, he builds you. David made a statement in the book of Psalm, Psalm 144. He said that the Lord Almighty God, he said, blessed be the Lord. God, my strength. God, my strength. My goodness, my fortress. That, uh -huh. that man has a personal relationship. He knows what he's talking about. The life, the true life, and the peace comes out of one that seeks to live in the realm of the spirit. Being in the spirit. Being in the spirit. The book of Revelation, Revelation 1.10. Our own apostle John made a statement. He said, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom, and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit in the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. People are moving around. They said, I can't hear God. They said, God, can you talk to me? Lord, are you... Hey, you are not going to hear God until you get into spiritual realm. You are not going to hear God. John 4, 24, he said, God is a spirit. And they that worship him, they must worship him in spirit and in truth. He's a spirit being. He talks. And when, as he's talking, he's not talking as man talks. He said, I'm a man, so he cannot talk like a man. He said, he's a spirit being. He acts as a spirit. So if you want to hear God, you have to get into spiritual realm. John, this is John's testimony. He said, I am a brother like you are. I am a brother like you are. I heard the testimony. He said, because I was preaching the word of our Lord Jesus Christ, I was put in prison in that island, Patmos. And on that island, I was waiting upon the Lord. In the Lord's day, I got into spiritual. He said, I, I, I was in the spirit and the Lord spoke to me. And the Lord spoke to me. And he said, the voice of God, it was like trumpet. It was like a shouting trumpet. How can you possibly, a trumpet that is sounding and your ears cannot hear it. It might be very, very, very hard ears. It is not because your ears are hard. It is because you are carnal. And the voice of the Lord is a spiritual voice. So when you want to make contact, you have to understand how it works. You have to know how, what to do to hear from God. You have to know how, what to do to hear from God. There are many situations that, I mean, we have been through all, through it all, through it all, through it all. But our God is with us. How would you make the right decision? How would you know the way to go? As a child of God, when you are being led by the Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, that is God. That is God. So if he tells you, let's go this way, and your ears are only hearing the criticism and the canalities of what people are saying about you, you are totally confused. You don't know what to do. The marriage is just, you know, it's not going well. You need somebody to counsel you and giving you the right counsel. But let me tell you, the Holy Spirit of the Lord is called the helper. The Holy Spirit of the Lord, he is called the helper. And he is speaking to you. You know what the Holy Spirit is speaking? The Holy Spirit is speaking the will of the Father. Because he said he would take from the Father and the Son and reveal it unto you. A man must be spiritual to know the will of God about every single situation. But if you are going through problems and you'll be sitting down, all that you know, crying and eating, crying and eating, crying and eating, crying and eating. So you are so much sorrowful and after the sorrow, this flesh, he said, I feed me so you can cry more and you keep taking food, you will not hear what God has for your life. Understand spiritual things. Understand how to deal with spiritual things. Do you know how we know how the enemy is working against our problems? 
It is because we get into the spiritual realm. So when people say, eh, they get into the spiritual realm, how, what does it mean? Being able to be in the spirit. I was waiting upon the Lord in the Lord's day. You have to learn to wait upon the Lord so that you can hear God's word. Hallelujah. Let me tell you this. You must seek to be in the spirit, Isaiah 40, and the verses 29 to 31. Please bear with me, we are going somewhere. He said, God giveth power to the faith. God giveth power to the faith. And to them, to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. You see, according to this scripture here, if you are in trouble, if you are fainting, it means that something had happened. Or a situation is going on and it looks like you can't take it anymore. So every strength is being given up. But he said God is the one that gives strength. God is the one that strengthens the faint. Now it is important to understand that if you are fainting and you are not able to see what the Lord is doing, you will go down and crash. This is why it is important for one to be in the realm of the spirit, to be spiritual so that you will hear what God is saying and what God is about to do. He giveth strength. He increased strength. <clears throat> then, in verse 30, he said, even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up wings as eagles. They shall, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hallelujah. Let me explain this scripture here. Because you can see that some people, they think it is out of your strength. It's not by your power. It's not by your might. The work that is done is the work of the Holy Spirit. You know how? He said that the young ones, watch this. He said, the young, even the young, they shall faint. Young meaning they that have strength. In young, you see the strength. He said, even them, they shall faint and they shall be weary. And the young man shall utterly fall. So it is not about physical strength. It is not about physical strength. It is about your spiritual strength. A man, a spirit man, you cannot judge somebody by just the outward appearance. You want to know a, a man of God. You want to know who is really a man of God. You cannot determine by the way that he wears his uh, you know, uh, tie and uh, suit and everything else. It's not about that. It is about the connectivity with God. This is a spiritual thing. Unless the Lord reveals that person to you, you will not know. You will not know. The power that is bestowed in that man is through the relationship of the man to his father. That is how he, 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 it works. He said it is not a strength that is of physical, but it is of them that wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord. He said they, they shall renew their strength. Ah, I love that one. Renewing your strength. A man must live and learn how to renew his strength. A man must live and learn how to renew his strength. This, you know, the Lord is doing new things every single day. Even in carnality, we know that things are changing. Your strength of yesterday cannot carry you through the years to come. So, one that is always going before the Lord, going, waiting upon the Lord, he said the Lord renews his strength as an eagle. As an eagle. The eagle, you know, a time comes that they just let go the feathers and then new ones are coming in. For what? For a higher soul. For a higher soul. A child of God must not be a stagnant child of God. Your, what the Lord was doing with you yesterday, today, <laughs> if you are nowhere, this is your current state. That is not what you used to be. So boasting 
of the past glory is not from God. Paul's boasting from, of the past glory is not from God. He takes us from one degree of glory to another. So if you have anything to say, you might be able to look at your current stand and said, look at what the Lord has made of me. He took me from nowhere, from no strength. And gradually, he renewed my strength day by day. And look at me today. And the Lord keeps you going. This is the testimony of the child of God. Not, oh, when I was in Ghana, I used to. Well, that is exactly what you said. When you were in your country, you used to. But now that you are here, what about now? Our God is a God of now. Our God is a God of now. That is why he said, now faith is. Now faith. So faith is a now thing. You cannot be boasting of the past faith. You have to be boasting of what God is doing. He's a God of yesterday. Yes, he did that. Today, he is doing it. And tomorrow, he is the same God that is going to carry you from one height to another unto his glory. Hallelujah. A child of God must learn how to renew his strength. If you are a minister of God, you have to learn how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You have to humble yourself, be able to go before God constantly for the Lord to renew you. For the Lord to renew you. Because if God has called you to his work, Almighty God who called you, I am already so sad to see people that are called by God and just, you know, wrestling, working so much with their own strength. No, depend on the mighty wings of Almighty God. First Thessalonians 5.24, he said, faithful is he who called you. He also will do it. So, your understanding must be clear. Put your hands in the hand of our Lord Jesus Christ. As the Holy Spirit is leading you, open your ears wild in the spiritual realm so that when he speaks, you can hear. When he speaks, you can hear. This is the man that is living in the spirit. Being in the spirit. When you are in the spirit, you are prompt to see the problems coming. When you live in the spirit, when you are in the spirit, you are prompt to see the problems coming. That's Psalm 144. David made a statement. He said that God is my high tower. God is my high tower. Do you know God being your high tower? Do you know what it is? It is the high tower. It is meant to see the enemy from afar before they get there. So when a child of God is in the spirit, watch this. What the word of God says. The book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 37 and the verse is one. He said, the hand of the Lord was upon me, that is a child of God, and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. Which was full of bones. You know what it means? The man was in the spirit. There are situations of dead bones dead bones so situation that is dead you can picture this as something that has been going on and it looks like there is no 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 no, no solution but you must understand there is something about the situation that you must know there is something about what is going on this could be a covenant that a forefather has been made with the devil and this covenant is still running in the family people are dying one by one and they don't even know they don't even know. This must be something that is working hidden. Let me tell you the spiritual principle. The enemy never does anything to let you know that he's the one behind it. Everything that the devil does, it is hidden because he's a thief. He's a thief. John 10.10. 10. He cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So the thief, the action of the thief is to make sure that you don't find out that he's the one behind it. And that is exactly what the devil does. So the situation that is ruining your life, the situation that is not allowing you to move forward, you might just be thinking that, oh, that is how America is. Let me tell you, that is not how America is. That is not how, it has nothing to do with America. Oh, uh, this situation, uh, I don't know, these powerful witches, all oh, these witches, oh, my family. And that, you know, you can be complaining about the witches and wizards as if witches are greater than God. Let me tell you, it's because you do not have understanding. The day that you will decide to know, 
Some they get very comfortable. I remember the story about, you know, when you start reading uh, uh, Daniel, the book of Daniel, Daniel 10, you come to find out that all the, 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 the children of Israel that was led into Babylon, Babylon, they got into Babylon and they were comfortable with the king's you know, provision. But Daniel, a man, a young man, stood and said, that, no, I cannot be getting comfortable about this situation because I know that I am in captivity. This is what I call the slave that loves his captivity. The, the slave is in captivity. He loves it because they keep maintaining him or her in that captivity. Be feeding you with peanuts, but you are suffering. When the Lord had set you to a higher height, a man must get into spiritual realm to find out the source of his problem so that he said, I was in the spirit and the spirit of the Lord carried my spirit into the situation to show me the dry bones. And the man, God says, speak unto the dry bones. I am telling you, you cannot speak into that situation until the Lord gets you into the situation for you to have a clear understanding. They can torment you for the rest of your life. You will die as victim, but you don't have to. There is something that you have to do, is that you as a child of God, you must learn how to get into spiritual realm and find out what the Lord says about the situation. May the Lord give us understanding to function to a higher height unto his glory. Hallelujah. So important. This is, you know, it quenched my heart when I hear people saying, God will do it. And do, they themselves are not doing anything. You said God will do it. But you yourself, you are not ready to pray. Uh, even when you start praying, you are sleeping. It's like, and you keep testifying of your failures. Me, I cannot pray. Oh. May, may the Lord have mercy upon you. At least one prayer that you can pray, that God strengthen me so I can pray. Unless you get to understand spiritual things you will be defeated in the realm of the spirit because this world the physical things that you see when someone is living his life you know you can there are two ways to be successful either you your success is coming from the world which is of the devil it is meant to keep you that way so that you lose your soul or your success is genuine coming from almighty god well the physical realm is just the result of what has been taking place in the realm of the spirit. If only, because in Hebrews 3, he said through faith. You know, Hebrews 11, 3, he said through faith. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. That the things that we see, that is the physical things. They are not made of things which do appear. These are spiritual things. So it is the spiritual world that governs the physical. You have had a dream and you saw yourself dead. You wake up. Are you dead? You are not. If you are not doing anything about that dream that you receive, you shall surely be killed. Because in the realm of the spirit, there has been a decree. There has been a decree. But your God took you and showed you on that tower. He showed you what the plan of the enemy is. A child of God might have that understanding. And stand and start praying. Say, I shall not die, but I shall live. To declare the glory of the living God. Every gathering of the witches against my life, Every round table of the wicked against my life, holy tender fire, brimstone fire, fire. Unless you free yourself, you will be a victim. We have so many that have just died. Life that have gone astray. Simply because they do not have spiritual understanding. Being in the spirit. Ezekiel said, I was in the spirit and I was able to command the dead bones back to life. I pray for somebody here. Whatever problem that is dead in your life, as you are going to be in the spirit, the Lord's hand shall carry you into that situation for you to speak life and you shall come back to life. In Jesus' name, amen. The spirit of God lifts us up. He lifts up a standard against the enemies that come after us. The spirit of God lifts up a standard against the enemy that comes after this. The book of Isaiah. <clears throat> Isaiah, he says, Isaiah 59, verse 19. Isaiah 59, verse 19. He said, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. 
He said, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. How would you know the enemy is coming? How would you know the enemy is coming? Let me tell you, one thing about when a man is in the spirit, a man lives with constantly the heart after the Lord. The heart. You know, upon all that we are saying, there is a manual part that one must be aware of. The willingness to break into the spiritual realm. The willingness to leave the physical realm to enter into the spiritual realm. It is something that you must do. It is something that you must do. You must be willing to know and God will help you and show it to you. He said that when the enemy has a plan against your life and coming against your life, that even if you are not aware of it, but because of your constant fellowship with the Lord, because of your stand with Almighty God, God shall lift up a standard against that enemy. That the plan that they have planned, it will not come to pass. So you can see where the power of a child of God is coming from. It is coming from the fellowship. It is coming from the fellowship with God. But if you come to God because it's the end of the year, oh, a uh, 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 New Year's party, they say, ah, because everybody will be going to church. So that is the time that you also come and say that, hey, uh, uh, happy new year. And everybody, happy new year. Oh, this year, it's not going to be like last year. Father, this year, things are going to change. Praise the Lord. You say, hallelujah, amen. You are jumping. Nothing will jump in your life. Nothing will jump in your life because you are not ready to jump for God. Your heart is not ready to jump after almighty God. You want to see the power of God. You have to get into the spiritual realm. You have to seek after the things of God. You have to, you know, make time to seek for God. That is how. So he said that uh, being in the spirit, what does it mean? He said that being in the spirit, meaning that you get out of carnality. You get out of carnality. And you start coming into the spiritual realm. One must learn to forget and put some things aside. And said, I'm waiting upon my God. To hear. And when you are in the spirit, your ears are tuned to the heavenly. Your ears are tuned to the heavenly channel. But when you are not in the spirit, and uh, you see, Akosia is talking, uh, your job is talking, uh, TV is talking, radio is talking, book is talking, this one is talking. Every source is just confusion, total, and you hear so many things except the spirit of the Lord's voice. You can hear. But when you learn how to, you know, it's not necessary because you are going to close yourself in some kind of retreat and to say that, oh, I am waiting upon the Lord. No, that is the deception of the enemy. It is the willingness to seek, the de determination to be saying that, okay, I'm going to wait upon the living God. Uh, sometimes people say, oh, you have to be in the quiet environment and all that. Yeah, okay, if that is going to help you, I have no problem with that. But most important thing is what you are going to do during that period of time john said and he said he said i was isolated because i was preaching the gospel of our lord jesus christ in that island over there <laughs> when you are in the island what else the man was isolated his environment everything was already calm but he said i made it a point to wait upon my lord i made it a point to wait upon my lord you know what it means it could be that you said, oh, I'm a minister of God, so why would I wait from God? I'm always preaching the word of God anyway. You could be that, oh, I'm, I'm always doing the work of God, so there is no need for me to be waiting on God. He said, I was already in the island. It was calm. I was put on that island because I was preaching the God. I mean, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The man was always in the book. Yet, he said, I waited on the Lord's day. I waited on the Lord's day. And the Lord spoke. And his voice was like a trumpet. I pray for somebody here who is not hearing the voice of the living God that the spirit of God will come upon you to start waiting upon the Lord so that you can hear God clearly in the name of Jesus. Mm. Thank you, my Lord. Being in the spirit is very good because now it's a form to, it's a way to fight your enemies. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if God shows it to you or not. What is important is that the moment that you are in the spirit, the Lord fights your battles. 
God speaks like a trumpet. We just said it in Revelation 1.10. He speaks like a trumpet. So you have to learn to tune your ears to the channel of Almighty God. If you are going to you know, allow your ears to be occupied by gossip and unnecessary conversations, it's not going to help you. It is not going to help you. Luke 4.4, 4, he said, Jesus answered him saying, it is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of Almighty God. You see, this is the point. You have to learn to cut off food. You have to learn to cut off food. Fasting, it is good. Fasting, is, it is good. Isaiah 58, when you read it, you're going to find out. He said that, and thy light shall break forth out of fasting. You are going to set the captives free. The boundaries that the enemy had set around you through being in spirit and waiting upon the Lord, something is going to happen. Something is definitely going to happen. Moving around and boasting of uh, you want to be a great man of God and all that, but you are not willing to pay the price. You think that it's just coming to stand here and start uh, preaching to us. Uh, no, 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 no. It's not like that. When you are called by God, the children of God are the ones that obeys the, the, the laws of the living God. Obeys the laws of the living God. Romans 8, 2. He said, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. From the law of sin and death. So man, a child of God, must understand that you have to come to a higher height. That the man of sin will not have any hand to shake with you. The child of God, you know, Romans 6, 14, he said, I, 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 you know, sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. You are not under the law, but under grace. You are not. John 1, 17, he said, for the law was given by Moses. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So we are under the law in Christ Jesus. For the spirit of the law in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. You want to be a spiritual man? Get into the realm of the spirit and let the carnalities out of your life. Cannot be shaking hands with sin and saying that I am a man of God, a woman of God. Get yourself out. Thank you, my Lord. Hearing the voice of the Lord, we said it as a trumpet, as Apostle John said it. But we have a scripture here, a couple of scriptures. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Chapter 10, verse 31. He says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. What does it mean? What does it mean? That when I'm eating, I'm eating for God. When you are eating the food that you are eating, it's only for you. But when you read this scripture, he said that everything that you do, do it unto God's glory. Ah, since the Bible says that when I'm eating, I should do it unto God's glory, hey, please hey, make my food. <laughs> no, that's not what it means. What it means is when one gets into the spiritual realm. In other words, you see, between you and the spiritual realm, there is pretty much no boundary. There is pretty much no boundary. It's the child of God that has come to the submission of the law in Christ Jesus. The life, the inner life, is in line with the word of the living God. So, what you see, that's what it is. When he says yes, his yes is yes. He is not a man of lies. He is the one that is being driven by the law in Christ Jesus. So what you see, that's, that's what it is. So you cannot be coming, standing there, proclaiming I'm a child of God. Eh, Holy Ghost, fire. Meanwhile, there is fire burning yourself. You are already in sin, in sin, in sin. You are already in sin. Let me tell you, witches will have power over you. Wizards will have power over you. Because you are already having fellowship with them. But when one comes to understand that there is nothing like, like my life and the life of God. As we are being increased, we think of God all the time. We think of God all the time. How can you pray without ceasing? How can you pray without ceasing? Don't you have time to go and wake? Wouldn't you sleep? So how would we pray all the time? It is the same thing. Yes, of course, we make time for prayer. But you see, the heart... That is always beating for God. Every single thing that comes on your way, you, it is instant. 
You are not even going to take water without giving glory to God. It is instant. As soon as you open your door from workplace, you enter in, you say, oh Lord, thank you so much. Everything, thank you God. Everything, you know, you are just so mindful. Every single thing. David made the same statement in that Psalm 144. He said, God is my goodness. God is my goodness. So the man is thinking that, you know, I depend so much on God. That what is it that is going to happen to me that is not proceeding from God? Do all things unto God's glory. It can only be done when one is constantly living God. Constantly living God. This is a very good expression. Living God. Hallelujah. Living God. Living your life with the consciousness of God. Living your life with the consciousness of God. So you may know how to answer everybody. You may know how to conduct yourself in different situations. You may know how to act. They see you, they must know you as a child of God. Before they come and bring gossip about somebody, they must know your reaction before they come. But if they come and you enter the door for, I mean you open the door for them, they come, they give you gossip. You see that? It quench your spirit, but you have it. And you were praying this morning, but now you have received gossip. It is quenching your spirit. Why would you open that door? Because you have opened the door for the enemy to come in. A child of God is one that will close the door of gossip. A child of God is the one that will close the door of sin. A child of God is the one that will stand and be conscious about God. When you are conscious about God, you are conscious about life. And when you are conscious about life, you are conscious about the life in Christ. And when you are conscious about the life in Christ, it is what is going to give you life in the physical realm. John 1, 4. He said that the life was in him. He said in him, in Jesus, was the life. He said, in Jesus was the light. And that light is the life of every man that cometh into this world here. You see where the life is coming from. So you want to live, you have to learn to get into the spiritual realm. What people cannot hear, you will hear. What people cannot see, you will see. What will come to people as surprise, it will come to you expected. And you will be able to go through it. Because you know that the Lord had already made a way to come out. You know why? Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13, he said there is no temptation taking you. There is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. In other words, there is no situation coming to you as a surprise. There is no situation coming to you as a surprise. It, this can only be done to a man that is spiritually connected. Spiritually connected. Why? Because he said, but God is faithful. God is faithful. The faithfulness of God is to know that no matter what will come on your way, your God will be with you. You know why? Because, number one, whatever that the enemy is bringing before you, when they were taking time to prepare it, the faithfulness of God was watching. When they thought of carrying it forth to your life, the faithfulness of God was just looking at them, bringing that evil into your life. When they brought it into your life, the faithfulness of God is also still watching your reaction. There is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able? Uh, this one is a good news. Because if God had permitted me to go through this situation, it is because God had judged me faithful. God had judged me capable. The Lord will not you will not allow you to go through situations that you cannot bear. God, I mean, this is, this is the word of God. It said, God who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but with the situation, with the temptation, also make a way for you to escape. Make a way for you to escape that ye may be able to bear it. You know how I see it? I see that scripture as you know, every single problem that you'll be going through, the solution is in the problem. Hallelujah. The solution is in the problem. If you're a child of God, going through situations, let me tell you, the solution of that situation is in the situation. Because God is going to use the same situation to make a way out. God is going to use the same situation. So let me tell you, sometimes they just... They are just thinking that uh -huh, uh, we, have, we have gotten him. This time, he's finished. He's finished. They don't know that they are bringing you to a higher height. They don't know that they are bringing you to a higher height. 
So more the enemy is just oppressing you and they stand there. They keep, you know, clapping. Uh -huh, he's finished. He's finished. He's finished. Let me tell you, the next thing God says, it is finished. And you are out there. I, I remember a story of uh, this group of people that came and uh, a donkey had messed up. And they said, hmm, this donkey, we are going to finish the donkey. So they dig a hole and they put the donkey in the hole. And they said, we will bury, bury you alive. So they started shoveling. And every time that they shovel the earth upon the donkey, the donkey will just shake himself and come on top of the earth. And they continue, he will shake and come on top. They continue, he will shake and come on top. The next thing they know, the donkey was at the same level as they were. He started running away. I pray for somebody here. Anyone that is seeking to bury you, anyone that is seeking to bury your life, you shall go to their funerals. You will go to their funerals. That is the word of the living God. When one is in the spirit, he's a spirit man. He's a spirit man. You cannot deal with that person carnality. You cannot deal with that person in carnality. If you want to get me, you have to get Jesus Christ. That one, it's my bonafide right. And I know this. Because I am in Christ. And I don't mess up with my position of right. I know that I'm a child of God. So there are certain things that I don't do. I don't do. Where the man of sin, where the situation of sin is, I don't go there. It quench my spirit. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Hmm. To God alone be the glory. So now, do all things unto God's glory. Exodus 15 and the verses 20, 26. I'm bringing everything to an end. He said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which he will do that which is right, that which is right in, in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of this disease upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that he led thee. Hallelujah. Look at another power. When one is in the spirit, you see, <laughs> this is healing. It is called healing. It is called healing. It is called healing. You get into spiritual realm as you keep on waiting upon the Lord. That is, I know this. So I know this principle and I know it of to work so great. I have seen people come into this ministry. All that I tell them, they come to the ministry broken. I mean, you can see that the enemy had touched their health. Doctors have been given up. We have seen many of these situations. And we are still seeing so many. But if there is nothing that we do. I just advise the person, I said, you keep coming. May the Lord give you grace to be part of the prayer team. May the Lord, so as they keep coming, and keep coming and keep coming. The one that came couldn't even walk. The next thing you know, they are coming with them. Afterwards, they themselves are becoming prayer warriors. I pray for somebody here that whatever that the enemy had planned to take away your health, that your spiritual fellowship with Almighty God shall heal your infirmities in the name of Jesus Christ. There are some things that will not go except by prayer and fasting. There are some things that will not go except by getting into the spiritual realm. Thank you, my Lord. Learn to confess your sins. Learn to confess your sins. And acknowledge, you know, you want to go in a higher height with God. Be very honest. Be very, very honest. Jeremiah 3 and the verses 13, he said, Only acknowledge thy iniquity. Only acknowledge thy iniquity. That thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God. And has scattered the ways to the, to, to, to the stranger. He said, has scattered the, thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. Every green tree. And ye have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. I love the part that says, only acknowledge thy iniquity. And thou, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord. We have people, they hide their sins. We have children of God that are hiding their sins. You know how it goes. You come to church. You are usher. You are singing in the choir. You are instrumentalist. 
you are a congregation member, a child of God. You are preaching. You are a pastor. You see, the moment that you leave this place, only God knows the type of life that you live there. Only God knows the type of life that you are living there. Let me tell you, the word of the living God, you cannot deceive God. God's eye sees everything. He sees in the church. He sees outside the church. In case you think God doesn't see outside the church. I have bad news for you. He sees in the church and he can also see outside the church. So when you come and play holy in the church and you go out there fooling yourself thinking that nobody in the church knows you and you can do your own thing. Pity you. Pity you. God said you want to go in a higher height. I acknowledge I know what is in man. Jesus said it. That man has this spirit that he may sin. But he said only acknowledge your state. Only acknowledge. Be sincere. Be, go before God. God is not... No, none of us ever come before God in perfection. Nobody. Nobody. So no matter what your state is as of today, please, seeking to be in the spirit, meaning that make the step of faith. Go to your God. Father, I have come as a sinner. Father, I have come. I know that these things in my life are not really right, but I have come as a sinner. I know you will help me. You will help me. And gradually, the Spirit of the Lord, you might be falling again, even as you are, you continue looking for help. And the Lord would still, every time you fall, you come back and say, Oh Lord, please help me. The next thing you know, you are gra gradually, gradually, that is how you will come out. I pray for somebody that you will come to a point that any sin in your life will not be the reason not to get into the spiritual realm. May you overcome it in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you, Father. Confessing our sins to one another. Thank you. There is a scripture that you might just look at it at home. Uh, 2 Corinthians, for the time's sake, verse 24, 10 to 16. You come to find out, David said unto the Lord, because David had counted the people, and he had sinned against God, and the Lord gave him three choices. So David, <clears throat> the, the man of God, God came to David. He said that you need to choose. You need to choose among three punishment. And among the three punishment, he said, I prefer choosing the punishment that is from Almighty God. Because I know that God is merciful. I pray for somebody here. That whatever that is coming on your way, even when you have confessed your sins and the Lord is going to punish you, may the Spirit of God open your heart to go through the punishment of Almighty God because I know it will take you to your higher heights. Amen? Mm -hmm. Thank you, my Lord. We give you glory and honor. The last scripture, and this is it. He said, Romans 8, 14 to 16. He said this. He said, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If ye have not received, he said, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby crying, Abba, Father. For the spirit, you know, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of Almighty God. You don't need anyone to tell you that you are a child of God. May the Lord continue minister to you. May the Spirit of the Lord help you in your everyday life that you will come up higher and higher. To God alone be the glory. In Jesus' name you have worshipped. Let's say amen. Amen. God bless you. Let's stand up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Everyone is very welcome and we thank God for your lives. We have a word from the living God today that we title devil's weapon your weak areas devil's weapon your weak areas in other words satan is going to take advantage of your weak areas he will use your weak areas as a weapon and we're going to see this things so it is important for the believer to come to the point to recognize that if there is any area that I am weak in the world because when you are you are weak in Christ that is where you are strong in the world but when you are weak in the flesh that is an area that the devil is definitely going to use to destroy 
your life. And we also have to remember that, you know, don't think that you are strong, that you will be able to face all situations by yourself. This is the reason why Proverbs 3, 5 talks about trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not unto thy own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge God. In all thy ways you have to acknowledge God. So anything that comes on your way, you have to push it on the side of Almighty God. Because by default, we, we are born in the world with the Adamic nature. All human beings. All human beings, everyone that is born, is born in a fallen state. And we inherited that foreign state from the Adam, the fall of man in the garden just right there. So we are to come as Christ has been given as the solution to change that nature of the fallen state to a nature of life which can only be found in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that the fallen state is a state where man comes to the point of knowing himself as all-knowing man, knowing good and evil in all circumstances. He trusts in himself. He relies in his abilities, his knowledge. This one I know it is good. This one I know it is not good. God never intended for man to live that way. God intended for man to trust in him and lean on his Holy Spirit for his leadings. That was the intention of Almighty God. And none of us can ever come before the Lord boldly and say that we have no sin. We make God a liar. We are sinning even when we have come to know Jesus Christ, that we are in Christ. We are sinning every single day. Sin that we are sinning with our eyes, the flesh, and the pride of life, and all that, the ears, the mouth. We are sinning, constantly sinning. That is why he said, Pray without season. But every time we come and stand in prayer, we ask God for forgiveness of sins that we have committed. So let us not deceive ourselves. We have something, you have something, I have something within my life. That I have to submit unto Almighty God as an area of weakness, sin, for God to help me deal with it because you cannot, you cannot by yourself overcome sin. It is by the empowerment of the Holy Ghost, it is by the help of the Holy Ghost that you can overcome something that you consider to be as, oh, this is not important, something that is little. But it is that thing that Satan is going to use to destroy your life. That is why we come before Almighty God to get this wonderful wisdom to live our lives and become better people as the Lord God has called us to be like the Son, Jesus Christ. So number one, we're going to say that we have to deal with the sins that dwell in our flesh. And only God knows that everyone and each one of us, as I was saying, when you have come to know our Lord Jesus Christ, yes, we are born again. We are born again, but we are of the nature of Adam, the Adamic nature, a fallen state. We're going to have to work our own salvation by the empowerment of the salvation tools that have been given by Jesus Christ. The name Jesus is for us. The blood Jesus is for us. The Holy Ghost is given to us. The cross is given to us. It is all that I consider to be the salvation tools for everyone and each one of us that have called to live the life unto the glory of the living God. Therefore, one has to come to the point to recognize that this particular issue of my life is not going to help me. And we're going to mention a few of them. As great as Apostle Paul was, 
a man that was taken into the third heavens he was living and wondering am i really a human being did i go there in this flesh i saw the third heavens things that were revealed unto me that i'm not able to speak these things i am not allowed to say these things and this man passing by his shadow was healing people handkerchief and aprons aprons alone taken to he, in, in all sick people they were they were they were healed that is how much power god gave to this man but listen to what he says in romans 7 and the verse is 15 to 25 apostle paul said for that which i do i allow not for what i would that do i not but what i hate that do i what i hate that is what he does i don't want to do it but he ends up doing it so he said in 16 if then i do that which i would not i consent unto the law that it is good now then it is no more i that do it but sin that dwelleth in me it is no more i paul that do it but sin that dwelleth in me we can all you know identify ourselves with with what paul is saying it comes to a point in your life that you are doing something something is going on that you know that this area is an area of weakness you try as much as possible to stop it you cannot stop it and in that case you have to come to recognize as paul has come to recognize that i have come to know that it is not me but sin that dwelleth in me sin that dwelleth in me the state of recognition is very important so that you can deal with it by submitting it unto almighty god verse 18 of romans 7 we continue he said for i know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing <laughs> so one that is living in the flesh there is nothing good that comes out of you because in the flesh there is nothing good that dwells in the flesh that is what paul said here so a man that is living in the flesh you are just living in carnality it will take a higher level of fellowship a life in the spirit to be able to overcome the sin that dwelleth in the flesh come up higher there is nothing good that dwelleth in the flesh the reason why he's saying that he said for to will is present with me in other words he wants to do good but how to perform that which is good i find not i want to do good i can see that if i can do this it is good for me i can see that if i can stop this particular thing that i do all the time that is not glorifying god i know this i don't need anyone to tell me that this particular thing in my life it is not good I want to stop it i tried but it's not working i have to recognize that it is something that is in me in the flesh and i am struggling with this verse 19 he said for the good that i would i would i do not but the evil which i would not that i do now we have a, such an amazing addition not only he knows that doing this is, is good but he also know that there is a knowledge of evil as he has the knowledge of doing good but now the choice is that not only he is not able to do good but he finds himself doing what he doesn't want himself to be doing in other words he finds himself doing the opposite of what he wants to do there is a power here there is power in sin there is power in sin you don't want to sin 
But there is something that pushes you to commit sin. He said, I don't want to do it, but I end up getting it done. And what I end up doing, it is not the good part of it. So, in order for a child of God to be doing good, there has to be a power that pushes him towards good things. Because sin itself that dwelleth in the flesh is exercising power over the believer and bringing him to do what he doesn't want to do. But for the believer to do good, he finds no power. It's not there is no power. There is a power. But until a man has come in line to the source of power that pushes you to do good, it will be very difficult for one by his own flesh to do good. But it is easy for one in the flesh to constantly sinning against God. Because the power in sin is a power in the flesh that pushes man to sin against God. To sin against God. Hmm. Knowing this, in verse 20, he said, Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Okay. He's now identified that he can see that there are two individuals operating within himself i can see what i'm going through but i can also see that i want to do this i am not capable but i end up doing bad the opposite of what i want to do and now he's saying i i i, I just come to find out that it is not me but the same sin in the flesh that is working against my life So in 21, he said, I find then a law. I find then a law that when I will do good, evil is present with me. Hmm. When I will do good, when I am intending to do good, when I have in mind to do good, there is evil that is present. He shows up. Every time that you want to do good, evil, a spirit will just show up. Shows up right in your thoughts, in your heart, in your intention to stop you from doing good. And instead of doing good, you end up turning your good to be bad. That is what the man is going through. So, in 22, he said, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Well, since he just said that, he had come to the conclusion that the act of willing to do good, ending him to do bad, is a law. It's a law. But there is another law that is also working against this law that brings him to do evil when he wants to do good. These two laws are operating. In John 1.17, Jesus Christ said, it is said that the law was given to Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. But Romans 6, 14 talks about sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under the law. You are under, the, under grace. So now, it is very interesting because in Romans 8, 2, he said, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had set me free from the law of sin and death. Combining all the scriptures together, we can clearly see that there is two laws that are operating against the act of man, the willingness of man. 
when man is willing to do something he's automatically confronted with two laws one law which is the law of sin and death that is the law that was given by moses and another law that leads to life in christ jesus the law that is in christ jesus so it is your choice of operation of law which law are you choosing to operate that is going to bring forth the type of victory the type of victory leading to your choice in other words if you choose to live your life by the law in christ jesus which contains the empowerment of the holy ghost to help you do whatever that you want to do satan will not have any power to overcome the empowerment of the spirit of god so if you intend to do good automatically the holy spirit will empower you block any avenue of the devil to lead you to do evil when you intend to do good the choice of the believer here is extremely important how you the outcome of your life is a choice that is linked to two laws that are operating in this life here but you know obviously when you have come to know our lord jesus christ we are expecting that you will be living with only one law the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus but obviously the other law the law of moses the law in the flesh the sin that is in the flesh is also battling against this law in christ jesus and the man gonna have to be strong and be alert and sensitive to every single thing that is happening in your life especially our weaknesses areas that we know that we are weak it might open the door for the enemy to come in and cancel every law that we are operating with he said in 22 that i delight in the law of god after the inward man that is the spirit man he delights in the law in christ jesus but verse 23 i see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members that is what we have been saying i choose to operate my life to live my life by the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus but i also see the law of sin that is dwelling in my members and pushing me to go against what god really want me to do or to do the good thing please let everyone and each one of us be extremely sensitive to these things because that is where we are having all our issues these areas we're going to be talking about different examples but you know yourself your weaknesses so apostle paul after analyzing all this come to the point to find out that there is a war a war ongoing on war in my life A war verse 24 facing all this he said oh wretched man that i am who shall deliver me from the body of this death who shall deliver me from the body of this death he's seeking for solution he's seeking for solution now here comes in 25 i thank god through jesus christ our lord this is the solution i thank god through jesus christ our lord so then with the mind i myself serve the law of the law of god but with the flesh the law of sin i am looking into the solution i thank god for christ jesus with the mind i serve the law of god with the mind i'm thinking to do good 
but with the flesh the law of sin which is leading to death i don't want to do it that is my decision in the mind which goes in line with the will or with the law of christ but the flesh even though my mind said i do not want to do it the flesh the almost the, 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 the desires the lust of the flesh the pride of life the loss of the eye pushes this body to go and fornicate to go and do what i do not want to do This is what Apostle Paul is saying about himself, his state of life. How much more is? I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about men, great men of God, people that walk close with God and could not watch their weaknesses, could not bring their weaknesses under the power of the Holy Ghost. Some of them, you know we are standing on the better covenant we are standing on the better covenant apostle paul was operating with the holy ghost and that is why he said that i thank god for jesus christ because jesus has provided me with all that i need to be able to overcome it but in only one condition that i bring my weaknesses under the power of the holy ghost i submit in humility in humility my life in the holy ghost control i don't trust my flesh but i trust in the leading of the holy ghost in the power of the living god under all circumstances i am not going to bring my carnalities in there but i will trust the leaders of almighty god to make the right decision and to do the right thing for my life In my examples, let me start with uh, uh, King Saul. King Saul's weaknesses. His weakness was simply that he loved the praises of men. King Saul, the reason why Saul fell, it is because he loved the praises of men. When people are praising him. And only God knows that we have up to date. Christians that love to see the praises standing and taking honor for himself. Some of them just want to grab the glory that is designed to God for themselves. This is what we are talking about. It's an area that you have to watch because Satan automatically bringing pride in your life you become god's enemy and that is what happened to saul first samuel chapter 15 and the verses 22 he says saul he said had the lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the lord behold to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams let me explain this this is the word that came from you know prophet samuel to king saul because saul wants to always put himself out there and be able to receive the praises from people instead of obeying god that is where this famous scripture that we are always talking about to obey is better than sacrifice that's where it comes from because paul simply failed to deal with that weakness that was in his life he was self-willed he was self-willed and he lacked you know the control of 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 of, of this life and just living in the sight of people what people are going to say and when people are saying things praising him he thinks that he's on top of all he was a king already he was a king what else that you would need for 
from people. God himself took you out there. But you see, when it comes to sin that is dwelling, weakness that is in life, that is exactly what we are talking about because no matter what state you are, it is still going to operate. Even in the fullness when you have it all, you are still thinking that you lack it and you're going to operate. It's a weakness. It's an area that is very bad and you need to work it out with the empowerment of the Holy Ghost because otherwise devil will destroy you through that area will destroy your family through that area will destroy your marriage through that area will destroy your children through that area will kill you and bury you through the same area or weaknesses but it's very interesting you know sometimes we take uh, this pride saying that oh <laughs> this is my weakness this is, is this is my weakness like we are we, we are boasting of it there is nothing to be boasting of because it is going to kill you. My second example is a man called Gehazi. Prophet Elisha's servant. This man, his problem was covetousness and lies covetousness and lies one that is never content in life and the result of that you know covetousness it links with lies they go together anyone that is always willing to i wish i had this i wish i have that so you know and i will even say that the praises of men is always you know is also behind it because in your willingness to have everything that people have you want them to know that you are somebody when you are nobody so you end up lying about what you don't have covetousness and lies they go together this was the case of this man Gehazi Walking with the great prophet of God, Elisha. The background story, we all know this. When Elisha healed Naaman from his leprosy, Naaman brought gift unto the, the prophet Elisha. Elisha said, don't worry about your gift. Go, God healed you. The servant ran after <coughs> Naaman and collect every single thing that he wanted to bring to the prophet lying that the prophet asked him to come and collect it simply because his eyes have seen these things and the blink 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 devil said that hey run 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 go and get it he ran for it so when he came back after he has collected those things from naaman uh elisha in second kings chapter 5 and the verses 25 to 27 listen to the conversation here so he went in and stood before his master Gehazi when he came back he came to the house and stood before Elisha and Elisha said unto him where is comest thou Gehazi and he said thy servant went no whither Gehazi where are you coming from oh I was just around I didn't come from nowhere I was just around, Master. He was lying right there. Because that's in life. And it will save your life. It will save your life. The pressure that you are putting on your marriage. The pressure that you are putting on your husband, on your wife. The pressure that you are putting upon yourself. You are going to kill yourself. Please calm down. Calm down. It is not time for those things. It is not time. When the time is right, you will know. When the time is right, you will know. Because God's time, nobody stops it. Because God's time, every single thing that the Lord God has planned for that moment, nothing will stop it. It shall surely come to pass as the Lord God has it written. Is this the time for you? To collect those things
Gehazi, as a result of what you have done, this is the judgment upon your life. Verse 27. The leprosy that we healed Naaman from. The leprosy that we healed Naaman from. Ah. Therefore, shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from the presence a leper as white as snow. This is so interesting. You probably, we are all thinking that Gehazi went and collect money and collect, you know, good things. But apparently, he didn't go to collect money. Money was the bait that Satan used to trap his life. He said, the leprosy that we healed Naaman from, Gehazi, you have gone and take it for yourself. Not just for yourself, but also for your children, for your children's children, for your seeds. Gehazi, what you have done, that was so much selfish to you. Look at what you have brought to your generations. You thought that it was a problem that is your only problem. It is something that is just you. It is not. It is not. You are planting something that is going to be impacted to your generations to come. Your children, they will behave that, the same way. Your children's children, they will have the same thoughts. Your children's children's children, generations to come, and people will be pointing to this family, saying that this family, they are evil people. Please, we don't marry from this family. Another great man of God, Moses. The problem of Moses, the weakness of Moses was anger. Anger. It might sound something that is insignificant. But if your weakness is anger, you're going to have to deal with it by bringing it under the submission of the Holy, Holy Ghost. Because otherwise it will destroy you. In the case of Moses, Exodus chapter 2 and the verses 14 to 15. Moses is a man with full of anger. And he end up killing an Egyptian. And he thought that no one have seen it. So, there was a conversation and he came to find out. Somebody told him, Moses who had made the prince and a judge over us, one of his own brothers. Moses, you are thinking that you are a prince and a judge. You might be a prince and a judge over those Egyptians, but we, Israelites, you are not. And matter of fact, let me tell you one thing. Are you also intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. The anger that provoked you to do what you did to lose your marriage. By God's grace, you have found another person. This time, is the same anger going to come forth again and rule over your life. To break your life again. Is this going to happen again? How many times will you let this giant in your life. Destroying you over and over and over and over. A time comes in a man's life that you say that. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Are you coming to do this to me? As you kill the Egyptians. The Egyptian you are also going to kill me with your anger. Moses. Moses said. Hmm. Indeed, this weakness in me is known. This weakness in me is, is known. Probably you are sitting here and you are thinking that your weakness is not known. But your behaviors to people, 
they have come to understand that your weakness it is only you that think that it is something that you know that that that, that, that is good and even you know that it is not good and you are struggling with it but you are not willing to do anything about it and it is destroying you it is destroying your home it is destroying your life it is destroying your job place it is destroying everything that you do it is destroying you what are you doing about it every single thing has been given you don't have to remain there holy spirit has been given for you just to take away that anger it's another sin that very destructive anger had brought many lives to backward state anger you rise up as a lion within that moment some of them their angers are uncontrollable you can't stop them they stand throwing plates against their husbands pouring glass of water in the faces of their husbands some are slapping their women trashing trashes over their lives when that anger had come nothing stops him from doing whatever that he wants to do in that moment it's not apostle paul said it's not me it is the sin that dwelleth in my flesh if you want that sin to go submit it to the power of the holy ghost and you will come under the holy spirit's control anger i am sorry for what i have done the man has come back to himself but that sorry will not last for long because it will come again as far as you are not doing anything about it you are just feeling sorry but sorry will not fix the problem the sorry will not fix the problem the only thing that will fix the problem is that you come to recognize that it's a weakness in your life that is a loophole for the devil to destroy your life that i have to do something about it because i don't want to die I love you so much but I am sorry when this thing comes I can't control it since you know you cannot control it why don't you allow the Holy Spirit to control it for you that is what we are saying you have come to understand that you can control it but Jesus came so that the helper will help you but the helper will not force you the helper will not just come and take over like that the holy spirit is not forcing anybody and that's not coming in and take no until you are willing to release that yoke upon the shoulders of our lord jesus christ and the holy spirit will get hold of it so now i am in control anger another great man of god David, and we're going to stop just right here. David's weakness was his inability to control his sexual desire. Inability to control his sexual desire. Are you also having the same type of hormones? That as a believer, when this thing has come, you cannot control yourself are you struggling with the sexual desires unrighteous way of having sex second samuel chapter 12 and the verses 9 to 14 let me read it and read it all The background story about david we all know david will go with another man's wife uriah's wife Bathsheba, and sleep with Bathsheba at the time that uriah the husband was at war as a soldier because david was a king and he was using his power and not just that i would say that it's a weakness 
that Satan saw that it was in David's life. And David was not doing anything about it. He went and do something that is not pleasing in the sight of Almighty God. So, Samuel, 2 Samuel 12, 9 to 14. He said, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight, David? Why have you despised the commandment of Almighty God and have done evil in the sight of God? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword and hast taken his wife Bathsheba to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore, David, hear the judgment of the living God. The sword shall never depart from thy house because thou hast despised me, God. And has taken the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, to be thy wife. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thy own house. And I will take thy own wives before thy eyes and give them unto the, thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. What you did in secret, I, the Lord, is going to open a door for people to know everything of you in open openly hey this is uh 